All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for setting this up, Dev. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, of course. Uh, do you wanna you wanna introduce yourself? I mean, tell us about your background and. Uh... Um. Yeah. Just uh. You know, I'm uh, a little bit long winded, as you know. So <laughs> stop me if it gets uh, <laughs> stop me if it gets too long. But um. Yeah, my name is Ramon. Uh, I am, I guess, a lot of things. Uh, cat dad first. You know, that's the that's the big one. And uh, other than that, you know, in order to keep these boys fed, uh, I am a painter. I have been teaching, um, I mean, not just, uh, you know, drawing, anatomy, painting, composition, landscape painting, basically all of it, anything that, uh, you know, gets thrown at me for the last like 10 years, uh, just about, uh, going on 11 this year, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I've been very lucky to, you know, have worked with a lot of people like in, you know, from like, uh, actually especially with online like from all around the world now and um it's been great it's been it's been really like exciting and um I can actually I recognize a lot of names like in the yeah uh, you know just in uh in the in the zoom chat right now um but yeah that's that's primarily what I do uh it's just um my goal overall is just to try to make this stuff as like easy to understand and accessible to people as possible and that's you know what I've dedicated a big, pretty much all of my professional career too. That's awesome. Yeah, that's why I wanted to do more of these free workshops and kind of get that information out there and not have it be like locked behind paywalls and uh, yeah. yeah, just be really as accessible as possible. Yeah, yeah. That's that's actually one of the one of the crazy things, and I think something that's going to be like a recurring theme here is that, I mean. <clears throat> By and large, you know, like you and I, you know, talk about this all the time, but like a lot of the information that people actually want to know it is out there. A lot of it in really old books, a lot of it for free, you know, but I think a lot of it is that you get this kind of oversaturation or like it's overwhelming to kind of sift through all of it. Yeah. And, you know, it's like you're not going to there's there's only so many things that um, you have time to like digest and to like sit down and process and everything. And so I think that ultimately having some kind of like set of priorities and just kind of knowing like what to, knowing what to focus on, as opposed to thinking of it as like, I need to know absolutely everything before I can like, you know, even draw like a stick figure, <laughs> you know, that's the, <laughs> that's kind of the, the, I I think that's the that's the thing that makes a yeah. difference. That's the thing that you know doesn't keep people paralyzed, but allows them to actually you know make the work they want to make. Yeah, there's such a benefit to just like diving in and making mistakes and trying things and like having <laughs> fun with it and not worrying that you're doing something perfectly or correctly, yeah. not like <laughs> breaking some kind of rule of figure drawing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it is pretty amazing though because I think a lot of us have that kind of like belief like I think I definitely did like growing up and until even like fairly recently like it's almost like this unstated belief that there's some kind of like art police that are going to show mm -hmm. up like oh you forgot your scapulas or you know whatever <laughs> like and it is funny that you see um it's funny now you know kind of from you know as someone who's been doing this for a long time and having reviewed like probably at this point like hundreds of people's like work you know and on my own obviously you know in terms of like structure and various other aspects the things that people sweat a lot of the time the things that they get really worried about half the time like don't matter <laughs> you know what I mean like half the time it's like so it's so small that it's completely inconsequential so but I do think that it is important to you know if 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 possible to have some kind of like uh, some kind of guide, you know, whether it's in a book or like in a, you know, living person that you have contact with, but someone who's been through all of that, they can just be like, offer the reassurance to say like, hey, like, you're fine. Like, don't, don't worry about this. Because yeah. I think the problem a lot of people face, um, I saw that a lot of the notes that were included in like the work that was submitted, uh, you know, as people that are working on their own, you know, trying to figure things out as they, as they go. And I think a lot of it is like, if you're learning if you're trying to learn, let's say, anatomy or figure structure or whatever, it's hard to be a student and also try to be your own teacher and try to like figure out like what's important and what's not and, you know, design your own curriculum when you yourself have not, you know, actually like mastered the thing that you you're working on. Yeah, I know. I know you tell yeah. students all the time that like 
they're just borrowing your your perception yeah your opinions basically like temporarily until mm-hmm. until really they can develop their own like ability to critique their own work yeah no it, it it's funny because i think sometimes for drawing just gets mystified in like weird ways yeah like, I mean, people, people, people literally think drawing is magic like yeah. it's <laughs> insane like and it's it's funny because drawing is not particularly different than like you know many other disciplines and a lot of the same like like the things your brain does to you know arrive at like a quote unquote like successful drawing are pretty much the same things or the same strategies that you use to navigate like the rest of the world you yeah. know like I mean, this, you know, particularly like the, the the sort of work that I do, like I see it as kind of like, I don't know. I mean, it's a little bit like if you go hiking or something, right? Or if you're like trying to go down like a path that you've never been down before and then someone's walking back and they already walked through there and they're like, hey, there's like, you know, there's like a, there's some, some rocks up ahead and like, there's some, like some mud over there. Like just watch out for this and that. Yeah. I mean, they don't walk it for you. They just kind of point out like, you know, places that like, oh, you can take the shortcut here, that sort of thing. Yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, that's a lot of what the job boils down to, you know. Um, Or it's also similar to being like a personal trainer or whatever. It's like you design kind of like a plan for people. You show them like what exercises to do or sort of like the form so that they don't like, you know, not even that it's correct exactly, but so that they don't get hurt. And then after a while, they just have to lift the weight on their own. They don't really yeah. need you for anything. And to, <laughs> you know like, what I mean? <laughs> continue the hiking analogy, like maybe to tell them also that the shoes don't matter too much and the, the yeah. equipment, you don't need like perfect technique. You, you go out there, like you, you enjoy it. You make yeah. mistakes, then you can correct the small things later and you really kind of build upon the practice. Yeah. I think like, yeah, really so much of this comes down to like overcomplicating things and thinking that there, you have to keep all of these arcane all this arcane knowledge in your head at the same time yeah. it's, uh, it's a lot easier and more fun than that i think when um yeah when you're not worried so much about that yeah thing. i mean a lot of it too is that like yeah i mean you're right like it's i think it's also just kind of like uh and we'll get started with like the actual you know like feedback in a second but like a lot of it is it is important to set a kind of context for this because you know, it's, it's not particularly useful to just have like a thing where you look at some drawings and you're like, Oh, this, this thing's too long. This thing's too short. This is, you know what I mean? Like, and I think that's what a lot of like students expect, you know, out of like an anatomy thing, or like they expect you to just be sitting there like counting ribs, which like, it has its place, but it's not the most useful thing. I think a lot of the reality is like a lot less kind of like romantic than people expect, you know, it's not like, you're just going to show up with like some crazy like x-ray vision and it's you know, like figure out like, you know, just close your eyes and just be like, ah, here's the seventh, you know, cervical vertebrae or whatever. <laughs> but, um, but it, you know, it is funny because yeah, again, even with like, again, with the hiking analogy, like you're right. Like it is so easy to get stuck in, you know, just the, oh, like I need to have the perfect shoes. Like the fact that you have shoes, period, like just having shoes as opposed to being barefoot is already like 80% of the battle. Yeah. And I think, (laughs) you know, like really where that comes from is like, it's scary. It's scary to go out there on your own without directions. Maybe you don't have a guide. It's like focusing on the shoes, focusing on the equipment. It like, it occupies your brain. I know that's like a big part of how people engage with drawing is like, I need a method. I need somebody to tell me that this path is the correct path. Cause it's just too scary to go out there not knowing that. (laughs) I might have been walking for a mile and like it could have been the wrong direction it could have gotten me nowhere i think that's the yeah. thing that people yeah, that's... avoid and like it's it's so important not to avoid that well it's also like the, the kind of thing where like you know people think that by if they just think hard enough if they just plan hard enough then nothing will ever go wrong right exactly <laughs> and that's just not how the world works even if it were possible to some degree if you have some <laughs> galaxy brain that you're just able to foresee like every like thing that could possibly come up like even then that's still slower than just going out there fucking up a little bit and yeah. figuring it out like <laughs> it, it's i was remembering something that you had in your book about like learning a new language and how like if you learn a new language in the abstract, like in just like this classroom where it's like, you know, like, like, a, like a French or whatever language, like 101 class, they just throw vocab at you, but it doesn't mean anything because there's no practical utility half the time. But I think the one that you had was like, if, but if you're in a new country and you need to go to the bathroom, yeah, you will yeah, remember yeah. the word for that once you figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> 
and it's the same it's the same with this too it's like anatomy needs to have a kind of practical utility and in the in the solving of actual problems that matter to you in the making of actual work then there's you know it, it actually sticks because you know as logical as we want to like pretend to be nuanced you know a lot of it is very kind of like uh, emotional like if there is a kind of thing where like you have this sort of it's like a little story point you have that moment where you're like aha i figured out what the shoulder was doing on this right. model that right. i was drawing like it it means more because that's just yeah. that's just how our brains actually work <laughs> yeah that's really why it's so important to like go down that wrong path because when you find the solution you have like this personal connection to it it's not yeah. somebody that somebody's like told you was going to happen yeah maybe somebody did warn you about it but because you like went through that experience it just it means so much more it sticks for so much longer and i think yeah this this comparison of anatomy and figure drawing mm -hmm. and drawing in general like to a language uh as a means to communicate yeah. is really important because yeah it brings us practicality to it it, it kind of yeah. removes some of the more tent tempting ways to like make this into like fashionable or maybe like put your yeah. ego into a drawing it's no it's more about communicating with other people it's not so much about yeah uh, yeah like making yourself look like you know everything about anatomy is not the most like, interesting thing not the most interesting message for a drawing <laughs> yeah but god yeah it's a, you know it's funny and i noticed like lately you know like um the more i teach and and the more subjects that i teach too yeah the one of the things that's really important you know for everyone to develop that you know especially if you want i mean for for anything right like whether you want a career in something like this or not um like whatever your level of engagement is you basically do want like to have like a bird's eye view of the entire process like you want to have some awareness of like why you are doing this like if you're sitting there like counting ribs or counting like little muscle fibers or something there may be a purpose for that there, there yeah. may be something useful about that but that it's not intrinsically useful like you have to sort of like think of like okay i'm spending this amount of time here like there are more things that there are more things to learn than you have time to learn so part of it is like you know just kind of uh being ruthlessly selective about like where your time goes because you don't have unlimited amounts of that right yeah. and so I, I and I think it's like yeah again people think very literally and in terms of absolutes and I think all of us are guilty of this right and even just a brief word about like what mastery even means right the people sort of fall into 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 a few camps about this but one of them is like you know there's the kind of person that like kind of um uh adopts this sort of like i don't know almost like this kind of misguided humility like it's just like oh i you know i'm i'm not a master i'm an eternal student yeah. you know or you know um or thinking that just like mastery is like knowing absolutely everything about like a given subject I mean in the end what it is it's like it is undeniable that there is a certain point that you become so comfortable with a subject or comfortable enough that you can communicate ideas in that subject consistently mm -hmm. right and I think like whether you want to call it proficiency or mastery or whatever it just means that you have like you can set goals you can like you know you can strategize for how to like communicate those things to other people and they people consistently get what you mean like that is a kind of, that's what you're aiming for when you say go to school or whatever like that's what you're supposed to get out of it it doesn't mean that you won't keep learning things but you know having this kind of mindset that like I will always be in school forever because I don't I don't know anything. Well, you know that's bullshit. Like you know, you clearly there's it's not the the kind of thing where it's like you either know nothing or you know a lot. It's you cross a threshold. Like I remember Glenn Vilpu had this great thing that he said to us one time that you know because I've been working and like making money from my work since I was like I don't know sixteen because mm -hmm. I had to right and it's like that's the kind of thing it's like I didn't have like a whole lot of a chance to dilly dally around being like oh I don't know am I good enough to do this like <laughs> no I needed to make money so you know um and so Glenn at one point that I was I'd already been doing this for a little bit when um, I was taking like little commissions and just uh who knows maybe at the end I'll uh, as a treat you know I'll, I'll I'll try to pull up some of this like chamber of horror stuff that I did when I was like <laughs> a teenager in high school <laughs> But um, but I remember Glenn said something like, 
someone asked him like, oh, like, what, you know, when you know that you're ready to be a professional or whatever. And he was like, when people give you money for what you're doing, <laughs> like when someone's like willing, like it, it's, a, it's a little bit like the, the, that whole like thing of like the piano teacher being like one lesson ahead of the student. <laughs> like if someone is willing to pay you or exchange something, you know, with you or even ask you, you know, to, to do something for them that it's something that you can do if they can't like congratulations you're a professional like this yeah. you know you're already like you have arrived like there's no there's no fanfare there's no like sort of like big graduation and like you know clapping and all that it's just that you know at a certain point you, you kind of see it in retrospect you're like oh I guess I am I'm a, a person who does this now I think that's how it started for a lot of us in our careers like I remember for me, um, I never thought that I would end up like being a teacher, but I love it. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but uh, I was mentioning, yeah, maybe at the end as a treat, I will uh, show you all some of the uh, crimes against uh, art that I committed when I was uh, when I was starting out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, actually, you know, funny enough. So if if any of you at um, this is uh, maybe a, a little bit of a cautionary tale, but. Um, Anatomy is one of those things that, I mean, really all of the different elements that go into making a picture, right? Like whether it's like composition or whether it's like, you know, I mean, it could be movement, it could be proportion, it could be anatomy, it could be color, it could be whatever. Each of these things is a rabbit hole that you could go down and you can become sort of like obsessed with like any one of these given things. I mean, you can dedicate a lifetime to just yeah. each of these things. There's um, the famous story of uh, Paolo Cello, who is a Renaissance artist. I mean, he was like, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, I know he was a painter, but I think he might have also done like architecture and stuff like, you know, a bunch of people seem to have done back then. And um, he was one of the first people to actually work with like linear perspective. Right. And this dude ruined his life because he kept trying. He was basically like obsessively working on making this like wireframe 3d chalice i think i've seen these they're crazy <laughs> they're crazy but like but but literally they're crazy because he like he ended up just like destitute i think if i'm not mistaken because he stopped like doing what he was he, like he, he really like lost the plot like yeah. he's like, you know people are like hey paulo we need some altarpieces and he's like have you seen this chalice <laughs> it's 3d <laughs> it's like Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We get it. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. But like, yeah. it's that can happen to to all of us, you know. And it's, you really, again, you got to keep your eyes on the prize, you know. It's like there there has to be a part of you that's like, or another person. Probably easier if it's another person, but that kind of keeps you in check and is like, hey, hey, like over here, <laughs> you know. And um, but the anatomy stuff I do like a lot. I actually don't spend as much time obsessing over that as I used to. I will say. But ironically, I think that's actually made me like more effective at it. Funny. Yeah. However, if any of you decide to like, you know, go down that particular rabbit hole, it gets real weird, real, real fast until you end up with something like this in your studio, which, <laughs> which I kind of have to explain to people whenever like, you know, if someone comes over. It's like I have a literal skeleton <laughs> in my closet, a plastic one. It's like, you know, disassembled like that. I'm actually planning on using as like a full size, like mannequin to study drapery and stuff like that. And to, you know, to use it for like paintings or whatever. But it, it's a, it's an interesting life, you know. It's <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got like five or six model heads here and skulls. That yeah. <laughs> Portrait focus, but I don't know if it makes it weirder just having that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like I don't know. It's I think in the end, like one of the beautiful things about like a um, career in terms of like you know a, a creative career is that you get to continue sort of like um, feeding your curiosity, you know, about things. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's the in the end, um, and we'll you know we'll get started now. But like in the end, I think that probably the most important thing that you can do, or at least one of them, is to constantly be trying to get at the root of things, like to ask yourself, like, why you're doing something, why this is important, why, like, why, 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 why? And again, because that, that actually provides clarity. Like, I think the best thing you can do for a student is, or, you know, for, for anyone that you're transmitting some kind of knowledge to is like, 
to give them a, an effective way of asking questions and figuring out their own answers for things. Like as a teacher, you don't want to be this kind of like Oracle sort of thing that people just think that like the, the takeaway after someone studying with you should not be like, oh my God, they know so much. Like yeah. that can be part of it. That's fine. But that's secondary, right? Like the takeaway should be like, this makes sense to me. Like I can figure things out on my own now. Right. Like it's like to breathe this kind of like independence and like the way that I usually phrase it to my students is, <laughs> you know, I want to be completely useless to you yeah. as quickly as possible by being extremely useful to you right now. But yeah. the goal eventually is that you wouldn't really like the students wouldn't really, really need me for anything, you know, um, uh, yeah. because they, they can exercise their own judgment for that. I've, I've definitely seen students who the more that they go to school, the more reliant they become on mm -hmm. critiques and, and yeah. yeah, the judgment of whoever their teacher is. And I think that's something you have to yeah. like really intentionally develop as a way to kind of wean off of that. Yeah. I mean, that happens with, uh, that also happens with like people that work in like production environments, right? Like I've, you know, I think we've all seen like people that, you know, are very good in a pipeline where let's say like they're like a, you know, a vis dev artist or like a prop artist or like whatever, right? Like they're, they're part of like the assembly line. Yeah, yeah. And of course there's some overlap, but they are like, you know, they're, they're handed a certain amount of work. They have freedom within that, but they are not really setting their own tasks. Yep. You know, obviously the art director is doing that. And no matter how like skilled they might be at a given thing, like there are some people that once they leave that environment or they try to create personal work, they completely fall apart. And it's because they they were just the hands. Like yep. they were literally sort of like a, a puppet being moved through by like, you know, they're they're an extension of the art director at that point. And that can happen with teaching too, where like you'll see you see this at a lot of like the ateliers also that like. As long as someone is telling the students like what to do, they do fine. As soon as they have to figure that out on their own. <laughs> it's really prevalent in ateliers. Yeah. 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 Somebody, sorry, just somebody asked, how would you break out of that cycle? I mean, when do you like enter in that process of thinking for yourself? <laughs> yeah. The thing is that you have to be aware that that's what you have to do from the beginning. Right. right? So yeah. like, the, you, you, yeah, you, yeah, you have to let go of the idea that like, labor is valuable just for the sake of being labor like just because you're busy doesn't mean that you're actually getting closer to your yeah. goals right like what we were saying about like you know uh walking or like hiking or whatever like let's say that i have to get from here to the store right like it's not like there's one way to get there right there's not one sequence of me putting one foot exactly in one place and another one in the you know like this other exact place and that's the only way to get there i have a few options right i mean some options will get me there faster than others, right? I could, I mean, technically, I guess you could literally start walking the opposite direction and like, you know, I mean, the world's round, right? So like eventually you would make it there. Mm -hmm. But um, but it's more of a question of like, how do you navigate that as, as efficiently? And like, let's say in that scenario that I start walking in the opposite direction, just because I'm getting tired, just because I'm moving my feet doesn't mean that I'm actually really advancing toward my goal, right? Like, labor is not really, you know, um, there's no, there's nothing noble or intrinsically valuable in just doing things. <laughs> like, you That's know what I mean? What atelier is maximized. It's just like looking yeah. busy, like appearing to do something laborious. And I remember, I remember <laughs> I was told something in an atelier that like the real work begins after you graduate. That's when you figure out yourself. <laughs> It's like, well, what were we doing then? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's that's the thing is like a lot of the time, like the, I mean, my sort of, and I wouldn't say my favorite thing, but by favorite, I mean, like one of the things that I hate the most is that, you know, they'll have people like, let's say, you know, drawing, doing a drawing of a figure or whatever, and filling in a background for like two weeks, like a yeah. flat background or whatever, and, and telling people that they're learning something by doing that. While paying like, tuition for that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, it's, it's crazy. Like, because uh, at that point, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it, and it's supposed to teach you something about like discipline and like how, like, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like weirdly supposed to like humble you in some way. Yeah. But that's just lazy teaching because what happens with that kind of thing is that and obviously I work a lot in the space of like you know um people that are interested in like 19th century artwork and like how that was made and art education during that period or whatever and you know that's something that I really enjoy like researching and all of that right but there is often this kind of mythology that comes with that where it's like 
oh, you are not worthy to receive the secrets of the masters. Like you must like to get on your hands and knees and like, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, I don't know, like it's, you know, like scrubbing like a floor with like a toothbrush or something. Yeah. And, you know, and that's supposed to teach you something too. about like almost like knowing your, your, your place in the, yeah. you know, this pantheon of giants or whatever. But that is so silly. Like that is, a, that is such a silly, like weird, you know, way of, of going about that. I think that, again, you don't want to fall into a sort of thing where you just go through the motions or you fetishize the, the, the sort of means of accomplishing something rather than the goal. Like, there is there are very easy ways to become you know I mean I'm also kind of chronically online right but like what I would call like a kind of like a like a method pervert like just becoming too obsessed with like this is the method this is these are the steps that I follow and I always follow these steps that is not what that is about you know like and what's interesting is that people have a much healthier relationship with writing right like you know that for instance, like the value of a piece of writing is not like in the lines that you make. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, calligraphy has a place, but calligraphy is a very small subset of the writing that people do, yeah. right? Like, you know that like, it doesn't matter how nice your handwriting is, like I can write like, you know, I don't know, a, a, a letter or something, right? Or like a grocery list in this like beautiful handwriting or whatever. And the ideas that I'm communicating are significantly less valuable than the scrawls that my doctor writes when they're writing me like right. a prescription for something. And every nobody looks at that and thinks like, oh, wow, I really wish my doctor had beautiful handwriting. Who fucking cares? <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, I mean, ultimately, it's like these are things that are there for the transmission of ideas. Right. And that's also a point that I make very often in class, which is that you know, again, people have all of this sort of like all these mystifying thoughts about drawing and whatever. And, you know, people even have the, obviously this is very common, you know, it, people have the, the, the belief that like, oh, I don't know if I could like learn how to draw. I don't know if I could ever do that. Okay. Like why, why is that? Like, because drawing requires some kind of special talent because what is drawing? Like drawing is, you know, communicating ideas, through, you know, graphic means, through like lines and dots and dashes and, and all of that. Um, what's writing? <laughs> you know, it's like, what, there's something magical about making different kinds of lines that, you know, somehow writing, everybody can learn, but drawing, you know, not everybody can. That makes literally no sense. Yeah, you know? it's, it's almost like these these ideas like filled our heads when we were very young about this yeah. kind of just completely different pursuit that some people are are geared towards and others just aren't cut out for. And it's like yeah, yeah it's, it's these toxic beliefs that like stay with you and sometimes yeah. just like yeah they, they stay unanalyzed. Yeah, it's it's wild. Like it's like I mean, imagine that imagine that they gave you a choice about whether you would gain basic literacy or not when you were in school. Like, yeah, yeah. like, I mean, you know, like all of our society falls apart. Like we wouldn't. It's, it's what's like, happened. I mean, there is, there is a lack of visual literacy now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's um, yeah. I think it's just as important as having uh, you know, every other kind of literacy. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, it's really funny. And again, like in periods where this stuff has been very prevalent and people have done very well at it, it's hardly ever surprising that like a lot of what fuels that is, let's say, I mean, how do we have, you know, almost like nine, like whatever, 99.9 something percent literacy in, you know, like a lot of parts of the world. Right. It's because governments invest resources in exactly. making that education accessible and making it effective. For and people. it was, it was free in the 19th century. A lot. Yeah. I mean, like a lot. Yeah. A lot of like drawing education. Yeah, exactly. It was free. It was stuff that was, again, not sort of mystified. They had their own kind of weird myths, like, you know, as well, right? Uh, particularly around color, actually. Like, yeah. funny enough, you know, that, that was a persistent sort of thing. But what you find is that these things are kind of like horizons, you know? It's like the thing that you don't know or that seems like that you have the least information about, that seems like magic. Until you figure it out, and then it's like, oh wait, actually, it, it, never mind. It wasn't magic. This it's, kind of, it's the god of the gaps <laughs> argument. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is—I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 funny, but you know, even like just this part of the conversation, like it's not just kind of like needless sort of like philosophizing. Like this is part of like I think the like getting better at anatomy or whatever. Like 
hinges on like the thoughts that you, the attitude that you have about it. Like that's where it starts. It's not so much the difficulty of like, you know, each rib or each metatarsal or whatever. Like it's, it's the kind of like the, the way that you choose to approach this is, um, you know, what determines like how easy or smooth of a ride you're going to have. Right. And also just like how consistently you can sort of like, um, you know, kind of like have goals and keep pushing toward them. Right. Because I think that sometimes, you know, again, people are kind of like aimless and people are willing to work. Right. Like I see no shortage of like labor in terms of like the effort that people are willing to put in, but it is crazy if you stop and think about it. And again, all of us do this. So it's not like this sort of thing that like, you know, all, all these, you know, there are people that work smart and people that work hard. Like, no, everybody does this because your brain wants to go on autopilot. Right. So you just have to keep reminding yourself that like, okay, like why, like, wh like, why does this matter? Why am I doing this? I remember just as a last example, when I was in school, um, I went to USC um, for, for college. And for anyone who doesn't know, USC is like a, it's a university, like a big university here in Los Angeles. Um, it's a good school for a lot of things. Um, I was there for animation in, uh, that was part of the film school. And I was mainly there because I was like, I had a scholarship, so I didn't really have to like, you know, pay a whole lot for college. But I remember like, you know, and I was like the first person in my family to go to college and all this other stuff. I had like just, you know, moved to the States from Mexico. Right. So there was kind of like a lot riding on that. But I remember like one of our first classes, like our teacher was like, okay, so we're going to keep a dream journal. <laughs> and, you know, like when we had history of animation class, like they showed us this as something aspirational, this film called Moth Parts. And it's literally just some psychopath like took apart a moth and made a yeah. stop motion animation like moving the parts of the moth around and i remember i walked out of class i was like this is stupid like this is like not worth my time like yeah, you're, even, you're, even yeah. when it's free it's not worth my time you know you're, you're bringing back memories from very expensive <laughs> college where we had to draw with pencils in both of our hands at the same time <laughs> with our eyes closed <laughs> so that was one exercise the other one we had to dig in the trash for found objects just like pretty dangerously walk around the streets of boston and open up dumpsters and look for yeah. found objects so oh yeah. my god yeah see but that's that's the thing it's like i think that you do on some level have to like you should be open to new information you should be open to things yeah. that are not maybe what you expect but at the same time, not everything is going to be for you. You exactly. don't necessarily have to try everything. Like there are ideas that if you think they're dumb, maybe they're dumb. Like, yeah. so, I, I mean, I remember like in one class um, that I was sitting in on the one day <laughs> we walked in and like the, the room was set up with like these six foot high uh, sheets of like just brown butcher paper and there were these buckets with paint in them. There's a bunch of string around. And, and the teacher explained that the students were going to draw the model by, by dunking the string in the paint and hurling it at the, at the paper. I mean, like anyone with half a brain can realize that like there is very little utility yeah. for 99% of people in doing this exercise. You know, it, it gets trickier, though, when it's like something like modern atelier methods where it yeah. seems reasonable. I mean, it yeah. does they're ridiculous on the face of it but some of these things feel like yeah. it really feels like the secrets of the old masters yeah i mean a lot sorry, kind of deprogramming it's just yeah <laughs> yeah someone just asked right now uh you know about like you know if, if there are any sort of like parameters to gauge whether something is a waste of time or not um basically think of it this way like if you see someone walking down the street like you can you say that they're like walking in the wrong direction no, you can't. Not until you know where they're going, right? So, like, if you know they could be walking this way or that way or whatever, like that, you know, the walking is just walking. But once you know what their goal is and what they're trying to get to, you can tell, like, oh, hey, you're walking this way, but your thing's actually over there, right? Yeah. That's the basic logic that you would use to gauge that as well. Like, I am trying to get to this particular thing. Let's say, like, I want to understand the human body well enough that I can, let's say, draw like a, you know, let's say like a basic sketch, but like in pretty much any position, right? Okay, fine. 
then you analyze what the component parts of that are, right? So yes, everything is basically based on comparison. Like you never know anything on its own. Like if you say that like somebody is tall, tall compared to what? If you say that something is light, well, like light compared to what? You know, like no person is tall compared to a giraffe. So, you know, when you say that somebody's tall, it's a loaded statement. You, it yeah. comes with all of these other assumptions, you know, all these other presuppositions of like what the average height of a person is, et cetera, right? And so that's actually one of the, one of the greatest lessons in drawing and painting. And, you know, I mean, that's like basically what your books are about, right? That like all this is about like comparison and contrast and it's categorizing right. those things. Yeah. I mean, that's all this is too. Like people think that, again, even with the anatomy thing, which seems like something fairly stable and fairly absolute, that you just go in there and you're like, ah, yes, you know, channeling the anatomy oracle and boom, this is what yeah. this is, boom, this is what that is. No, it's actually, it, it's a lot of deduction. It's a lot of like, I see this on the model. There's only so many options of what this can be. So you narrow it down. And again, you don't, you don't always know with like 100% certainty, but here's the thing. You don't know anything with 100% certainty, right? Like if someone asks me like, again, even like something really basic about myself, even just to continue with like, say like the, you know, something that seems so objective, right? Like, like if someone asks me just how, how tall I am, right? The thing is, I, I have an answer, right? But the thing is, that, that actually fluctuates. Your height fluctu fluctuates like whether you measure yourself in the morning or at night. I mean, that's crazy. Like the most basic things about you are actually not stable, right? And I think that's something that is important to kind of start to realize is that you will never get to 100% because everything is actually a moving target, yeah. right? So your task is actually not to know everything or not to have like perfect, complete, objective knowledge of anything. It's to narrow it down to a, a point that is acceptable for the task, right? So like yeah. if... I am telling you how far to walk to like meet me somewhere. And I say it's like 20 feet. That's good enough. You know, if it's a land surveyor that is actually trying to like figure out like the distance between like, you know, one point in space and another one, their margin of error will have to be a lot smaller because it matters more. Yeah. Right. Like making a basic chair requires a different standard of precision than making like a spaceship <laughs> you know what i mean and the stakes are higher that's why you know and like like when you're your own art director yeah you're like kind of setting the goals that mm -hmm. target is going to change organically over time and the problem is that if you are like if you get two in the weeds say for example on these 3d vases like yeah that's all you're going to do you're going to go outside you're going to see everything is looking like 3d vases like if all yeah. you have a hammer everything looks like a nail so if you're too focused on like the process and yeah then yeah, I think you yeah. Don't, oh. You don't allow yourself room to actually grow and have ideas and have the process change to actually support communicating. Oh yeah, and like the thing is that again, you have to constantly keep in mind why you got into this in the first place. Exactly, like yeah. this, this stuff is a lot of work, and it's never sort of uh, it's in a sense kind of never ending work, right? Because um, depending on how far you want to go down the rabbit hole, there's always more, yeah. right? And so you have to, uh, people get into this kind of study mode. And I think all of us, when we go to school, you know, you get sort of accustomed to this idea of being like a good little worker bee, right? And like, you know, I, on some level, like everybody knows that when you go through like your, you know, primary and secondary education before you get to college and even to some degree in college, like, yes, you're learning things to a degree, but there are definitely times that you're just memorizing things mm -hmm. just to get the, the grade, the number on the paper, right? Or to like, and, and sometimes the measure of how well you're doing, the measure of success in that environment can quickly become like whether your teacher is happy with you or not, right? Yeah. And the thing is that like, we're already kind of programmed to think in those terms to be like, I want to do a good job. I want to be an A student. And the thing is that ultimately, like you start to realize that that, that kind of thing doesn't, act, it's an artificial environment. That's yeah. not actually how it's, it's so work. strong socially. Like I remember when yeah. I was in the LA and like, yeah, it's just immediate. It's like, I'm in this group of people. I want to fit in. Like I want, yeah, yeah. I want teachers to be impressed with what I'm doing. And yeah. I'm still trying to like undo the effects of that on my own work. Yeah. And when I look back, it doesn't feel organically like me. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's wild because it's like nobody gets into this to study like all the muscles, you know what I mean? Like yeah. when you're a little kid and you're excited about like you, the first time you look at like a drawing or a painting and you were like fascinated by it, it wasn't like, 
oh my God, look at these brush strokes. Like that's not really the experience that almost anybody has, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's something more. It's like, you want to like, I know for me, the clearest thing is like when I was a kid, I loved playing with like Lego. I love making like spaceships. I love building stuff, yeah, you know, yeah. and capturing and recapturing that kind of wonder is important. Like being a diligent student will just burn you out. Like the things that you do, the things that you study, that they have to feed into something that is actively getting you closer to whatever that initial thing is, whatever the thing is that's the spark, yeah. right? And then we get into fear again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's 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 wild. Like, and I think that again, like well, a lot of the times, like the the danger with education sometimes is that again, people mistake, you know, they, they don't see education as a tool; they see it as the end goal, mm -hmm. right? And you have to very clearly, you know, remind yourself that this is just what education does, what teaching does is it gives you a push to kind of get started. But the thing is that like, ultimately, all this stuff is, you know, there's always a margin of error. There's always a point where you just have to, yeah, like you just have to like throw a caution to the wind and be like, okay, I'm going to just try it now. Yeah. You know, it's like, you can prepare as much as you want, you know, but like, there is a point where you get diminishing returns, like a little bit of preparation goes a long way yeah and you know of course that's not to say that like you should just practice and never sort of like study any sort of like theory or any like whatever because the thing is that the theory part will save you a bunch of time because all that theory is is the accumulation of various practical data points practical experiences in in sort of in in, in aggregate right so that you can benefit from you know, not having to go through every single, you know, sort of, um, yeah. uh, you know, failed avenue on your own, right? And that's how we move things forward, period. But theories in themselves are not sort of intrinsically valuable. They're only as valuable as, you know, sort of uh, how much they're a reflection of, you know, sort of like real world scenarios. And to bring it to anatomy, that's a whole thing. You know, people get obsessed with like, I'm learning the Loomis head, or I'm learning the Asaro head, right. this is the Riley rhythm. Like, <laughs> in the end, the thing that matters is that you're making connections between different parts of the body, right? It, or it matters that like you get the idea there are different planes. Whether you're learning the patented whatever, Loomis, whatever the fuck, does not matter. Like yeah. it, you know, it's a starting point. That's fine. But people sort of like getting too caught up in, in, in that sort of thing is, you know, it's sort of like missing the point, right? Um, because any diagram that you have is just it's only as good as it reflects what the general structure of the actual body is like as it applies to real people but it should be easier to understand than the real thing because otherwise why would you have it <laughs> right so it's like but all these things that we build they're approximations they're proxies of the real world right because we can't possibly encapsulate the entire you know uh, thing of like existence so it's, I think it's important to just kind of know that like, yes, we can accomplish things. Yes, these things can be valuable to learn, but they have limits. They're not that you are never learning like the objective, like, you know, truth or the ultimate, like whatever, like anatomy diagram or, you know, whatever else. So anyway. Yeah. Why don't we, why don't we take a look at some art? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, you know, I'm going to, uh, so the way I figured I'd do this is the way I do it in my classes. I'll just go ahead and share my screen. And I have a bunch of work up here, um, as again, uh, I imagine has become sort of manifestly clear. Um, I can be very, very long winded. And, you know, ironically, I mean, part of the reason why I care so much about like, you know, focus and bringing it back to the point and that kind of thing is because I do get distracted a lot. Uh, you know, so it's like, it's, it's, it's interesting because having that sort of perspective, like kind of, kind of helps, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, I have pretty pretty serious ADHD. Um, and it's not just like a ha ha ha, look quirky me. Like, no, I actually literally have ADHD. And so it's become very important to start to sort of like, um, you know, I don't have unlimited time, right? So it's important to develop strategies for using time effectively. Um, you know, and that's actually sort of an interesting thing that I've been thinking about more is that I do think things like ADHD are overrepresented in creative fields. And so sometimes like, I know I used to just think that I was just like lazy and that's why I wouldn't get stuff done. Um, if anyone's feeling that way, it is worth getting that checked out. 
you know, there are, you know, some, once you kind of recognize, you know, what the patterns are that are sort of preventing you from achieving your goals, it becomes easier to strategize about them. Okay, so I think we're just going to take it from the top, you know, just sort of go through uh, alphabetically. So here we have, um, and I'm sorry if I say like anybody's uh, uh, name wrong, uh, Amin uh, says, hey, Devin, just wanted to thank you for the workshops. Also, yeah, thank you, Devin, for, for setting this up. Um, let's see. So practicing figure drawing for a while now, doing 10 minute figure drawings for an hour every day for 268 days. Wow. Uh, goal is to get uh, handle on proportions and simplified line drawing skills. Lately, I haven't seen much improvement. Sometimes you even feel that my drawing skills are getting worse. I'm doing a full time job, unable to attend classes. I need to develop a practice regimen for myself to do on a daily basis. Okay. So the main thing here is that uh, you don't want to you know, sort of get too focused on just the uh, like, oh, I need to do this for this amount of time or like it has to be a line drawing or whatever. Like that doesn't matter that much. Like line is just a means of communicating more important things, right? Like when you look at a piece of writing, like let's say you're, I don't know, you take a page from like Shakespeare or Mary Shelley or something. You don't look at it and say, wow, look at all those lines on paper, right? Like you think of the ideas in the writing because the lines are just a vehicle and whether the lines are in cursive or they're in printed letters or the, you know, the font is different, it doesn't really matter. So when, when you do these drawings, Amin, the, the main thing is it's not really about having clean line work. It's about communicating sort of probably what, what I would describe as like the three most important categories or the three most important like elements in your drawing, which are going to be the movement the character and the structure, right? The movement is basically a broad category that includes action and gesture, right? Gesture is basically the, well, actually let's start with action. Action is what the body is doing, right? And that can best be described by a stick figure. So like action is like, my arm is up, you know, or like, you know, this is making a fist or this is pulling this way or that way. That's the action. The gesture is the rhythmical arrangement of forms. Right. And, you know, sometimes you hear gesture described as rhythm. That's essentially right. Sometimes I'll hear students say like, oh, like this, you know, I can't draw this arm. It has no gesture. That is nonsense. Everything, the body is built gesturally because there is a kind of intrinsic sort of spiraling organization to the way the muscles are organized. So something might not have an action in a sense. It might just be like arms down or something like a basic, like, you know, just a standing pose but gesture is always there, right? Um, in terms of structure, it's basically just locating things in space, right? Because what this kind of drawing, what, what representational drawing ultimately is, it is the oldest, cheapest form of VR, and you are the computer, right? So you can't think in terms of lines, really, when you're working at this stuff. Um, the lines are, again, just kind of a consequence, not a cause. So when you're working on this stuff, you have to ask yourself more sort of questions in terms of like, am I conveying a real sort of like, you know, piece of like space here? Like, is, does this person feel like they're actually sitting on a surface? Do they feel like they're standing on a surface? You know, does, you know, does the arm actually feel like it goes back or does this feel like it actually goes forward? Um, those are the things that I would, that I would focus on uh, more. And I wouldn't necessarily be so strict about like the time or about having to do it every day. Um, it's useful to just have like, you know, some general like limits. I think the, again, if you have a larger goal, then you don't get stuck, right? Because if the goal is large enough, then there's always something more for it to, um, you know, to sort of, um, uh, to keep you, um, you know, to, 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 there's always something to work on in terms of that. Um, in looking at your drawings, and okay, these are from uh, these are from reference. Um, you know, thank you for the for the person who has uh, you know provided this uh, this this reference for us here. Um, let's go ahead and take one of these as like a sort of um, as a as a as a case sample. So here, let's um, okay. So we'll take one of these um, sets of figures here. Take. Um, so maybe this one right here. So that's untitled two. Go ahead and drop this into Photoshop. And here I'm just gonna crank up the contrast so I can see this a little bit better. 
And you guys will have to forgive me. I am a Photoshop Neanderthal. Um, you know, I only know enough Photoshop to like, you know, do like my basic work and that's it. I love uh, seeing you get good results in Photoshop though. Because like, yeah, there is no like, because I see it so much in digital art, like the mystique of having these complicated digital processes, but you're just like, you focus on the, the fundamental important things and you get like really great results. Oh, uh, thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, if it can make a, a mark on a surface, it can, if it can go from lighter right. to darker, they, and if I can make like thin marks and broad marks, then like I can work with it. You know, that's, and, and again, that's, that's part of the attitude of just like, okay, what's the important thing here? So, so again, a lot of what we do is just trying to find like, you know, sort of uh, uh, patterns, you know, uh, between things. Um, okay, so let's see. And actually, one of the most important things that you could do for your drawings is literally <laughs> not draw sometimes, right? Because if you just keep moving, it feels like you're, it feels like you're doing something, right? But work without reflection is not actually that useful, right? Like you need to have like a sort of a purpose when you're, when you're doing stuff. And again, that's how you stay focused. That's how you stay on track. Um, okay. So... Yeah, in 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 looking at looking at these figures, what I would say is like, and we'll make like a little list here, right, for us to to keep track of stuff. So you want like, okay, one, two, three. These are not techniques. These are not. This is not a method. These are just broad ideas, right? So movement, number one, um, and it's this isn't in any like specific order, really. Um, you know, character. Character is basically like the nature of something, like the thing that stands out about it, what makes it different than other things. So like, is something pointy? Is something round? Is something squarish? Is something light? Is something dark? Like that's basically what character means. Like how is, you know, a given element different than other elements? And structure. Structure basically includes proportions. Structure is just space. It's just like how big is something, whether it's up and down, whether it's side to side, or whether it's front to back. Right. So, you know, th these are all the, the, the things that we're that we're looking for here. Um, OK. Oh, OK. I don't know what I did right there. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, these are advanced Photoshop techniques. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the hell this is. OK, <laughs> now I think it's just like bugging out for no reason. Um, oh, wait, no, you're on you're on the gradient tool. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, yeah, when you're, you know, I'm just going to move this over, actually, because it's a little hard to, you know, the monitor is obviously wider than it is tall, so it'll just be easier to have the reference, like, side by side over here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so what you want to, the reason why I'm sort of like, I, I don't think it's necessarily always that useful to have like a set number of drawings or even like always like a, a very literal like time limit or whatever is that, and you know, there's all those like challenges online and stuff like that, like, you know, 30 figures in 30 days or whatever. That stuff's fine. But again, you don't want to make it into like, you don't want to make the exercise into like the final, like important thing. You know what I mean? Like, because what can happen is you become just kind of satisfied making like a drawing, you know, that like fits that time limit or whatever, as opposed to like advancing your understanding of, you know, like the, you know, the, the, your subject. A lot of it, I think, benefits from putting yourself aside and focusing on like, say, like representing like the person, right? Um, obviously, you can study for a variety of different reasons, but I think in in the case of this, if you're trying to learn more of like you know the structure of the body, then trying to find points in common, you know, like just recurring sort of structural features like that becomes very useful. So one of the things that you're going to look for is you want to think bigger. Like you don't want to think just in terms of individual parts. So for instance, like in looking at the torso overall, you can feel that she's you know like stretching through here and it's a pretty significant stretch right regardless of the style that you work in you are going to want to look for you know 
little pieces, little bits of stuff that are, you know, leading into that chain of movement, right? Because what we call anatomy, I mean, anatomy is a lot of things, honestly. I mean, it's literally just anything that's, you know, like the study of the body. Um, but of course, for us, you know, when people say anatomy in this context, they're mainly talking about like muscles and bones, which, you know, is interesting because it's actually a little too limited. It's, it's leaving out sort of, um, you know, things like fat, which are also really important. Um, and also it's leaving out uh, rhythm in a sense, because the musculoskeletal system, the reason your bones and muscles look the way they do is so that you can move, right? And you can, you can see to some degree that if you move in different ways, like let's say if you're a soccer player versus a bodybuilder, how do people shape their bodies in different ways like that? Literally by making different movements. So if you move your body in different ways, you know, obviously there are genetic factors as well, but your body literally becomes a reflection of how you move on some level, right? And so all of the muscles, like, even if you study like, oh, this is what this muscle looks like, this is what, you know, like, this is what the, you know, what the quads look like or whatever. The quads don't look any one particular way all the time, right? Like the muscle, whatever the muscle is or the muscle group adapts to whatever it is that you're doing, right? And so that's something that's, you know, sort of, um, you know, important to keep in mind. So in terms of, you know, here, one thing that we're missing that I think would be useful is, you know, tying this stuff together. Like when you look at this arm, try to think of like the overall sort of intention of this, right? Like every fiber of every muscle here is kind of in a relay race where they're passing the movement on from one muscle to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. What you're looking for is what is the purpose of this arm? Like why are all these muscles and bones arranged in the way they are and finding a path out, right? So finding that track and kind of ignoring all of the distractions along the way. Now that can look like just drawing literally sort of this noodle arm. And for anyone who's like, you know, you heard me talk about the subject for any longer than like two seconds, you know, that like you knew the noodle thing was coming, but you know, the noodle thing is sort of like, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of like a big idea that you can have about this. Right. Um, but you don't have to express it quite in this way. Right. What, you know, what we're talking about with the noodle is just keeping the idea that there is a central core of movement, right. That is like the sort of the set of priorities, you know, for, you know, this, uh, you know, this whole system. And then there's like secondary information, like, you know, that little bump right there on the, on the uh, elbow and then, you know, some of the extra stuff on here, right? Um, but what you're looking for is this. Now, how you express it is up to you, right? So for instance, in here, if you want to keep it as a, as a, you know, a simple line drawing, you also want to ask yourself why you need it to be a simple, like a line drawing, you know what I mean? Like a lot of times when you're studying, if your goal is actually to understand like the basic structure of a person, then if that's the actual goal, then you should do anything and use anything that's necessary to accomplish that. It shouldn't matter whether it's tone or line or whatever. But in any case, let's say that we stick to the, to the line thing. Here, okay, everything that you put down, you know, you have to think of how it contributes to that overall movement, right? So every, no line here, no piece of this is there for its own sake. Everything that you do, it's kind of like cursive where like every letter has a little tail that leads into the next letter, into the next one, and into the next one. So here you have to think of, if you put this in, you have to think of how this is contributing to that overall movement and how it's driving at eventually, you know, basically these tendons that eventually lead to the, um, you know, to the index finger. So in the case here, I'm just going to ghost this down a little bit. You know, what's happening is that by focusing so much on the actual line work and on the individual parts, we're missing the, the most important sort of piece of the action, which is that, you know, her hand is basically pointing, like everything is leading up to, you know, this index finger up here, right? And so that's, you know, part of what we want to focus on. The more clarity you have in terms of what the goal is, um, the easier this stuff becomes, right? So whether you draw like a little noodle thing or not doesn't really matter. Um, you know, the noodle resides inside of all of us. That's the <laughs> that's the big takeaway. Um, 
but basically what you're doing here is like everything that you draw, the lines in themselves, again, they don't actually matter, right? The lines are just a, a consequence. They're a consequence of you thinking about something more important. So here, the, the thought is that, again, everything is leading, you know, to this eventual movement until it hits this crescendo here, right? So getting to that clean line work and decisive line work and decisive brushstrokes or whatever will result from clarity of purpose, not from any technique and not from focusing on the element itself, right? And so what you want to do here is, again, focus yourself on, okay, what are the elements that we need to pick out here that will communicate this action, you know, sort of the most effectively, right? So that's ultimately, you know, more sort of what we're, what we're aiming for, right? And it's not like, you know, it's not something terribly complicated. It, it doesn't take that long. The main challenge is reminding yourself to kind of, you know, stay on target, right? And that's something that you'll find, you know, throughout, um, throughout all of the, you know, the different, um, throughout every drawing discipline, really. Um, here, for instance, okay, you have some interior markings, but they're not, we're not squeezing, we're not getting as much out of them as we could. The fundamental fact here is that, you know, her body is basically going like this, right? You have, you know, the torso going this way and then going this way, right? So there's a compression here. Okay, that's fine. Um, you know, like pretty much any solid object, you know, the body is going to have, you know, a vertical dimension, a horizontal dimension, and a dimension going, you know, like uh, uh, depth, right? Going front to back. We express that using the concept of planes generally, right? Um, and it is, you know, like a sort of, a, it's, it's a model, right? Like people don't, people aren't actually boxes, but it's a simple enough, like an, you know, a, a accurate enough idea that we gain tremendous efficiency by, by using that. So here, you know, we would also think about like the center line, you know, of the, of the body. Again, whether you literally draw these things or not is, you know, kind of up to you, but you should definitely think about them. So on some level here, we'll just draw like the kind of, you know, diagram version of this. On some level, you're going to have that. You're going to have a front, you're going to have a side. It's going to have a certain action. It's going to be sort of generally, you know, more pointy or more round or whatever. Okay. And those are like the big important things that people sometimes think like, oh, I'm too advanced to think about this. The thing is, there is no such thing as advanced drawing. You just get better at the essentials. That's it. It's like the difference between me cooking a steak poorly and some like Michelin star chef, it's, you know, it, it's not that they have different kind of fire available to them necessarily, or that they have any kind of like, you know, it's, it, you know, at, at the end of the day, at a certain point, like, you know, kind of meat is meat, right? But they're better at cooking it. Maybe they're better at selecting the ingredients. Maybe they're, and again, maybe they don't even have as many ingredients or whatever, but the thought that goes into each thing, that's the, you know, how long to cook it for, you know, again, like exactly what kind of meat, what cut of it, you know, um, whatever. So that is more the kind of attitude that we want to adopt here. Now, you know, this kind of dividing into, into, you know, dividing up the space into planes, we can keep doing that, right? So for instance, when you look at her uh, abdominals here, you'll notice that this also has a little side and this has a front, right? And again, people usually spend a lot of time poking in all these little tiny things, but if you squint down and if you step back, which are two really important things to do, then you basically get that all of this is just a plane going this way, right? And so now, instead of this just being front and side, now it's front, small side, front, side, right? This is the stuff that you're really aiming for. And then here, then you're like, okay, well, here's a compression. Now you can actually see that, you know, relatively clearly. There's all kinds of like sort of, you know, smaller micro compressions here, partly because of the, uh, the sports bra as well. Um, but this is the kind of essential thing that we're looking for, right? Now, you can express this with tone, or you could just put down a line for where that, uh, where that plane is, that limit, you know, uh, between, you know, this and this. Now, one thing that students ask me sometimes, and they're like, w where exactly is the plane break? Well, the thing is that the planes don't really exist, right? So it's like, you don't get like exact, you know, point, exact coordinates, you get a region, right? So if you have, you know, let's say here, 
the plane break where it goes from front to side is somewhere in here. Is it this? Is it that? Is it this, this, this? Well, frankly, at that point, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know that the plane break is around here somewhere. It's definitely not here and it's not over here, right? So at that point, if you put it here or you put it here or you put it here, then you're fine. You know, at that point, it just, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter that much. So what I would do here, Amin, is like when you put in, you know, let's say here, you have to imagine that these aren't lines, right? But that these, think of what the lines represent, right? They represent the outside, you know, border of, um, of a form, right? And the torso in this case. You have to think that the torso is elastic, right? So think of these not so much like just lines on a piece of paper, but like, like rubber bands that you're stretching between points, right? And you have to think of the stretch as they, you know, as they move from point A to point B. You have to think not just of like visually, just like, boom, here goes a line for this. But no, even if it's a simple line drawing, you have to think like, how does this pull all the way across here along this, you know, relatively sort of cylindrical, you know, um, aspect of the torso? And how does it pinch this in? You know, how does this wrap around, not just here, but how do we draw this in such a way that it reflects what it's doing over here? Now, you don't have to touch down everywhere, but you have to think about like, how is this pulling all the way through here, right? Now, over here, you have to think, okay, this is coming down like this. You know, if you're going to put in, you know, let's say the, um, you know, here for the, for the, for the, for the bottoms, basically you're not necessarily just making stuff up, right? But what you're doing is you are looking in the, in the data that your model supplies you, you're looking for certain things. Like you're looking for ways to show like where you're going to turn from front to side. Well, the outline here, you know, it looks like you drew it sort of more visually, right? And so that'll make you see certain kinds of information. But if you think of this not as a line, but as a representation of space, then you'll start to see, well, okay, well, I'm hunting, I'm looking for this part, you know, which you can actually plainly see here, right? There's very definitely, you know, a part that goes this way, and there's a little break, you know, where it goes in that direction. And so we're looking for this. We're looking for how this goes across. The reason why there's this little wiggle in the outline here is because since the form is going like this, this the 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 band has to travel, you know, you know, side to side here, or back to front here, then side to side, then it has to go up, then it has to go across again, right? So those are the kinds of things that you know you want to think about like and you know the structure is not something that's like you know the structure is not a step right the movement the gesture is not a step in your drawing it is something it is the they're the basic ingredients of your drawing so they're things that you're always thinking about here imagining this in 3d and how this is going to wrap around when you start thinking of it this way you know here we can put in a little indication for that plane break um, if you want to keep it strictly as a line drawing, you can just have like a little line indication here. You can also just show it by, again, showing the break, you know, in the underwear, right? Like in the outline of the underwear as it goes from here and being very intentional about that from here to, you know, over to here, right? That expresses enough about, you know, how this changes from, you know, front to side. Um, but if you want to reinforce it more, then, you know, you're more than welcome to add a little tone or add something like this. Um, when you have, you know, say like for the legs, you have to think of, again, not just visually a line, but you have to think of, okay, the leg has to connect into the hips. It grows out of the hips, right? So how are we going to make that connection? How is it going to, you know, what's the hook that's going to bring it up to here? And so, you know, when we look over, you can see that this, you know, the outline crosses, you know, in here. And if you squint down, right, and squinting and stepping back are very, very useful tools, because they force you to simplify. Then if you squint down, you can see how this fits into, you know, the actual hip, right? So again, whether you're doing the line drawing or not, your thinking has to be, if you're concerned about the structure of the body, then you have to be thinking about movement and, you know, like the, and, and the actual, you know, total structures, 
even if you're representing them in a limited way. Um, and so here, okay, like you have to think of like, okay, as this is coming down, how does, you know, the muscle, how do the muscles from here link up to the lower leg? Well, basically, you know, you can study what the muscles are and all that, but that doesn't really, you don't need to do that to know the answer, right? What's happening is you basically have bony points here, right? And then you have these elastic things that join them, right? To transfer movement from one to the next one. So basically what you have is like, you know, a little hook, right? Like a little link going from here, you know, all the way through here and linking up, you know, over here. So you see that happening right here. And if you squint, you'll see it more clearly, right? You can see it happening here, right? Where every section, every sort of muscle that's, let's say these muscles belong to the upper leg. Yes, but they're reaching for the lower leg. They have a hook that grabs onto the next, um, you know, the next body part. And so that feeling of, you know, that idea of creating links between the body, that's what you want to do, right? Um, because that's what communicates the actual movement. Now, if you start looking for things like this, then when you do these drawings, you are actively, you're not just doing a drawing, you're learning things about the body that you can carry with you for next time, right? And so that's the ultimate goal is that what these drawings look like in themselves does not matter, right? What matters is that you're using these drawings to gain more knowledge, right? And so for instance, if you're going to include an interior marking here, let's make it something that is, you know, a little bit more sort of um, purposeful, right? So let's say that, okay, we know that, you know, this part of the, it's not, you know, the abdominals, but also like some of the ribs, like leading into, into the abdominals. There's basically a bunch of stuff going this way and going over like this. And, you know, there's this sort of mass in here fitting into that, right? So communicating this idea that this stuff is going this way and it's sort of like, you know, traveling in this direction, right? But it, you know, there's an obstacle here, right? Which is, you know, the oblique. And this has to travel around that. That becomes part of the focus here, right? Because that's what the torso is actually doing. So if you put in an interior marking, you know, let it be something that is expressive of that, right? Like it could just be this, you know, it could be that, right? But just the kind of thing that, you know, the lines themselves tell you something about what's, um, you know, what's going on um, structurally. So what you do is, you know, you try to mine, you know, the, the visual elements that you're going to put in to communicate as much as possible, right? The, like you really make, if you're only going to give yourself a few lines, then you really, really make them count, right? Yeah, uh, here, the belly button, like, you know, use it to express, you know, this piece of the center line and maybe like a little bit of like, you know, just the, the, the width of the body going across or a little bit of like the axis, right? Here, when you see the belly button, it has, it's like, it, you know, looks like almost like a little triangle. Basically, it's showing a little bit of the center line here. And because this part goes across, it shows us also the horizontal dimension of the body and generally the axis that the hips are following. So, you know, you want these things to mean more to you than just shapes or lines. Um, that is, I think, one of the, the, the biggest uh, sort of issues that I see is that Again, people sort of focus on the final output rather than, you know, sort of the, the, the causes that are, you know, creating the, those kinds of phenomena. It's like, it's like looking at what we're doing right now and, you know, not seeing it as a drawing, but being like, oh, wow, look at all those pixels. Well, it's like, that's not really the point, right? But anyway, that is, um, and here, I'll just go ahead and uh, save it back out into the, into the folder here. But here, if we just, um, you know, if we zoom out here, let me just, uh, let me just grab this stuff separately here, make that a, oops. And uh, by I the way, I don't know about that. anybody else, but this is like, this is really great. This is blowing my mind. So. <laughs> uh, by the way, Dev, if, uh, if anybody has like questions, like in the chat, I'm not looking at the chat because, you know, you can only focus on one thing at a time, but if anybody has like any questions or anything that, that come up, um, 
you know, if, if you don't mind kind of relaying those onto me, like if you think it's like an especially relevant thing. Yeah, if anybody has questions, feel free to ask. Um, I think my I think my instinct is that this is just too clear for people to have questions <laughs> right now. It's just so well explained. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is that like it, it's it, it. I mean, the funny thing is that I spent all this time studying anatomy, and like my job now is basically to tell people that like anatomy doesn't matter that much. Not because like it doesn't matter, but it just doesn't matter as much as people think. Like so people think <laughs> that anatomy is going to be some magic cure to all their problems, yeah. but actually no. Like because again, what people mean when they say anatomy, they like they're usually talking about like muscles and bones or whatever. And again, there's this notion of like, oh yes, I know, I know anatomy. Like I you know have mastered all this whatever. What about the digestive system? What about the nervous system? What about, you know, all this other stuff? Like, <laughs> clearly, we're not studying all anatomy, right? Like, there's clearly limits to it. Um, I do think, by the way, for studying, like, when you, one of the biggest issues, actually, in terms of art education, I'm going to unshare the screen for a second. One of the biggest issues is people just kind of thinking that, um, or like the, the compartmentalization of these, like, different skills, right? Yeah. Like, in the end, you are always thinking about the same things. You know, you're thinking about, again, like anything that you put down has a certain movement. It has a certain angle, right? So, but the, what people will do is they'll say like, oh yes, I did my gesture stage and now I'm doing my construction stage. And, and people wonder why their long drawings don't have movement in them. Well, yeah, because you stopped thinking about that like three stages ago, right? And the thing is that the more you clear out your head and only have a few principles in mind, right? Again, just... Movement, character, structure, right? These aren't these these aren't things that I came up with. These are things that are recurring in terms of and basically all drawing is composed of these things. It's sort of inescapable, right? Um, I'm just kind of giving them a name, but even that, um, you know, it's um, you see that a lot in like French academic uh, drawing. You know, just that kind of idea of like those are the things that they got people to focus on largely. Um, you know, regardless of whether you're doing like a tonal drawing or a line drawing or whatever, like, again, everything you put down has movement. It is distinct from other things. Like if you put down a line that's straight versus a line that's curved or a line that's squiggly or a line that's thick, that is a type of thing. So that's the character, right? Like you're always choosing what type of thing you're putting down. And then everything has a structure. Even for a simple line, it's going to have a defined length, right? It has, it's going to have a position in space. And so the way that I think a lot of this stuff works best is if you kind of approach it not as like learning everything absolutely, but more like um, you go through different sort of like levels of resolution. Yeah. Like you can have a very basic understanding of the biggest movements of the body, the overall character of something, the overall structure. And then as time goes on, you start to understand like, how that stuff applies to like smaller structures and then smaller ones and then smaller ones. And, and you get them like these fractals. Yeah, because a lot of it is like, again, uh, to use an example that people are going to be familiar with, when you watch a YouTube video and let's say you're somewhere where it has like poor internet and like you can only watch it in 240p, you can still watch it. You still know what's happening largely, right? And having it in like, you know, high res or whatever is nice, but like by the time that you get to like, you know, let's say 240p, let's say you get 360, 480 or whatever, right? By the time you're like a medium resolution, you don't really gain that much by having like the higher resolution thing, right? Because all of the gist of it is communicated in like the simpler- like There's like diminishing the returns. This is funny because exactly. it's the same thing I talk about in value of like yeah. the first two value mm -hmm. breakdown, like that's has everything, has 90%. Yeah. Then the next yeah. one, the three values get 95 and then smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Exactly. And you have to, and you always have to do that calculation of like, there's a cutoff. Yeah. There's a point where, is it worth it to, you know, um, spend, sink all this extra time getting something to like 95% when it's already 93% yeah. of the way there? Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Again, if the stakes are really high, like you're building like a spaceship, if your drawing is like, you know, like some kind of engineering thing, then yeah, go ahead, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but even that has a cutoff, right? And but if you're drawing for like, I don't know, you're drawing like a, a bucket in your composition in the back of like the like in the background, then listen, it's not that important. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to sit there like constructing your ellipses to you know sort of mathematical percept uh, perfection.
Yeah. Um, there's you know, a, mm -hmm. sorry, there's a question in the chat that says, um, I usually get confused rendering with limited values, two or three. How do I simplify complex forms? Um, in the end, it looks like the face is dirty, like the values are muddy. How do you not overdo yeah. it? I'm, I'm interested, how do you think about these value concepts with kind of the way that you're just using a line in the demo? Yeah, so basically, uh, again, like using line or using tone is like writing in cursive or writing in block letters. Like it's, it's not something that is like a sort of... Um, it's not, it's not what's driving the idea, right? That's just the method of delivery, right? And so, you know, it's, um, it's kind of like if I need to hammer a nail or if I need to put a nail on my wall, I can use a hammer or I can use a rock, right? The, at the end of the day, if the, hammer go, if the nail goes in, the nail goes in, right? And so it's like, that's the important part. It's not so much like having the perfect tool for that or that the like the tool in itself is not the determinant necessarily of like, you know, the, um, the, the, the task or the idea. Basically, as far as like what we're, what we're doing, like I think as far as that in terms of like planes, right? So I think like, okay, what's the front? What's the side? Mm -hmm. It just so happens that the way that we see things, um, you know, basically if you have a plane, you know, that is flat, like even an area that's flat, it gets just one value, right? And if you bend that surface, you know, to something like this, then you'll have two values. And then if you bend it again, then, you know, here, my lighting is not great, but basically, you know, you, at a certain point, you end up having like one, two, three, you know, one per surface. Um, I think understanding that, like, even just not even seeing it as rendering, like, I would say, like, just get rid of the idea of like rendering in your head, but think of it as sculpting. So you're either sculpting with line or you're sculpting with tone and it doesn't really matter which one. Like the main thing that you should, you should convince yourself that what you're drawing is actually real and that you're actually like moving it around and stuff. Um, because what happens then is you're not so focused on like, oh, this little spot, you know, or this little spot or this little spot. You're thinking, okay, I have this like lump of clay, let's say on my paper. And right now it just feels sort of like amorphous. So I cut the side of it, right? And, you know, then it's like, okay, now it's a box. Well, okay, that's a little too crude. So I cut the corner off the box. So now it has a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a bevel. That I think is more useful. In terms of classifying the values, squinting is really helpful, right? Like one thing that, one thing that I think is really useful in terms of like teaching is, um, using the tools that are available to you that are sort of like relatively, you know, again, quote unquote, like they create like a little pocket of objectivity, right? So for instance, like if we, let's say we take something that's like, I don't know, fairly like complex, like we'll, you know, sort of steal like a little bougaro over here or something. Um, let's see, we'll pick one that's like, you know, relatively, um, you know, or relatively uncomplicated, uh, maybe like one of his earlier paintings or something. Um, here we go. We'll take this one, the disdain painting. This is uh, this is for the pre, uh, not the pre de Rome, the um, expression head uh, competition. So what they would do is they would have a model sit there for eighteen hours over three days, and you know the students would have to again as part of this contest would have to um, you know represent the model in like whatever sort of like attitude was predetermined. Uh, obviously, since the model has to sit there for that long, the poses are things like hate, disdain, you know, like despair. There's not as many like happy poses that you can hold for 18 hours. But, um, you know, one thing that I would do is if, if you all have access to Photoshop or like even like some of the open source alternatives, then what I would do is use those tools for visual analysis. So if you're teaching yourself how to organize values, all that you get from a teacher is they guide you in terms of seeing things a certain way, like seeing them like more simply, right? And eliminating unnecessary information. If someone tried to replicate this painting or to copy it, they would probably get very stuck on like all of these little inconsequential tiny tones, right? And it's really hard to make your brain stop doing that. And so, you know, if you squint, then it makes it easier to see the, the simple, um, you know, aspects that are really the main ingredients of this. However, you know, most people will forget to squint or they won't see why it's such a big deal. 
So what you can do here, uh, just to really drill it into your head, and this is this thing is a better teacher than like, this thing simplifies more effectively than any person that I know, right? You go in here, you go into the filter gallery in Photoshop, you're gonna go to brush strokes, you're gonna go to crosshatch, right? You're gonna take the, the sharpness down all the way to the bottom, right? And the strength and like the stroke length, you're going to crank up as, as you know, as, uh, as far as you want, depending on the level of, uh, of detail that you, that you want. And um, actually, it does work better on images that are a little bit smaller. So we'll make this a little bit lower resolution. We'll make, make it like, uh, say, a thousand, thousand pixels. Probably make my computer happy to not be <clears throat> stressing it out so much. So anyway, uh, we go back to filter gallery. Yeah, this is what you're looking for, right? So like, Let's see, we'll drop this down for a second. So if you crank this up, the reason why I like this filter as opposed to blurring is that it doesn't necessarily just round everything off. Like if you do this, it'll show you where things are pointier, where things are rounder. Notice as soon as we do that, it's much easier to see like, oh, the eyes are fairly round. The brows are a little bit more squarish. The nose is fairly pointy. You know, this part of the forehead is fairly round you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? You also get these very clear simplifications where it eliminates all the small detail and you say, oh, here's the front of the nose, here's the side of it, here's the bottom, right? Granted, there's a little bit of extra information here, but it gives you like a head start, right? When you see like the planes and like, you know, uh, any sort of basic plane diagram, this is the idea that they're trying to express. Like it becomes much easier to see this when you know you when you have like concrete evidence of it right and so you also get to see like again how these smaller changes in the surface and the values that they produce are not that important right so basically if you were to paint this and if you were to think of it this way it becomes pretty easy to do the rest of this stuff to add this stuff on top like for instance like to create like the the rest of the of the lid you know, or like the opening for the eye, if you have, let's say, the eyeball, right? Even the eyeball as a round thing, you can at first just think of it as, you know, one, two, three planes, right? Because three is the minimum number of planes that you need to make something start rounding. So again, it's about sort of like really aggressively like simplifying and really taking that leap and trusting that it'll, um, that it'll work because it does. It's worked for a lot of people for a long time. And so, that's what I would do in terms of classifying your values. Basically, just figure out what the darkest point is on your subject. You can figure that out by squinting and figure out what the lightest point is. And if you're, say, trying to figure out like the value of like the flesh, well, compare it to like, you know, let's say like your darkest tone. Let's say this is the darkest point. Compare it to that. Compare it to the lightest one. You're like, okay, well, it's closer to the lighter one than it is to, you know, the darkest one. And you just go from there. You know, you ask yourself, like, how much? How much lighter is it than this one? Well, it's kind of towards the middle, but it's not in the absolute middle. It is, you know, on the lighter end of the spectrum. Okay, fine. You know, but that's uh, sort of what you, um, that's what you want to do as far as, uh, as far as classifying that. So, um, you know, you all can let me know if that made sense, but the, um, this filter is extremely useful. Like you could, you could basically oh, get like different versions of a painting by using different degrees of this filter. And it, it basically gives you like a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to paint like whatever you're looking at. So I've been calling this painter vision for my classes because this is basically what you're trying to accomplish. Like you are, you know, trying to get it in your head to see things as close to this as, as possible. So anyway, here, we'll close this up. And yeah, so anyway, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here. Uh, this was the main idea. Again, just think of like a larger purpose rather than just like making it a line drawing to make it a line drawing. Uh, again, if you're studying structure, then make everything that you do be reflective of that structure. And as far as anatomy is concerned, you know, the movement is part of the anatomy. So that's something that you want to keep in mind constantly. Okay. All right. So I'll save this one out and we're off to the next one. Okay. So we'll go to Andres. And let's see. All right, cool. Uh, let's see. Prove my skills in terms of expression and movement in the figure. I feel like sometimes my figure drawings tend to look rigid. Okay. All right. Let's check that out. 
um, which again, it's sort of a very similar uh, uh, kind of thing. You have to ask yourself, what, what is movement? Like, wh what do you mean by, you know, getting more expression and movement in your figures, right? Because figure drawings, you know, static images like this don't actually move. They don't literally move, right? So what we're showing is what the, it's, it's implied movement, right? What is movement generally anyway? You know, movement is basically something changing position, right? And that's effectively what we're controlling here is, you know, changes in position. And so the other thing about movement, at least when it's performed like an action, let's say it's performed by a, a person or an organism or whatever, you know, let's say you throw a punch or you throw a baseball or whatever, you're doing that with your entire body. It's a coordinated effort between all the parts working together, right? And so as far as that goes, okay, when you think about these things, you have to think about them in such a way that you answer your own question, right? So we're looking for what? We're looking in terms of movement for the coordinated um, action of various parts, right? So we're looking for the, you know, sort of, um, you know, you can think, think of it as like everything working as a team, right? Uh, you know, elements in your drawing are like, you know, soccer players. Like one soccer player does, doesn't just get to do whatever they want. <laughs> you know, they have to basically, you know, do whatever they can for the, for the good and the ultimate success of the team as a whole. Right. So you have to sort of, you know, prioritize like the largest overall, um, you know, either like um, arrangement or the largest element that will, you know, that will express that idea that everything is working together in your in your figure. Um, and so that's, you know, that's primarily what we're trying to do. Again, that has to do with the orchestration of the parts. We also have to control, you know, the position of things, right? Because in practical terms, that is, you know, sort of all we have to express this kind of potential movement. Um, I guess one other thing we could add to that is that there's also, again, sort of like um, almost like stored kind of like kinetic energy. Like when you look at like a spring, even if it's not, springing it looks like it could right like you know you see this sort of like little coil like this and you know that at any second it could like you know stretch out like that the body is basically like that this is you know what i call the meat braid the meat braid is basically the movement going across you know the uh the the figure right and it's not just for people it's for any sort of um you know organic uh form so you have the long movement, right? Along, again, the largest axis that you can find on something. However, basically everything, especially in the body, you know, is a, there's also movements that are going across, right? And you get things that are, you know, effectively like this. You know, you get like, and that, the reason for that is that building something as a spiral is one of the most efficient ways that you can actually like, you know, um, that you can design something. Like apparently spiral staircases, I think, take less energy to go up and they require fewer building materials than, you know, your like typical staircase. It's sort of the same thing here where it's like the way your body is built is basically, you know, created along like the conservation of effort, you know. And so in, in a sense, what I'm saying is that nature is lazy, <laughs> you know, that your body is lazy intrinsically. And we want to we want to celebrate that. Right. So. This is something that you find that like, again, the body has these basic like, you know, patterns going across like this. And you notice someone might say like, oh, yes, this has movement. Well, again, it, it's not literally moving, right? So that's not actually literally true, but it feels as if it could move. And that's kind of the point here, right? This is actually pretty much the same thing that I told Amin in the, in the, in the previous, um, you know, the previous um, uh, 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 feedback session, which is basically that all of the, the things that you feel that you're struggling with, you know, you have to, they're usually not the actual problem. Like the actual problem is something that happens before that. You're just seeing the symptoms of some larger um, thing. And so it's kind of like if you have a leak in your apartment, you know, the each individual like little water drop that you're stopping is not really the, 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 the actual problem. Like you have to find the source of the leaks to stop all of them. You can't just put more sort of like pots and pans out to catch the water, right? And so that's the case with this too, is that you have to ask yourself, you know, are you stopping to analyze the overall movement, you know, in the beginning? And as you add other elements to your drawings, 
are you making sure that every element participates in that movement, that every element is a, a team player, as it were, right? Because it's really hard to separate different parts of the body, right? Like you have the skin that unifies everything. If you, it's hard to even just move one body part without influencing some other one next to it, right? And so those are the things that you want to, that you want to consider as you're, as you're working. For instance, like if you have, let's say this figure here, um, you know, are we thinking about how, for instance, you know, the trapezius here, like, and it doesn't matter that it's a trapezius, by the way, but, you know, that, you know, say like this, like how this is like, you know, pulling into the shoulder, right? How this actually lines up with the pectoral, right? One thing that you find is, you know, in general, basically, if you have the clavicle here, you know, you have the outer one third of it taken up by the deltoid and the inner two thirds of it are taken up by the pectoral, right? And that's on the lower side. On the upper side, that upper third is actually taken up by the trapezius, right? So the trapezius and the deltoid form this link, right? Now, again, is it useful to know anatomy to, to do that? to some degree, it can help you to recognize it a little faster, but you could just, you could just, you know, sort of when you look at your reference, when you look at your model, try to look for, you know, anything that links existing parts. Like if you have something that you put down, see if you can relate it to something else. See if there's some way to not just put the arm here, but make it grow out of the rest of the, the rest of the body. Um, you know, you have to think of every element in your drawing as if you have basically like a tree, so you have the trunk of the tree, right? And then you have, you know, the branches growing out of that. And then like, you know, smaller branches growing out of the big branches. You know, when you have, you know, the arms for a human figure, say we have a little, little person here. You know, you don't just sort of draw the parts separately like this. You have to think about how one part will lead into the next one, how they connect, right? And if you're putting in the arms, well, the arms, you know, basically have to grow out of the existing parts of the figure, right? Like everything ends up connecting. You can't just sort of put the arm there, just, you know, sort of like with no relationship to what, um, you know, what's already um, established, right? And so you want to try to do that from, you know, everywhere you can. If you, you know, you try to draw, like, let's say like, okay, think about like, you know, how does, what's the tilt of the head? You know, how does this come down? Is there a way to link this? Like, how do you draw the breast here so that, you know, you form a connection between here and here? Because there probably will be one, right? It might not be like this specific area, but there might be something else. Maybe there's a little pull on the, on the belly button that we're missing or some little half tone or something here. But everything that you put in, um, and here on this, you have to think of like, okay, like how does this, how does this relate to some other part? Like when you draw this here, how does it connect to say like what the pectoral is doing up here, right? How does one part lead into the next one? How does, for instance, like, you know, the direction here of, you know, this part of the, um, this part of the quads, how does that lead back up into this, right? And it's one of those things that like, if you're just focused on shape or if you're focused on creating a nice drawing, you're going to miss that, right? And so you have to make sure that everything that you're doing is aligned for like these like sort of larger um, purposes. Um, one thing that you'll find in here too is like, okay, as this comes through you know, here, you have the, the bicep and all that. Um, usually when you have the arm in this position, by the way, you know, what's happening is the bones are crossing, right? So you're going to have the, you know, the radius on the outside and the ulna, um, you know, here in the, in the middle. When the thumb is down, like this, the radius always goes from the outside of the arm to wherever the thumb is. So if the thumb is, you know, over here, then the radius is just right there. If the thumb is over here, then the radius has to cross, right? So it's not about memorizing the muscles or the bones. 
It's about setting up these basic conditions. Like if you find basically the outside of the elbow and you find the thumb, you will always know where the radius is because the radius can't be anywhere else, right? So if you do that, following that basic principle, then you don't have to memorize what the arm looks like in all these different positions. You can just deduce what it's going to be, right? You can just reason your way through it. So anyway, one thing that happens here is that as this is crossing over, you know, you're going to see a twist in the arm. And of course, the radius drags all these other, you know, sort of um, uh, muscles with it, right? And so effectively here, what we're doing is we're thinking of again, a long direction. Like what is the, the point of this? Like we were saying before, all this other stuff in here doesn't matter so much. What matters is that we get from the beginning to the end, right? We get like, you know, from point A to point B. Like you're sort of traveling through the figure. You know, that's really what you're, what you're doing uh, a lot of the time. And in terms of just looking for essentials, like think of it this way, like, you know, when you design like the, like the current designs for prosthetic legs. And these are like the prosthetic legs people can use for running, right? Like they basically look like this oh. and like that, right? Now, okay, this is designed to give you all the functionality that you would have from, you know, a, you know, a, a standard issue leg, right? So why doesn't it have toes? Why doesn't it have a heel? Because those parts are actually not that important, you know. Um, if you and in drawing, you know, obviously this supplies all the chain of movement. Otherwise, the people that designed these would have added the extra stuff if it were absolutely necessary. But it's not, right? And so the form is going to follow function, right? That is like that's why again things look the way they do. Like when you look at like a, a cat or a dog or an elephant versus a person, we have generally the same muscles, right? The only difference is that, you know, they live differently. They adapt to different environments. And so, you know, different muscles and different bones take on different sizes because they have a different importance, right? And so the same thing is, is true here where you want to ask yourself, like, what is a leg for? Like, what's the most important part of the leg, right? In this case, it's basically this. It's, you know, the legs are for moving, right? So you have the energy transfer going from the lower leg, you know, through the ankle, into the body of the foot. So in any case, if you have this, then it's easy enough, you know, to afterwards, you're like, oh, okay, so we have this, you know, maybe we cut this off right here, maybe here are those extra toes, and then here's the heel, you know, back here. Because you'll notice that what this is actually doing is this is mimicking the way that you know, if you were to have, let's say, you know, a quote unquote anatomical leg, you know, you have the bones, which are the things that basically the, you know, they're, they're sort of the organizing elements that the muscles attach themselves to, right? And the muscles are the things that, you know, move the actual bones, right? They're the things that form the links between the, between the bones. So the muscles are sort of, again, part of that energy transfer, you know, um, system, if we want to call it that. So generally for the big form of the leg, you have all this system of, you know, these tendons coming from the, the hamstring and from over here. So you have the sartorius and the gracilis and the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus. The, 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 you know, the exact sort of things about those don't really matter to us right now. And then you have, you know, here, the gastrocnemius, the, the calf, it pulls into the heel, right? And then from the heel, you have an adductor that goes into, you know, this, um, you know, basically the back of like the big, the big toe. Here you have the tendons that, well, you have the muscles that turn into the tendons that raise the toes, right? And so you have all of that. And then back here, you have some little flexors, you know, that, you know, basically go under here, therefore curling the toes back. Okay. So the reason why I'm mentioning that is basically when you get this, um, oh, where did my cursor go? When you get, you know, all of this stuff in here, not all of it is, again, is going to be equally important for us, right? And so 
when you're designing something like this on a budget for mass production to improve people's lives, then what you do is you just, it's raw efficiency, right? So you're looking for, again, the energy transfer from here into here and out through this thing. Well, that's basically what you have here as well. You have this leading into this, right? And then the flexors transfer that, basically they go around the ankle, they transfer that into here and they come out through the biggest sort of, you know, driver of the body of the foot, which is the big toe, right? So when you think about it, you know, it's basically just prioritizing, right? It's like your heels and your toes are just there sort of as an adornment in a sense. They're sort of for extra stability maybe in some ways. But this is the really important part that you're looking for. So no matter how many muscles you study, no matter how much anatomy you think about, you have to bring it back to this. This is the actual thing that matters because that's what lets you move, okay? So in any case, that is the kind of basic thinking that you want to exercise when you're doing this as well, right? So if you have a figure like here, then you want to ask yourself like, okay, does the arm ever just kind of exist on its own like this, right? Because the, the drawings that you're doing, they, they have a lot of really great qualities, right? And they're, they're very confident, they're very effective, um, they're very beautifully done, right? But the thing is that that's almost kind of the issue is that I think that even if you're not thinking that much about the movement, you can make a drawing that is nice looking enough that it becomes a little bit of a trap, right? So what you want to do is not get too stuck on like little things like this, but ask yourself like, and you're starting to see it here, right? If you have, you know, let's say the neck here, right? And you almost make it a game, like see how many things you can connect. If you have, you know, these fibers coming down this way, and let's say you're going to have the shoulder here, right? Let's say you have the deltoid coming through here and all that. The arm is basically growing out of this, right? It's like it's connected to, to, to all of this. And so what you're actually looking for is like draw the things that show how the arm is part of this system. You know, don't draw a bunch of little, little parts and stuff. Like basically don't draw by adding things. Don't draw by just kind of putting like, oh, I put this in and I put this in and I put this in and I put this in. Find some way to draw the entire thing. Okay. Like the entire sort of like broad movement of this and then divide it, then come in and chop it up, but don't try to make it out of the small things and then try to piece them together. Right. And again, stylistically, that can look very different. Right. But the basic principle is that you are trying to like, you're trying to express the largest ideas about, you know, the, the figure or whatever your subject is. And then you're sort of, um, you know, worried about the smaller, the smaller details. Like all of the other little things are only there to supplement, you know, the sort of larger um, aspect here. Now, this is a movement going down this way, right? The arm is basically hanging off of here. Um, again, similarly to, you know, the, um, to the front, here, the deltoid actually attaches about halfway through here on the, um, on the scapula, and it basically lines up with some of the fibers of the trapezius here. So again, you get this chain of movement going from here to here and then whoop, flowing all the way down. Notice how there's a little bit too much of a stop here, right? We need a little bit more of a link going up into this because otherwise it just creates a hard stop. Now, we might think of that as a design thing, and I guess in some ways it is, but it's also the fact that you have the, um, you know, the supinator group there, the brachioradialis and the, uh, the long uh, extensor of the radius. And so what's interesting about this is that if you work off of that principle that, you know, the parts have to connect and then you have to transfer the, the sort of energy from one part to the next one, and that you can't really have hard stops because, you know, otherwise you wouldn't be able to move your arm then you start to deduce where muscles would be. If that muscle, if we didn't know that muscle existed, we would have put it in anyway because we're like, well, no, well, there needs to be something there that does that. So what happens is you get into the logic of why the muscles are even there. And that is, that is very useful. And that is something that's very powerful. You'll find that in here too. And then that means that you have fewer things to think about, right? Because if, you know, if I'm drawing this, I'm thinking, okay, I need to get the overall movement of you know, the torso, right? That's, you know, best supplied by the spine here. I'm trying to understand like what is happening, you know, here, you know, along the longest axis, because that gives me most of the information that I need. So we're trying to get, basically, you're trying to get to the ground. You're trying to like exit out the figure as best you can. 
Now, as you do that, then of course, like, you know, there's also movement going across, right? And so, you know, then you're like, oh, okay, well, okay, I see that between the, you know, this and this, there's going to be, you know, a link, right? Okay, that's fine. You know, as you study the figure, you'll find that, you know what, there might be these other recurring patterns here, right? You might have like, oh, this right here, this little bend, you know, basically is coming from this point up here, or even if we just draw a little piece of it, we can trace it back to, you know, something coming up from here. And maybe, you know, this muscle coming in from like under the, uh, the scapula, maybe that's following the same pattern, right? Maybe it's going up to the same point. Maybe you see the, the rhomboid muscles. Those are also kind of, you know, following the same point. And then you find that like, you know, some piece of the trapezius is doing the same thing, right? So you start looking for not individual muscles, but like groups of actions, like groups of muscles doing stuff together, right? As a team. And so that becomes very, very powerful because instead of thinking of each little thing individually, you're thinking about what they do as a group, right? And it's much easier to think of things uh, that way. Like things only mean something because of how you organize them. Like if you have a bunch of bricks just sitting there, then all you have is a bunch of bricks. <laughs> but if you take those bricks and you make them into a wall, well, that wall can now mean, you know, like shelter for somebody, right? It can mean shade in the, you know, from the sun. It can mean like, you know, protection from other elements. It can be protection from danger or whatever. But the bricks by themselves don't do anything, right? It's only by giving them a purpose that, um, you know, that they become actually meaningful. So that would be the main thing that I would look for is like, don't worry so much about making like nice drawings. Like that is a consequence, you know, of having you know things that are you know very well integrated and they kind of give people that feeling of like oneness of like one person one figure rather than an assortment of parts it's like the difference between a pile of laundry and an outfit you know what i mean it's like it's it's in how you organize it so i think you know if you if you step back a little bit from the drawings and and think of it that way i think that'll make it a little bit um, a little bit easier so here we'll go ahead and move on to next person uh okay next we have aria Okay, these Aria have been struggling out with making the figure what look 3D and natural. They always look flat and stiff. Proportions and connecting different parts of the body have been issues too. The drawings attached are from reference and imagination, 20 to 25 minutes each. Should I focus on doing longer studies, one to two hours? I feel like I'm not getting better. I'm not sure what to do. Um, basically, what you want to do, Aria, is like there's no sort of magic time limit. Like the, the reason that people do short poses is because it doesn't give you time to do other stuff, you know, so it keeps you sort of like, um, you know, um, it, it, it keeps you on task uh, largely, right? But you know the drawings overall are looking good here. Um, I would say that the main thing is by the time you start getting into this, it does look like you're thinking very separately or at least like, and it comes by degrees, right? There's obviously a general movement that you have here, but it doesn't seem like something that you're, you know, thinking of throughout the process, right? It doesn't seem like something that's like, you know, um, you know, sort of always like that you're relating everything always back to that sort of like major, um, you know, initial initial uh, um, aspect. So I think in terms of making the figure feel more 3D and more natural, the 3D part just has to do with like showing the different planes. Um, so that's something that's like easy enough. What I would do is like, usually, in a sense, like we we make things sort of more complicated than they have to be. So, you know, Someone might be saying like, oh, I don't know how to show, you know, like it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like saying no, right? Where it's like, let's say that like, you know, your friend's like, hey, you want to hang out today? And, you know, someone might be like, oh, I don't know how to say like no to this. Well, yes, you do. You literally would just say N-O, like just you just get the sound out, right? Now, of course, it's obviously more nuanced than that, right? Because there are other, other factors, like you don't want your friends to be upset with you and things like that. But at the end of the day, you if you don't want to do something, you have to relate it back to that. Like no matter how you sugarcoat it or whatever else you add, you know, onto there to be more diplomatic, you have to, the bottom line is, you know, like, no. And it's the same thing with this, right? Where it's like, if you, because you, you clearly know, you know, to like wrap, you know, sort of like, if, for instance, like here, like wrapping these rings around the figure, right? Um, you know that that makes it three-dimensional because otherwise you wouldn't be doing it here. And so what you want to do is 
you might express those things very obviously at first. If your priority is making it more three-dimensional, then it doesn't matter like just any way you can try to get that, right? But ultimately, the reality of that is that there are many ways to show like, you know, the, 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 you know, like the planes and the three-dimensionality of something. Basically, all that you're responsible for is showing that something has, you know, basically a dimension front to back, side to side, and up and down. If you can show all of those three things, you know, in one way or another, then you're good. People do that by, let's say we take a surface here, right? That's like flat, like this. Okay, then we'll have a few iterations of it here and here and here and here. Okay, so if you add this to it, that starts to suggest that it's, you know, um, three-dimensional because it, that separation starts to create a little bit of a feeling that there's something there. If you put in just a, and maybe, maybe we'll, we'll cap this off here, right? This will be an imperfect sort of 3D thing, but it, it gets to, you know, the, the core of the issue here. So let's say we do that. That's a very rudimentary kind of 3D, you know? Um, let's say we put in a tone here. Well, that actually does start to suggest, a, you know, a bit of that too. It's, it's a little bit clearer in this case uh, using that. Um, you could also, you know, go into the surface and add something like this. You know, this is what I call the, the staple, right? This, and, you know, with these, you know, you can add the staple onto these and it strengthens the feeling of three-dimensionality, right? So it's basically, whether it's an outline or a tone, you're using changes, whether they're changes in direction or changes in the intensity of a tone, to show that there's a change, right? Um, again, here you can use this, and basically this implies that there's, you know, another surface here, another side. Um, another way of doing that that's a little bit less specific but still useful is doing this, right? You're basically taking the surface and you're showing that it has, you know, that it's elevated off the, off the ground. Now, if you want a figure that's more naturalistic, then you would use, this is, this becomes the main thing that you use, right? You mainly do it by changes in tone. If you want to show, you know, if you have to do it faster, then you probably rely on line because it takes less time to do it that way. And ditto for these kind of more diagrammatic sort of ways of expressing that. Um, so in any case, you know, what I would do is, again, try to show that in like the simplest, boldest way that you can. So without getting too stuck on like any, um, you know, small aspects of the, of the figure, you know, any of like the small bumps or whatever, try to show, again, the big movement, the character, and the structure. So here, if we squint down, you know, and you already have this to a degree, you just, you know, I think you want to show this like more, more clearly. So, okay, there's a side to this, right? If you squint down, okay, this is going up. You can kind of see that, you know, if you ignore the strap here, there is actually a connection from the arm leading into this, um, into this trapezius. Now, the trapezius, you don't want to necessarily draw it just by drawing these little things here. You want to draw, you want to draw it as something physical. You want to think of it as like, how is it? This is pulling off of the um, off of the neck and into it's expanding into the rest of the the rest of the body, right? It's sort of like this thing that's like. It's like it has these little tendrils that are reaching into, you know, all these different parts. Now, the arm is, it has to come from somewhere, right? It doesn't just originate here. The movement for the arm and all of that, you can see little clues here going this way. It's coming from the back, right? It's coming around like that. And so you want to try to find like, you know, some kind of simple way of showing that. So let's say here, for instance, you know, this does a lot of work for us. So we'll, you know, emphasize that a little bit more. Um, when we go mm, back here, I'm trying to pick out a red that's a little bit darker for us. You know, you want to try to push to see like, okay, how, and, and you want to try to, you know, observe a little bit more of the character here. So this, this actually isn't that round, this part of her shoulder, it's a little bit straighter actually. Um, and that's just like a quick calculation that you do as you're, as you're thinking, um, as you're looking at your model. And here again, we think of, okay, between these two points, this is pulling and it's really trying to get over here to this next major point. And then this is coming down. When you look at the arm, it's, you know, don't worry so much about this little, you know, wave right here. Think about how the arm, you know, is coming from the back and how 
you have to draw this in such a way that, again, even if you don't literally draw the loop all the way through, you sort of wind up for it. Like you, you can even just over the paper kind of ghost over this and then just, you know, strike, right? It's like, you know, if you have, let's say like a fish here, you know, in the sea and there's a seagull trying to eat it, the seagull doesn't just teleport here, you know, and eat the fish, right? It has to fly all the way in, make contact and fly all the way out, right? And we have to do the same thing. The arm doesn't just spawn out of nowhere, right? You have to think of like, you have to wind up for like, okay, where is it coming from? Where is it going? Even if you're only gonna touch down on the, on the paper in this part right here, you have to think of, okay, yes, but how would it lead here? And how would it lead into this? Now, like I said, in general, you're doing a really good job. Like the, there is a sort of, um, you know, a strong feeling of that movement in this. Um, and, but the thing is, it's, it's a matter of degrees, right? Like you, we could maximize that. We could squeeze a little bit more out of that. So even the way that like, you know, this comes in, if you look at her arm here, yes, there's a bump here, but it's not that prominent, right? And this bump, you know, doesn't take precedence over the fact that like this is flowing up you know, into the rest of the arm, right? And this thing is more important, that overall movement. And so, you know, you want to squint down and you want to think like, okay, actually it's more of this. And then once you've secured the biggest things that you want, then you can start thinking about, oh yeah, but actually there's like a little wiggle over here, right? There's like a little bit of like, okay, this that we can put in and, you know, now that you have a reference guide for that, then you can start to make all these smaller changes, right? But it's the kind of thing where you understand a lot of the fundamentals of, uh, of, of drawing here, right? Of visual communication. You just have to squeeze more out of them. You have to take each one and pursue it further, right? Here, again, the three-dimensional part is literally just using the tools that you have available, whether it's the outline or the tone or whatever, to show this, you know, that, you know, this arm has different sides. Again, if you squint down, you'll see that there is, you know, clearly at some point, there's going to be a change from the side to the front here, right? You can show it by doing this, you know, that divides that uh, divides up that space. You can show it by adding a tone. You could literally just do that, right? And that, you know, shows that difference there. Um, but that's basically what you're accountable for. Um, what another thing that you could do is you could, if you were making more sort of like, you know, uh, you know, more sort of like a, a complete representation here, you know, you could say, fill that in with a base tone. And then you could just say, okay, well here with the eraser, you know, and this is actually how it shows up in, you know, in, in this particular reference, you know, then you get, you know, the, um, the change, you know, the corner basically, you know, gets a, gets a highlight here. Um, again, over here, it's this big movement. And then all of this stuff coming off of it, like, you know, this right here, this is, this is secondary to that, right? But think of it like this, like you, it's like the way that you make a tic-tac-toe board, right? Like nobody does this. Like there's not a person alive that makes them like this, right? Because it doesn't really, it's not really that efficient. It's like, it's slow. It's, and it doesn't look as, you know, sort of, effective as when you do this, right? And so you end up with the same number of spaces and all that, right? But this implies less effort. It's four lines versus one, two, you know, five, 10, 12. So that's what we want to do here as well. You don't want to stop too much and get distracted by little things along the way, but you want to think of, okay, I am scanning for things up and down. I am scanning for things going across, right? That's the basis of, of, of all of it. And you don't, you don't stop when you're, if you're scanning for information like up and down, like let's say here for like the, you know, to like maximize like the, the movement of the neck here, we are just looking up and down. We're just thinking like, okay, how do we go? Okay, here, how do we really push like to, to get as much of the neck like actually turning as we see, you know, in, the, in, in our reference? And then for instance, like, Again, part of the natural aspect of it is integrating things. That's really what it is. Because when you look at, you know, real people, 
the parts don't stand out separately, right? So the neck, for instance, for instance, here, like this sternocleidomastoid, it's not going to be just like, you know, like a harsh cut like this, but it's going to be something that, you know, grows out of the rest of the neck. Like if you squint down, you can see that it travels over the entire cylinder of the neck and it's originating from back here. So you start to feel how, you know, this actually travels and has to wrap around and it stretches and then it ends, you know, right there. Same thing over here, right? You have this stretch and then it goes, and then it goes around, it integrates back in to the existing, um, you know, the existing structure of the neck. So a lot of it is tying stuff together, you know, getting the feeling that this is coming down. And then as you see here, right there, that it has to flow, that it has to integrate to root itself into, you know, the rest of the body, right? So even here for the clavicle, don't worry so much about all these little things. Worry about what is the big movement? How does the clavicle lead into this? How does it, you know, how does it move into, you know, this juncture here of the shoulder? How does this contribute to, you know, you know, this flow over here as well? The more you do that, the more you integrate this stuff, the less you sort of, you know, like um, um, stop yourself, the more, you know, sort of natural this stuff will feel. Because what will happen is you start to think of it again, it's sort of like the anatomy aspect, if we want to call it that, is less medicine and more physics, right? It's more like, what is the body doing, right? So here, let's say we, you know, we put this down, put like a little tone here for, you know, the, um, you know, the, this area for the sternum. You can see that, okay, this moves down and then the breast pulls off from that, right? And the entire mass of like the abdominals is pulling off of that as well, right? So you have, okay, like this coming down and then pulling out from there, right? And this whole area in general is pulling out. And it's, you know, or rather pushing outwards here. So this pulls and then this pushes out. Um, you want to try to relate that to the other side as well, right? We got the lengthwise movement. We might actually even follow that here. Try to get the movement here lengthwise a little bit more. Again, imagine like a rubber band that you're just stretching down to the next, to the next point you know, imagine how it would have to stretch to reach down here. And imagine as you keep working here, like, okay, how this would continue. And here it's just, you know, the, the, the fresh, the flesh is sort of like, you know, free, free standing in a sense. Right. But as soon as you get here, it gets pushed up against the chair, which is rigid. Right. And so here, this changes, right. The softness of the, or the general sort of, you know, softness and flexibility of the flesh makes it so that you know, it conforms to, you know, the form of, you know, this, that's the stool that's pushing up on it, right? It's boom, like that. And so basically, you, it, you know, again, getting quote unquote better at drawing in terms of like, again, representational drawing and that sort of thing is not a matter of adding more things. It's about milking the hell out of like every single thing that you put in. Like you have to be kind of stingy with your effort. Like you have to think of it like, okay, if I'm going to take the time to do this, I am going to get as much of this as I can. Like, you know, as you assess your drawing, think less in terms of like, what can I add to it? And more like, okay, with the stuff that I already have, what can I like, you know, what can I make this stuff do? You know, like, how, can, how do I get more out of this? And the other thing is just, again, assessing from a distance, right? Um, you know, that's something that's very, very helpful. You'll be able to catch things a little bit faster. Like, what makes you know, drawings and paintings, uh, I assume that, you know, in the, in the chat right now, we have a lot of like, you know, people that are, you know, that like Sargent and like, you know, Bouguereau and a lot of the kind of like the, you know, um, the kind of standard like pantheon of, of, of artists um, you know, that are representational. What makes those people, you know, uh, objects of like reverence is not so much like how much stuff they put in, but it's that everything hangs together really well, right? And if you look at a sergeant, it's much less work than like your average like atelier student puts in to, you know, um, you know, a figure drawing or whatever. Like a lot of these things are like that. They're very, very simple. But the, the cooking of the big elements, like that's done really, really well. So here, I'll show you all an example of that. Um, and this is something that, you know, I don't really get tired of showing people this. I think it's very, it's very useful. Um, 
this is these are some drawings uh, that won prizes at the uh, Col de Beaux Arts around the time that Sargent was a student. And you know, the a friend of mine actually went to the school. And she lives in Paris, and she took some pictures for me. Thank you, Lila. Um, these are free for download on my website. If you just go under resources, just RamonHurtado.com. Um, if you look at this drawing overall, it's very easy to be sort of like overwhelmed by this and just be like, oh, wow, this is like so detailed. It's so complex, you know, yada, yada, yada. But if you actually like, you know, look at it, it's, it's pretty big too. It's like 24, 24 by 18 more or less. So it's like 24 inches tall. So that, that's inches, not centimeters. So it's, um, you know, the actual size of the, the head is like, you know, maybe like not quite the size of my hand, but like about half of that. So again, when you look at it from far away, it looks like there's all this stuff in there. And when you start to get like up close on some of these things, you notice that, here, try to get to one of these feet. <laughs> like, look at that. This is the foot from that drawing. This is what it looks like, right? Now, okay, this literally won a prize, right? And okay, why is that? Like, what's so, what's so great about this? It's the way that all of this foot communicates the movement and it relates to the rest of the leg. That's what's actually important, right? And you know, it's it's very clearly expressing the feeling of like the weight pushing down on the on the um, on the ground, right? That's what's actually like most important about it. Notice how you know for these areas how little contrast there needs to be. Like you actually don't have to do that much, but you will find that if you step back. There's, you know, you can tell there's enough separation for it to, you know, the drawing to look, you know, like a like a real person. Also, look at this. Look at how carefully he weaves the figure together, where you can see the flow from here into here into here into here all the way through. No one element in the drawing distracts from that big overall movement. Look at how everything that's here works together to produce that compression on the on the torso, and how that leads right into this. This is what we were just talking about in your in your drawing right now, right? How these don't feel like little like shapes or like lines or whatever, but they feel like, you know, actual units of like, you know, like tissue that are pulling and that are, you know, this one doesn't just feel like it it just here and that's it. It feels like it disappears behind something that comes in front of it. Notice how like the stretch, you know, going from the throat into the into the tor into the um the chin. You know, so those are the things that, you know, we want to look out for. Uh, you know, if you look at like the, I mean, even like the chin here and like the head, it's not really that elaborate, even for the hair, you know, it's, um, it's the, or, or here, look at this foot, <laughs> look at this other one, you know, it's like when you see the overall thing, you know, it looks very like naturalistic and it is, but it's a very low resolution version. Like this is basically that thing we were just talking about with like the main sort of, you know, um, the core of the leg that's important. That's basically most of what this is. This guy doesn't have like, doesn't really have toes, you know, I mean, you know, he has a heel that kind of has to be there, but you'll notice that it's basically like, you know, one plane, two planes, three planes, right? It's like the, the most basic, simple kind of expression of that. And that doesn't really go away. Like, it doesn't matter how advanced you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been working or whatever. You always basically go back to like these these basic ideas are, you know, your sort of, uh, you know, your traveling companions that you're going to be, you know, with for as long as you have a career. And so, again, looking at something like this, this is a prize winning drawing by uh, Henrique Pusal. You know, you, you look at this and obviously overall, like, you know, it's, it's a beautiful drawing, you know, there's really great integration of all the parts and, you know, the feeling of movement is fantastic. Like every part looks different. Every part is carefully characterized. But again, when you get into the, you know, the individual parts, like this, you know, fawn barely has an eye, right? It has an eyeball, but it doesn't really have like eyelids over here. There's barely one here. Um, you know, the little hair and all that, it's just a, you know, a very simple kind of elaboration of that. Even this, like this headband is mainly, you know, it, the main part that's expressed about it is how it wraps around the head and the largest sort of um, planes there. So again, you look at the fingers and stuff like that, or even like these little details, there isn't really a lot there. Like the most important part of this torso is how this is, you know, moving, like the tilt of it. 
um, you know, this big simple plane going in, you know, here the front versus the side, uh, and how these parts fit in together. Like that's you know really what you're what you're striving for. Uh, Ramon, mm -hmm. you mentioned shapes, and I think it goes back to a question that somebody asked. You. Mm -hmm. So, what are the benefits of studying anatomy for someone who has studied the figure purely from observation and optical study rather than conceptual anatomy? What is a good way to start learning anatomy? Um, okay, a good way to start learning. In a sense, like studying the figure optically isn't really studying the figure. You have been right. studying the optical field. You know, you've been studying like how light presents itself, you know, uh, to your eyes. Like, w again, uh, think of it this way. Imagine that you give someone a text in a language that they don't speak. Like, imagine you give me a text in like Georgian or something, right? Like if I, I if I sit there for long enough, like I could copy like one of like the characters, or if I measure and I you know check my lines and I plumb them, whatever, I can you know anyone you know can replicate like a sentence or a page of a book or whatever. I can do that for like a hundred years. It doesn't mean I've learned anything about the Georgian language. It doesn't mean that I would be able to speak it. it. Doesn't mean that I'd be able to formulate a different sentence. And no, no matter how much I do it, I wouldn't know what what it says, right? Whereas somebody can, and, and so the reason for that is even if, if, if we, you wrote it in such a way that a native speaker could read it, right? Again, for you, you're, not, you're actually just studying the coordinates of those lines right there. Like you're not actually studying the language, right? And so in terms of the figure, it's the same thing where if you learn the kind of principles that the figure is built on, then you're actually studying the, the, the figure, right? So it's more about construction and building than it is about anatomy, although basically construction, like the way the figure is built is anatomy. I mean, that's what anatomy is. It's how the figure is put together. Um, what I would start to do is like, basically look at, um, don't be satisfied in just producing drawings that like, quote unquote, like look good to you, like actively fight that, right? Like make drawings that not for the sake of making them messy or whatever, but like your the goal is for you to understand why what you're looking at is there. Right. So what you're doing is you're mining these things for information. So the easiest way, I think, to, to get started with this is let's say that you have, you know, something like this, um, this, uh, this Pusao cast drawing. And sorry for anyone who speaks Portuguese in the chat. I know I am butchering that. Uh, you know, let's say this drawing here you don't just sort of, just because you can see something doesn't mean that like, you, you basically pace yourself and don't put something in until you understand why it's there, right? Like you just have to go one step further and ask like, wait, why is that? And if you don't know, find out, right? So for instance, like the basics of building things in 3D, right? And just sort of like, you know, the drawing in terms of you know, drawing as a reflection of like a kind of physical world, which is what drawing has been, you know, for most of its history, right? Like drawing just based on shapes, on flat shapes is a, is a fairly new uh, thing. Shapes can be an auxiliary thing. Like you can check the negative space of this. That's, that's useful, right? But shapes are not the primary driver of drawing generally. They haven't been for most of its history. So what you're looking for is basically stuff like this. You're looking for the outer limits of a form, okay? Like regardless of what the form is. If the form is symmetrical, like a torso, then you're looking for a center line. You are also looking for a corner, right? Because if the form is three-dimensional, there is a certain point where, you know, you, it, it, you cannot map it out by just putting in the front. Like there's a certain point where it's gonna turn and it has to be like the side or something, right? So basically that like giving yourself like the fronts and the sides of stuff right it will also likely have a top and a bottom right you might not always see those but this is the stuff that you'll see very clearly if you're building something symmetrical again ask more from it right so if it's symmetrical then you know if you have like say a nipple here then you can relate it to the other one if there's a hip here and it's a certain distance from the center line you can relate it to the other one it's like a it's like a teeter-totter right so that's basically what it is. It's like you are taking the visual experience and you are extracting information from it. Information that helps you to draw this drawing, but information that also helps you for every single drawing that you're going to make ever in your life because you're learning about how things are built and specifically recurring patterns in the human figure. Um, the argument against that is that, oh, won't that make my figure formulaic? No, because, you know, 
everybody knows, everybody understands that every single person is different, right? And it doesn't mean that like, but you also understand at the same time that people have things in common. Like if I see a person that I've never met before, every part of them is different than every other person that I've met previously, right? Like their hair is different, their eyelashes are different, their nose is different, their shoulders are different. It doesn't mean that I look at them and I'm like, is, is, this, a, is this a giraffe? Is this a crab? Like, no, <laughs> there's like basic certain things that you're like, oh, this is like, you know, this fits within the category human, you know, these are the sort of common features that you kind of, the standard things that you have in your head. And so that is basically the case with, uh, with this is like, you can extract these basic principles, you know, for instance, like if you, um, let's see, um, let's say that, you know, you understand that like most people will have two ears, <laughs> right? The knowledge that most people will generally have two ears doesn't mean that if you see a person with one ear, you're like, I don't know how to draw them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the constructive diagrams of your conceptual knowledge is a map. It doesn't mean the map is to guide you in your travels. It doesn't mean that you have to follow it exactly. It's just a set of guidelines and suggestions and things to look for. So when you're drawing the figure, you know, what you're doing is, okay, like you might even look for like, um, this is like how a typical 19th century drawing starts, is you look for the balance, right? You drop a plumb line from the, um, from the pit of the neck usually, because that tends to be, you know, the sort of um, center of the figure, it tends to be one of the more stable parts. And, you know, from there, like you might like measure out the number of heads just so that you can, you know, you're still going to eyeball within those measurements, but it's to kind of like, you know, limit your options so that you're within the ballpark of what you want. As far as the actual like structural part of it is concerned, you're looking for, again, large patterns. So like, you know, from shoulder to shoulder, like what is, you know, what's the swing of these, right? What is, you know, the center line doing through here? And what you do is, again, just because you know there's a center line doesn't mean you draw it the same way every time. You customize it to the subject that you happen to be drawing. You might look here and say, okay, what are the hips doing? Okay, the hips are here, right? The center line goes right to the crotch. That's the end of the torso right there. Okay, you might even connect this, right? You might even think like, okay, if you imagine like really big underwear, right? That's what, you know, that sort of connection looks like. Um, here, okay, we're looking for the limits of that form. So maybe you try to connect from the acromion to you know, the um, actual hips, right? Uh, again, you start to look for things like, oh, okay, like the, you know, the overall like leg, let's say, well, the overall leg is fairly cylindrical, right? That's a pattern that's gonna recur. After you've established the kind of big form of these things, then you can start dividing. Like instead of just one leg, you might say like, okay, well now I want to divide it into like the upper leg versus the knee versus the lower leg. Okay, that's fine. You start looking for, um, well, actually, even before that, uh, you know, you would think of the leg as a three-dimensional construct. So you think, okay, well, it's going to have sides, right? So maybe like from here, this is the front, or this is the side, this is the front. So you look for markers, any kind of evidence that shows you that something is changing direction, right? Having, and you know, this, that would be the case here too, right? We have this, we try to go for the long movement of that leg, right? We try to get the position of that heel relative to this one, this one relative to this one. At a certain point, again, you ask yourself, like, is there any evidence that this is like changing directions? Well, here there is, right? You have this at the knee, there's a break. You have one plane facing down, one plane facing up, right? And then you have the planes here on the side, right? So you can show that with tone. You can show that with little linear indications. It doesn't matter how you show it, right? But it matters that you think about it. As you progress through that, then, you know, you can start to think of things like, okay, well, by that point, your figure is three-dimensional. It, it's, it might be like a very low polygon kind of three-dimensional. Like it might look like Gumby, but Gumby is three-dimensional, right? So like, even if you literally had like, you know, something that's like, you know, if it has corners, it is 3D, right? It might not be the exact figure that you want yet, but it will be three-dimensional, right? And especially if you start adding all this stuff on here too. So what you do is, again, you think of it as like a very rudimentary sculpture. Then you can come in and divide and you can think, okay, well, this wraps around in a round way going this way like this. The more you look for big patterns, the more you're going to find things that are sort of like common to, you know, all, all subjects within a certain category, in this case, like the human figure, right? And so what will happen is, you know, you start to be able to... Um, 
you know the parts that you're looking for. And the only question becomes like, how do they express themselves in this one specific person, right? Because it'll always be different. But you know sort of like the list of things that you're that you're looking for, right? Um, it's like if you go to a restaurant, right? A restaurant that you've never been to before. You know there are going to be, there's going to be something to sit on. There's going to be a table or something to eat on. You know that someone will bring you your food and you know you have to pay for it at some point, right? Those are the common elements of like <laughs> dining at a restaurant, right? So it's things like that that you're looking for in terms of the, in terms of the figure. Um, same thing here. You know, you just, again, you, it's not that you don't build something out of all the small parts. You build the thing and then you carve the small parts out of it, right? Like here, you know, just even thinking of like, okay, where does this turn? You know, where's the, if you squint down, you can see there's a little, you know, a um, uh, little tone change right there. Technically, there would be a side here, but you don't see it as clearly. Let's say we have something like that. You know, here we have this dipping in. And we have the obliques, which are fairly sort of cylindrical, you know, at least, in a, you know, more or less sort of like, uh, oops, let's do that. More or less like that, right? Fitting into this in here and fitting into this on the other side. Again, both obliques don't look the same because they're flexible, right? So depending on what the figure is doing is, you know, the form that a particular oblique will take. But the more you think of it this way, the better off you'll be. Um, if you want a, a, a simple guide to thinking in terms of, you know, um, you know, three dimensions and actually trying to like extract more information out of the drawings that you make, then check this book out. It's completely free. I'm going to put it in the chat right now. This is, uh, Edward Lanteri's, um, let's see, Edward Lanteri's book. Um, let's see. Oh, the question is, how would I ge differentiate gesture and rhythm? Um, I wouldn't. Um, I think those are the same thing. Um, in the end, like the, the exact sort of like nomenclature and all that is not that important. It's, um, it's more sort of like, you know, what's the big idea? Like if you're looking for movement generally, regardless of what you call it, if you're looking for it in, you know, the, the biggest movement that you can find and the smallest movements nested into that big movement, you're golden. So this is the book that I would look at. Um, what's cool about this is that if you're primarily like drawing or painting, this is great for you because it's sculpture and seeing the same ideas in a different medium is good because it takes away all of the little technique tricks and all, of, all that stuff that you might be thinking about. And it gives you just the kind of raw information or you get to see the information that's common to any discipline that deals with the figure. This book is entirely free. It's in plain English and it, it has like just a ton of info. But basically what you're trying to look for is, again, you, the whole question of the shapes thing is like you should, if you're trying to really learn about the figure, you should never be content to just look at something and be like, okay, that's it. You, again, ask yourself why that is. Why is the figure balanced? How is it balanced, right? Um, this book basically goes through, you know, just concepts of like figure building because it's sculpture so they're literally building it with drawing and painting representationally we have to pretend that we're building it the more you can convince your brain that you're literally making an actual person the better off you'll be don't focus on the specifics of making an armature or the technique of sculpture that doesn't matter to you basically think of you know th ideas that he talks about like linking parts you know and especially you know you might even save a little bit of this for later look at this. This is what you want to think about. Like people think that when they do a line drawing or a blocking or whatever, that they're, oh, I'm just thinking in terms of line. That is nonsense. Like the lines are representing something. And what you're representing is usually a three-dimensional, you know, fully three-dimensional structure. Right. And so this is probably the best representation I've seen of that, where it's like, because sometimes people think that like to make something 3D, you have to make it complicated. You don't. Like this, this is super simple and it's already as 3D as it's going to get. If you add more detail, it won't be more 3D. It like 3D, it's either 3D or it's not, right? <laughs> and so, and again, that's supplied basically by just having, you know, different, uh, you know, top, front, sides, et cetera. You'll notice how much is sacrificed just to get the movement. Like everything is just made so that everything works together. Like look at the flow from like one arm to the other one or from the, you know, from the side of the head into the torso, into the standing leg, out through the foot, 
you know, the, this foot actually just looks like the prosthetic leg that we were looking at before, or the, the, that idea, right? And you can see how much more important that is here than even the heel. Um, and so again, you're looking for these like large common patterns, right? The center line. It, people after they start, like they, they've been working for a little bit, they think that, oh, I don't need to put in the center line. I mean, that's wild. Like, <laughs> you know, if, if someone wants to make their life harder for no reason, they can, but like, there's no reason to, you know, to, to dispense with that. Uh, part of being a professional is not that you avoid a bunch of like the necessary work or, or that you refuse help, but that you know when to use things and then you just get over and you just do it. You know, I remember when I was younger, I, I had as my goal as a student to not to be able to paint without doing an underdrawing and to not need rulers. And that is such a dumb goal to have because that has like they, they don't hand out prizes for doing your work in the most difficult way possible. Right. <laughs> You know, the important thing is that the work gets done, that you express the idea that you want to express. Hello, How you get there doesn't really matter, you know? And so in any case, ideally how you get there is the most fun way that you can, because that'll they'll keep you actually working. But notice how like into all of that, like sort of simple, um, you know, low polygon, let's say pass of the figure, then you start to like nest all of this information uh, on. Um, Basically, again, if you want to think of the figure in a way that reflects its three-dimensional nature and then you actually like really think through, then think of it as much like sculpture as possible. Another thing that you can do that I found very, very helpful is to actually make a simple model of the, um, of the human figure. And I've been getting like all my students to do this. Um, let's see. So you can use like a kneaded eraser or like clay or whatever. It should not be a complicated model, but um, let me see if I can spotlight myself. Okay, uh, can everybody see this? Should we be able to see like a little, little tiny uh, kneaded eraser person? Um, the basic idea with this is that you start to understand that even when it's simple, right? Everything is already 3D. So like if you if you make this, and all you have to do is like make like a little like a, like a little cylinder and then split it in half, half is the crotch. You cut it with a razor blade or something, and then now you have two legs, right? And then you just make another little cylinder and then you make that for the arms. The arms, you have to link them together as one piece, like one single thing. Every time, if you can, instead of doing two things, if you can do one, do that. <laughs> like try to simplify everything. Try to be as lazy as you can in that way, right? But in any case, having something like this, again, we said the crotch is half, if you take this lower half and you split that in half, that's the knees. If you take the upper half and split that in half, that's the chest, the bottom of the chest, uh, right or well, right around the nipple area, let's say. Um, you put the arms like right around like on top of that, and that should give you like a general shoulder. It, this is as accurate as it needs to be. It doesn't have to be like anything crazy. But what you can do is if you're drawing from a model or you're drawing from you know reference or whatever, especially if you're drawing from reference, Use this and get it into the pose of your model so that you can understand like, because sometimes if you look at someone like foreshortened, you look at something like this or something where like you just barely see like this or whatever, it, the, the temptation is there to just make it a shape. If you get to actually see, you know, like how it's three dimensional and how just because you can't see it, that part doesn't go away. It starts to really make it sink in, right? And the thing is that also for drawing from imagination, you know, basically having a little base model like this and making it like interact with stuff right so like making it like actually like you know grab onto things like let's say this is gonna like you know throw this uh you know this uh this piece of you know this whatever this barrel like that right it helps you to understand like you know the movement of the body the interactions it helps you to understand like you know like twisting you know and that kind of thing and you know because the proportions of it actually are generally, you know, close to what an actual human would be, then it's something that, you know, you can, you can, when you're drawing, you can embellish it to turn it into a, a real character. Um, but, you know, the, the base is already there. Like in terms of drawing from imagination, there's not that many people that like completely draw out of their head and people that do, it's like, you don't expect to get like a super realistic drawing out of that. Um, you know, it's, pretty much like it's pretty rare that you get like a fully naturalistic figure that someone just made up out of nothing. You can have very believable figures that people make up, but they're 
usually it's not the same as like actually, you know, having a model. Most of the time, historically, almost everybody uses reference. Um, even like the 19th century people that made those like, you know, crazy scenes and all that, a lot of them, you know, you would draw out of your head from the, in the beginning, right? To make these like little noodle people and plan the kind of, uh, you know, the, the scene that you want. Um, a lot of them would use little maquettes. So like literally just using like little, like, you know, little people like this. Some actually made little clothes for them and stuff. So you can make them a little bit bigger. You can take one of these things and you can, you know, put a, like set a stage for them. You can put a light on them. Um, that's all, you know, very, very useful. It starts to, even if you just make this a little roll, it'll already have planes. Like it'll already have a front and a side, right? So I think the more you can think of it in 3D, the more you can devise strategies to solve problems and the less rigid you are, the better off you'll be, right? So that's, that's how I would approach that. Like if you ever find yourself feeling like you are creating something out of small parts, stop. Because again, the, the main feeling you should have as you're working in terms of like purely practical terms is that you have already built something and you're dividing it. Uh, and that makes it, you know, that much easier because it puts the priorities in, in an order that is much more um, manageable. So in any case, um, here, we'll go ahead and uh, I'm just going to close this out. Um, yeah. So anyway, to, to, to sum up here, um, Aria, again, just you sort of tend you know, think a little bit bigger and think more in terms of like, again, physical terms, like, you know, it, to get the figure again, more natural, more three dimensional. Think of like how the person is sitting, like how gravity like pulls on, you know, the, the various like tissues of the body, like, you know, how one part like pushes against another part, right? Um, you know, look for like the largest patterns of, you know, of the, of the movement and don't be afraid to put in the form, like the different planes in the most obvious way possible, right? So here, let's go ahead and save this. And um, actually, one, one example that I wanted to pull up that might be useful is this is, um, here's a painting uh, done at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts by um, this guy, uh, Daniel Bouveret, who was a, uh, a student of Jerome, probably one of like, I mean, in terms of like, you know, this kind of thing, one of the best students that he ever had. Um, and this one of the same model from the same year, although from a different uh, session, uh, by his friend Julian Alden Weir, who was also friends with Sargent. Um, these are great because they provide a really good sort of like side-by-side -side comparison. Again, it's like a comparable pose of the same model, same year, by two people who knew each other and had the same teacher, right? So the things that you can, you know, see with these two is that, you know, both of them, the proportions, you know, they look believable. I mean, it's, it's not like we were there, so we can't like, you know, verify that, but the guy looks like a guy, right? Um, you know, they both express the largest movement. They're both balanced. You know, neither one feels like the person is like falling over. You know, the proportions, the relative sizes of everything, you know, look good. Um, you know, it's, they're both like very well characterized. Like you can tell that it's the same person, et cetera. The forms aren't just round for the sake of being round. However, you know, and they, they both feel three-dimensional, right? But the thing is, the, 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 the weir is you know, not as far along as the Danyan is, and that's not a style difference. It's actually a, a valuable sort of like process thing that we can, not even a process thing, but a, a sort of a thinking thing that we can look at. So if we zoom in on almost any one of these parts, it's almost like a tutorial in painting. You can see, and not even painting, but in structural thinking, if you look at these two feet, it's the same guy's foot. It's almost from the same angle. The lighting is different, but by and large, it's the same, you know, the, as close as we're going to get, right? Look at how this one is thought of. It's thought of in like, okay, here's one plane, two planes, three planes. This plane is in shadow. This one is in half tone. This one's fully in the, in the light, right? One, two, three. It's like it's carved out of wood, right? This one, on the other hand, also feels three-dimensional, but instead of just moving this way, just kind of hacking it in, you know, along the, the long direction, this has movement across. So it makes it feel, you know, not just 3D, but also like it's like flesh, like flesh woven together, right? So basically what you find is that most of these people, Danyan included, would start like this. They would put in the form, they would hack it out in the most obvious way possible. And then they would start to, you know, 
add like sort of further things like, you know, the texture of the skin or like the smaller movements or smaller forms. If you look at these knees here, for instance, like these two right there, again, this basically has a front, it has a side, it has a front again, it has a side again. It's expressed in like the simplest, most sort of basic way. Um, this one has those same qualities, but it's carried a little bit further. But to get this, you have to do this, or at least that's the easiest way to get this is to do that. And the way of doing it the most consistently, generally. Again, we're same thing, you know, just boom, one plane, two planes, you know, front, side, front, side. You get the same thing here, but he gets the extra pull going across. So it's not just up and down, but it's also side to side. They're both equally three-dimensional, but this one is three-dimensional and flexible, right? They, they both have the overall movement, right? But this one has the movement across as well, not just along the length. And that's why this one feels a little bit more stiff because the movement is more kind of straight. There isn't a lot of the kind of lateral wrapping movement that you would find in this one. Now, granted, the poses are different, but regardless of what happens, the arm is built and most of the body is built in a way that is spiraling, right? One interesting thing here, though, is that you do start to see him actually put in a little bit of that movement across. So he was working on it, right? And again, these are paintings by students, right? These are not like master paintings or masterpieces or whatever. Now, these are exercises. That's all they are. There is no point in fetishizing these things. They can be, you know, very useful. They can be beautiful, uh, you know, in, in themselves, but they are tools. When you look at artwork and when you're trying to, you know, analyze it for a given purpose, do not fall into the trap of just like, you know, uh, just uh, sort of like idolizing this stuff or just, you know, kind of putting it on some kind of, um, uh, some kind of pedestal, right? Like see it as like the practical application of a certain body of knowledge. That's really what we're, what we're trying to, to get out of these. These are the kind of things people would like chop these up, you know, people would like throw them out, you know, cause they were doing one of these a week. So it's like, that's also the kind of thing that's useful. It's like, I don't think you should have like, you know, just really, at least I don't really work that well with like really rigid limits, like in terms of time and stuff like that. But, um, it is useful at a certain point to give yourself almost enough work to do so that you don't overthink each thing. So again, you should have some very clear things that you think about, and then you should just start working. Like you don't want to like, you know, second guess yourself that much with everything because part of it then becomes repetition. Uh, this is another one of their friends. Notice like very simple There's one, two, three planes. It actually starts with just two is what Devin was saying, like setting up the, you know, basically those two planes, those two values. This is more important than adding the third one. And th this is more important than, you know, integrating further like this. Um, no matter how. I was just saying so cool how like the, it starts as a box with two mm -hmm. obvious planes and yeah. then he doubles it at the forearm with three and then he yeah. doubles it again at the bicep and you get a full cylinder and it's like you can see the whole process like going up the arm oh yeah it's it's great and the thing is that you know it's like it's like a custom box it's like a custom cylinder like sometimes people get too stuck on that like i see people that are drawing like straight up like legitimately like 90 degree corner boxes and that's not like really the point, you know what I mean? The point is to have the two planes, to have a front and a side, right? right. And what happens is that people find comfort in that. They're like, I'm, I'm doing it right. This is what I'm supposed to do. Like Glenn Vilpu, who I studied with for a long time, who, you know, is, is, is a phenomenal teacher, right? And I was lucky to be able to study with him, like basically when I was 18 until all the way through college. Um, you know, it was funny because at some point, obviously people know him online. It's like, oh yeah, like the boxes, the gesture, whatever. And people don't really think of him like doing like measuring or like, you know, checking angles and stuff. I've seen him do that. He were, we were doing a long drawing once and he was like checking verticals and horizontals because it, it's like what he says, they're just tools, you know, no rules, just, just tools. Right. But um, it was funny because at some point he said, no one wants to see your boxes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, he's right. <laughs> like, it's, it's funny. It's like, the the boxes is so that you kind of get the certain idea. Yeah, it's you not can, become the box guy or like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and like again, that idea of thinking of the different sides of something is extremely useful. It's just that like you don't want to get too stuck on that, you know. Because sometimes I get questions that people are like, okay, but like, what exactly is the box? Like, which part of it is like, you know, is it the is it the semi membranosus? Is it this? Is it that? It's like it is not that deep. Like, it really isn't. Like, you know what I mean? 
it's like it's just a simple kind of model to get you to prioritize like the box is a suggestion of like how to get to something right um it's kind of like you know if you have a map of like the metro lines in your city <laughs> it doesn't mean that you have to follow every road on the map it just means that those are your options <laughs> you know what i mean it just means that like as, as long as you get to where you're going you're fine um also funny enough with these um you know there's a uh, Here's another uh, Danyan. Let's see where to go. Oh, yeah, this guy right here. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they would actually cut these to ship them to the United States because of like some weird censorship thing. You're kind of like Instagram, I guess. Uh, they should have just put a picture of a cat over, uh, over the crotch like I do. But uh, again, even looking at these, like this dude looks like, you know, an anime character. Like it's not like super naturalistic, like this like crazy thing. And this was, and, and the goal clearly was to make it naturalistic, right? So this is not like, you know, this case where like people were always like crushing it because this painting was actually done after this one. It was done the next year. So the same guy that did this, you know, during like, I don't know, maybe he was having an off week, you know, it's like, he was like, oh, well, whatever, this, this is what we got. And, you know, but the thing is that it's good enough for what it's trying to accomplish. Like the big building of it is pretty reasonable, you know? You can feel that things are aligned along the center for the most part. This is a little bit, you know, sort of wobbly right here compared to like, you know, these axes aren't parallel, but at the wrong angle. Yeah, but it's like, you know, it's good enough. Like, and you can see him doing the same thing where he's like, you know, again, putting in these like big blocks and then integrating them by hatching across. Um, here's another one by someone else in the room, you know, that was clearly like, you know, um, a student that was newer probably than, than, than Danyan. And so the thing is that a lot of this stuff, like we only really get to see very often, like the best things, the best examples of like what people made back then. But it's not really like that. I mean, like people were making like one of these a week and sometimes for the drawings, they were in like several classes. So it's like, if you can find 10 academic drawings by one person, you are just scratching the surface because they were, if they were doing two or three a week over the course of several years, you know, there's a, there's a ton that's, uh, that's there. But anyway, go back to here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bianca uh, Vincianu. Okay. All right, Bianca, let's take a look. And let's see. So, Bianca, uh, prove in any way and form possible. What do I need to focus on more? Anatomy, shape language, line art. Let's tell you anything faster, make it fun at the same time. Okay. So, basically, the way to make the anatomy aspect or like the structure aspect fun, Bianca, is to make it a game. Like challenge yourself to see how many things you can connect. Challenge yourself to see like, you know, how many things you can group in the, in the body without having to like, you know, draw like every sort of separate like muscle or whatever. Um, in terms of like improve, we have to be more specific than that because improve doesn't mean anything. Like improvement, you know, is basically a shorthand for saying getting closer to your goal. So to, to get closer to your goal, you have to define what your goal is. So, you know, that is, it, it's an extremely important set of questions to ask yourself because there is no right or wrong way to do this. All that, there, all that there is, is things that get you closer to what you want and things that get you further away from what you want, right? So you have to ask yourself, like, are you doing this because you want to make naturalistic figures? Do you want to be able to produce like faster sketches uh, for, you know, entertainment or something like that? Um, you know, do you want to be a storyboarder? Like all of those disciplines have slightly different requirements. The basics are the same, but the emphasis on each one is a little bit different. So if you want to, you know, figure out a plan for yourself, then you have to sit with yourself and ask those questions in terms of like what you want. And there's no real wrong answer for that. Once you do that, then you can have a strategy, but without that, there's nothing. Um, so what I would say is here, I'm just going to go off of the assumption of like, just looking at the work itself, you know, it looks like you want to have like, you know, a, at least to a large degree, like a, a fairly, you know, naturalistic, um, you know, understanding of the, of, of the figure. Right. And so that's something that, that we can talk about, but again, that's something worth considering too, even when you're like choosing classes to take and stuff like that, like no one can tell you what to do unless they know like no one can help you unless you know what you're trying to do, right? It's like if someone stops to ask me directions but they don't know where they're going, well, I can't tell them anything. You know, it's like I can't say go this way or go that way because 
that's incomprehensible at that point, right? And so, okay, let me just refer back to question here. Okay, what do you need to focus on more? Again, what you need to focus on more, only you can really answer that. Um, but in terms of the uh, in terms of the work that's here, um, you know, one thing that I would say is similar to what other folks have been, um, you know, uh, the we what we've been talking about is you want to not just put the stuff in to put it in, but you want it to mean more. Like for instance, um, with this figure here. No, where'd that one go? Oh, it's over here. Um, you know, if you're going to put this in, this little marker right here, well, you have to ask yourself, like, what the purpose of it is, right? Like, for this right there. Um, very likely, you know, and actually, this might be in the, this might be in the references. Oh, no? Okay, that's fine. Very likely, what was happening here is, okay, you have a leg that is projecting towards you, right? That leg is, you know, you can think of it as a cylinder, you can think of it as a box, you can think of it as either one in different scenarios. Um, in the end, a leg is a leg, you know what I mean? A leg is not a cylinder or a box, but a cylinder and a box, it, you know, the leg can be similar enough that those, those things are helpful to kind of get us, uh, get us going. So, okay, we have this. You know, the, the thing that I would say is that, like, you really want to feel, again, more purpose here. Like, imagine that this is not just a line sitting here, but imagine something pulling off of this. It's pulling here. You're pulling the toe out of this, the small toes, the little toes, you're pulling them out of this larger structure, right? That, um, and here we got to line these up a little more, but, you know, you feel the, feel the tension that's there. Feel how this is leading into this and the, the, the heel has to pull out of that, right? In fact, um, here, this is, um, um, let me unshare the screen. Also, Aria, just saw your message. You, you were very welcome. Um, here, if you... This is something that I started doing recently, but what I'm finding is that no matter, um, you know, no matter like how well I try to explain something with like words or drawings in, ter in terms of like the structural stuff, nothing is as effective as literally making it in 3D. Like it is just visceral. You just get it. It's like it's like if if we sat here and I explained to you why it's a bad idea to put your hand on a hot stove, but if you just by accident happen to touch the hot stove, there's no more explanation needed. You just you just get it, right? Um, and actually, I saw something in the chat here that was interesting. Uh, question: you're Just talking about three. Think three. Okay. Do you think there's any value in copying the figure naturalistically just by shape? So that's not naturalistically. That is optically. Uh, because you can achieve naturalism while thinking in 3D, just like, I mean, that's what sculptors do, naturalistic uh, sculptors. Um, and talking about the impressionist way of seeing, which is basically just flat shapes, uh, drawing without prejudice, uh, assuming the shape is correct enough, the form will be, uh, will be there. Uh, many start with copying barred plates and then place the approach, um, approach subject, 3D subject in a similar way. Uh, let's see, my thoughts on that. Again, the, the idea is that if you get the shapes right or close enough, then the form is supplied by that. Again, literally, it's like trying to learn, uh, trying to learn writing or learn a language by copying the actual like, you know, like a sentence without studying what the language is like. Oh, yeah, I mean, it'll the words will have meaning, because someone else thought of the meaning, right? Like, if you write like, again, like my name in like, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know, like the in, in like ancient Sumerian or something. <laughs> like, if I copy that, if I copy line by line, the meaning will be preserved. Someone who speaks that will be able to read it, but the meaning is not accessible to me, right? Like I am left out of that. And that is the case with that as well. And so I don't think it's a particularly useful way of, or it's a very limited way of studying, right? And so, because again, what you're studying is not the figure. It's not landscape. It's not any of that. In that scenario, you're studying basically light, and the actions of light and like the patterns that it creates and that kind of thing. Um, if that's what you want to do, then, you know, it's useful enough, but um, you know, for again, very limited applications, but the second that something moves, the second that you want something more complex, you know, all of that starts to break down. The other thing is like that is very inefficient. So it takes longer and longer and longer to do that. 
Um, again, imagine how quickly you can write something if you know the language versus if you had to copy line by line, checking and rechecking each thing. Um, it's grossly inefficient, right? It takes a really long time. If your model, let's say, if let's say that like in some ateliers, they spend like, I think sometimes up to like a month drawing one model. In what way is your model the same? Like from here to one month, you know, you can like gain weight, lose weight, like your hair can be different. You know, the earth is rotating, <laughs> you know, it's like every, every person who's sitting in the room is, you know, gaining and losing electrons. Like, so what accuracy, you know, what, like, uh, what, what, uh, what fixed model are you objectively copying? There is none because the longer you take, the more things change even. Right. So I don't think that theory really bears out in the end. And that's sort of what I think about it. The other thing is that the way that people approach the barred plates is again, copying it as if they were just lines there. But that's not even how Bard drew himself. Like if you look at his actual drawings, they are approached from this three-dimensional standpoint because there are things that he's drawing that you're like, wait, that's not there. Like he draws center lines. You're never going to see a center line on like, well, maybe like in the abs or something or in the back. But you see center lines in like the head, you know, like in the, in the, 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 the last plates that he does, the ones from the figure. So it's the kind of thing where it's like, it's a misunderstanding of, you know, like the barred plates. The, the way that people copy them and that sort of thing. Um, one thing that's useful, by the way, if you're curious about that, is look at, um, <laughs> so I was asking if I think it's efficient to take five weeks to do a figure painting. Uh, no, because I have never seen an atelier figure painting today that is, you know, more effective at creating a naturalistic representation of a person than that Danyan that we just saw. And that Danyan took 28 hours spread over four days, I think it was seven hours a day. Maybe it was a week over four hours every day, something like that. So no, because they were getting results that were more effective than what people are doing now. And it was faster. So clearly there is no point in spending that long. It's not like these people were just better than us or smarter or whatever. They just had more intelligent ways of approaching things. That's you know the big, the big thing there. But um, going back to, um, you know, and the thing is, again, you if you're interested in that stuff and you're interested in like, you know, very sort of complete representations of the figure and that kind of thing, um, try to actually either, well, actually, <laughs> just go to my website. Like there's uh, a bunch of like examples that are uh, categorized by, uh, I made a database and also I have like free downloads there. They're categorized by studio, by teacher. They mainly look the same, honestly. But um Part of the problem is that people try to figure this stuff out by looking at tiny images online of what something looks like instead of actually like seeing the things in person. Like the experience of seeing an academic drawing in person, frankly, when you look at it, you're like, wait, that's it? That's all they did? That's all they felt like they needed to do? That's crazy. And so you need to do that to snap yourself out of that idea that like, oh, these people made everything perfect and they knew so much more than we do and whatever. That's like literally not the case like most of the time. So, um, uh, let's see, uh, Rafael says, I've been thinking and wondering if a line is nothing but a place in tangent with the camera. Eh, not, no, not really. I mean, like a line is not one specific thing. A line is a symbol that can communicate a lot of things. So a line can communicate the like border between two tones. It can communicate the border at the end of a form. It can communicate a horizon. It can be purely diagrammatic. It can communicate a rhythm. It can communicate like a shadow or whatever. If you use several lines together, it can communicate a tone. So lines can communicate pretty much anything. Um, so that can be one application, but that's not the whole thing. Um, so let's say you have, you know, just this like this, you know, crappy little like, um, you know, uh, quick sculpt that I uh, uh, made here. You don't want to think of adding the heel as like a thing that you stick on like that because you, you notice that it looks disjointed that way. Think of it more like when you're drawing, you're pulling it out of here. You're pulling the heel out of that big rhythm. And for the small toes, the little toes, same thing. Imagine that you're pulling them out of, you know, the overall foot, right? So if you see, if we do that, it actually doesn't look entirely unlike a foot. And it took like two seconds to do, right? And it took less effort than sitting here trying to make it toe by toe, right? So that's Again, ideally, and, and, you know, going back to the question, that's how you make it fun. Like, try to think of, like, uh, also, like, doing stuff with your hands is just fun a lot of the time. I mean, not for everybody, but I think for a lot of people it is. So 
I really enjoy being able to like push some clay around, you know, or like, well, for instance, if you were doing like a big, uh, complicated uh, scene with like, you know, uh, a bunch of like uh, architecture and perspective, you could sit in your room for a long time plotting out vanishing points and hoping that you like the viewpoint that you chose that you committed to, you know, by the time you're done with your drawing, or you could build a maquette and like literally build the thing and be able to put different lights on it and move it around and, you know, have like fun, like sculpting little people. Hey, Rosie, uh, since mm -hmm. he's running late, can it be okay to give you guys pre-sliced limes and lemons and stuff like that? <laughs> Oh, yeah, Ebony, I think your, <laughs> your thing's turned off. Uh, also, nice to see you. Um, anyway, so going back to this, you know, when you put this in, you want to have, again, like a purpose for it, right? Like the reason why, you know, uh, I'm assuming that this is there is, oops, if you, you know, if you think of like your standard leg, like this is fairly common. Like, again, it's basically, you know, generally cylindrical, uh, basically like that. It kind of boxes up by the time you get here. Again, is it literally a box? No, because, you know, you have like, you know, the, you know, the condyles of the, you know, the femur go like that and there's a little dip and then there's the tendon that comes in here or whatever. But you know what? It's pretty close to a box, you know, in the same way that like when you buy glasses, like they don't like entirely conform to your face, right? Like you're, you know, this is you and like, you know, here's like your eyebrows and here's like your nose or whatever. If you buy glasses and they look like that, that is close enough. Right. So anyway, sort of like that, um, you know, here. What you are getting yeah, in sort of very broad terms structurally is you're getting basically something that's coming out like this as, um, you know, like, okay, again, generally kind of a cylinder that gets a little little boxy towards the end. This is generally the group of the quads. The quads kind of group together with like, you know, the actual um, ends of the bone. Right. What'll happen is you also have this mass of the, this other group of the adductors here, like the muscles of the inner thigh. And those are, you know, wide here. And here, the, the, the plane separation between these is like not that harsh. Like the ramp, it's not that, like, it's not that steep of a drop off right there. This goes in here. And very generally, these are going into this, right? And they're kind of wrapping around here. And so, what you get here is basically, you know, this would continue, this would go all the way through like this, if it weren't for this meddling set of adductors and the and some muscles coming from the back too, pushing up against it and eating into it, right? And so this, you know, because you know, most of the tissues are flexible, right? So this pushes up against this and it kind of like deletes part of the box, right? So what you end up getting is you get the feeling of like this in here. Now, if you continue that kind of boxy thing, you know, arrangement like down here, this also keeps going. So it eats away at that part of the box as well, right? So basically the reason why you, why you have this here is because something like this was happening. What I would say is like, again, don't see it as a line, but think of like the interaction that's happening here. Think of how this is going like this and how this is going like that. So when you draw this, again, think of how you have to lead this in from further out. Doesn't have doesn't mean you have to literally put this line in or that line in. The specific lines that you put in do not matter. But it matters more that, again, whatever marks you use, you know, they're trying to express this idea. Like you have to wind up and think of this whole mass and how it would push up against this box, you know, in order to like, you know, draw this and make it something, you know, sort of more, more meaningful here. Right. Um, you know, it does look a little bit sort of on the thicker side of things right now, but like, you know, that's not like super important. Uh, that's something that you can, you know, fix in sort of subsequent drawings. What I would say is like one thing that, again, shapes I think are useful as an auxiliary. So, you know, it is useful to like, you know, for a second step back and look at something and be like, is that what kind of triangle is that? You know, or like to look at an overall area and be like, mm, oh, that looks like a, like a rectangle, like a long rectangle you know, or maybe more square or maybe more long or whatever. Like that's super useful, right? It's just not like it only provides you with very limited information. For what it does, it's great. But it's not like I wouldn't build an entire like, you know, system of drawing off of that necessarily. Um, anyway, so again, trying to have a little bit more purpose in terms of that, uh, uh, Bianca. And 
then uh, let's see with um, let's go ahead and since we have reference here, we'll take your original and put this here. By the way, like just generally, like you're you're doing a really good job with these paintings. Like they, you know, they feel very complete. Like you have a really good grasp of again a lot of these concepts. It's just that's really what it is after a while, though. It's like you know, since like in terms of like what you were asking, like what to work on. Again, that's contingent on your goals, but it's also the kind of thing where it's like, since you're doing like, uh, you know, again, assuming that your goal is like, you know, sort of naturalistic representation of the figure, you're doing everything well. So what you need to work on is, you know, imagine that you're hitting everything at like 80%, then like everything has to like move up to like 85. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the answer is basically what do you have to work on? Pretty much everything not in the sense that like you either know it or you don't but in the sense that like you're at a level where you're doing everything really well and so if you want like you know to you know have a, a sort of a, a greater level of understanding of the figure you have to squeeze out more out of every single thing that you do right and a lot of that has more to do with like kind of like um you know uh stepping back you know and uh and assessing things kind of more more holistically right so for instance like the clearest example here would be when you look at this knee here notice how sharp this is right especially when you look at it from from far away um you know that is something that is not necessarily like you know helping to express the form so that's something that we can you know uh address here and it's probably like the biggest uh difference here right so here, okay, we can, you know, we can bring that in so it doesn't stand out quite so much uh, here. Okay, this, this is the same thing we were talking about, right? It's, we were talking about the inside leg, but it's something similar happens here, where you have basically this box structure going here, and then something going, bloop, and cutting out um, part of it. That has to do more with just kind of assembling forms and stuff like that. Um, here, again, if you think of it more purposefully, you know, again, what's happening over on your model is you're getting one plane through here, you're getting another plane, and the values are very subtle here, but you're getting another plane here, and then you're getting another one here, right? So you're getting this like, you know, bang, 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 like that. Here, however, it starts to get a little bit more um, confusing, right? It's not like entirely um, clear. And so what I would do is, usually with a lot of these things, you start out sort of like less, um, Oh, so here, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to have a better understanding of the figure and also make sure I don't use the flow of things because I tend to lose focus into details. Um, I feel like something becoming a little too stiff. So basically, Bianca, what you're describing is you're thinking of things too separately. Like the solution to all of these things is to step back and make a sort of broader assessment and only put in what you need to make your figure sort of look the way you want from almost like a specified distance. Like the one of the issues with digital is digital is great, but it allows you to kind of keep zooming in and you have to be the one that's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Let me just back up here, because at least with like, you know, analog media, it's like there is a stopping point, like unless you're going in with like a microscope, you know, you can't see past a certain point with this. You can kind of keep going. Right. And so here I would say state this more simply. And one sort of just purely strategic thing to do is it is a good idea to within a certain group, like in terms of like within the lights, let's say, do not put in like uh, operate under the assumption that differences within a group will be pretty small differences from, say, the shadow to the light because they're different groups. Those might be big, but inside of like a given group that you clearly saw as a group, then, you know, basically, you know, sort of be very wary of like making things like sort of too contrasty, you know, early on. It's it, it's a lot of times more useful to kind of like, you know, build up to, you know, a, uh, a sort of more extreme accent. So for instance, like think of it this way. This is again, what you what you would see in like that Julian Alden Weir or in that Danyan. You just get it as simply as possible. Just boom, up and down, boom, up and down. What's the inclination? What's the color, right? Boom, get this plane in right there. Then after that's done, then you can start to go across, right? And, and if anything, actually, this could be even more subtle to, to begin with, you know, we could actually just uh, reduce the, the contrast here, because you, if you squint down, you really don't see that much um, change here. There's some, but it's, it's not a lot. So let's say we have that. 
even from a like you know from a distance you can actually see that there's a change in plane like it feels like one even though if we got up close it would be very difficult to see what we even did but again we're not judging it up close we're judging it from a distance once we have that and to be fair even this is too much so spending time adjusting this at first is actually a much better use of your time than putting in a bunch of stuff and then trying to get it all together, right? And making it integrate. So what I would say is in between this, like now you can put in like another little transition there. Here you can push a little darker, not everywhere, but just, you know, in the spots that need it. So if you need to sculpt this form in, if you need to, it's like digging your finger into clay. If you need to push this in, then, you know, because of where the light is, it needs to go darker. So we do that here, you know, here we're going across now, right? So we were going up and down, now we're thinking of, okay, what do we need to do to integrate going across? Every brushstroke that you put in has a certain angle. It has a certain character, right? Whether it's like wiggly or straight or curved or whatever. And it has, you know, a certain, um, a certain movement, right? And so the, the way to like not lose movement in your drawings is every decision that you make, it, you have to consider what the movement of that element is and how it ties into the, the bigger movement of the figure in general, right? The more you think about this stuff, the, you know, the, you, you're not even going to necessarily have to like, um, what's it called? Um, it, it sort of takes care of itself, you know, in a sense. Uh, because again, your sort of uh, responsibility here is just to analyze the, again, the larger sort of aspects. Um, here, again, if we squint down, like this all actually goes a little bit darker here. Um, you know, one thing that I'm noticing here is, again, almost everything that you have is like pretty much there. It just needs like a little bit more or like your overall like perception of things, I think is very well developed. You just kind of have to like, you know, piece it together a little bit more. So when you have the arm here, this feels like a very abrupt stop. It feels like it just kind of comes in like, boom, boom, arm, that's it. Whereas here, you feel how this hooks around and like loops back over to the other arm, right? So how do we do that? Well, I mean, the simplest way would be like the most literal way would be like, okay, there we go. <laughs> you know, of course, we're not going to do that because that's a little too, you know, again, a little too, too literal. But having that feeling of that little hook here, you can actually see it here. You can see a little bit of how that shadow is set up, you know, along that, um, that deltoid and the half tone that follows it, that it creates that little, that little loop. So it's going to be little things like that in, in your case. Here, okay, this, this, you know, this gets a little bit sharper. The other thing is you're going to have to, you, you, you don't want to put in all this stuff if you're not be making a clear decision or a clear analysis of, for instance, where the bottom plane is, you know, of the, of the elbow, right? So, for instance, like what you're getting here, again, if you squint down, is you're getting this, right? So that's, you know, one plane or that one plane break. This is the bottom, and this is the side here. So you have to figure out a way to, you know, basically express that as clearly as possible, right? If you don't do that, then it's going to look vague, right? And so, you know, basically we want to go in here and be like, okay, squint and step back. And basically this is just it's just going like this, you know, it's just, uh, you know, side to side like that. That's most of, again, what drawing is. Like you just go, you go up and down, you go side to side you know, you go in and out, like that's the basis of three-dimensionality in, in drawing. So even if, even if we do less than you did, it becomes a clearer expression of the position in space of that, um, of that uh, uh, elbow. Here, imagine that you're tracing this from further back, because see this in here for the hand starts to get a little bit cluttered. Wind up your movements from further back. Imagine that you're pulling that finger, or even like that little tendon of it, literally from back here and funny enough that is where that tendon originates basically right and so what you want is not so much to memorize a bunch of anatomy but to follow the basic principles that the body is built on because then you'll be able to like it's basically like you know sort of it's almost like you're like creating real people you know out of like the ether like again imagine how the fingers and these tendons that lead into them, they're like violin strings that are all traceable to the common extensor that you're gonna have back here, right? So you have to feel the actual like tension of this 
Uh, you have to sort of uh, imagine what it's like to be your model or your character uh, and not just see them as like, you know, this sort of like set of uh, shapes or as a kind of like, you know, this, this set of patterns, right? Here, we have to feel how this, you know, goes in here. It has to, this, this, this part of the trapezius has to connect to the, um, you know, it needs to have like a basically a rhythm following through or a through line into the neck, you know, into the overall head. And so that's something that we want to, you know, to work on. Now, you could spend all kinds of time just assessing the angle of this being like, oh, let me get the shape of this right. Or you can just logically deduce that because the neck has to be over here, right? Maybe not exactly here or here, but somewhere in here. And this is part of the neck. Here's where it starts at the shoulder. It has to go this way. And the arm, you know, is going here from this, you know, outer part of the elbow to here. So then as you understand the larger context of these, you just let them cross instead of worrying, you know, too much about like the exact shape of this on the outside. And then it becomes easy to do instead of like coming in here and being like, oh, no, I missed the angle of this little thing or, oh, no, I put this a little too high or whatever. Right. You think of the causes, like try to get back to like, why would this look this way? <laughs> like that is the that is the big question. And again, when you, you know, for the kind of painting that you're doing here, I would say, you know, Zorn is a good one to look at. Um, you know, sometimes I can be a little reticent about people like Zorn because like, you know, people, I think he's a little overrated in some ways, but um, but he does do a lot of things really effectively. Right. And so one of them is, again, the brushstrokes feeling like this kind of physical thing. Like they're very simple, but they are very like, um, you know, it, it is a clear expression of this idea that like, for instance, like what's happening here is you have pulling off from the breast, you have the pec going this way, going into the deltoid, and then you have the bicep at a diagonal growing like this, and then you have the rest of the elbow going that way. So it's not so much about like worrying too much about every single little muscle, it's about worrying about what the muscles are doing, right? Because again, the muscles look like what they're doing. So if you go back to that larger principle, you solve all of these problems before they even become problems. Um, here, this is, you know, we don't really see this here. We see more of like, okay, this movement cutting through all the way. We see, you know, this, again, not even getting that little, you know, that little shape like that but thinking, okay, this goes this way, and then this other movement cuts in front of it, and then in the end, you get the shape anyway, right? Here, it's more of just like thinking of the, the intersection of all these different forms, like this crosses here, this goes this way, this has to join back in, you know, to what the rest of this stuff is doing uh, back here. And it's a little too dark there. Um, here, I'm a little too lazy to mix that right now. So we're just gonna borrow, <laughs> we're just gonna borrow a little bit of, you know, one of the other ones. And let's say like, okay, we, you know, pull that through there, right? Here, same thing. Again, don't worry too much about like the little contrast or that little like, you know, little edge of the shadow right there. Try to get the overall thing pulling, right? What you're doing when you're painting is you are building, right? Painting is just sculpture with color basically. Drawing is also just sculpture. Like all that we're doing when we do this stuff is trying to, we're doing like pretend like VR, you know what I mean? Or like really low tech VR. We're doing like pretend sculpture on a, on a ostensibly flat surface. And then here again, you're kind of working too hard. Like there's, you know, when you compare this, don't just compare this tone here to what's next to it set a kind of uh, more, you know, quote unquote, like absolute kind of basis. So something where it's like, okay, what is the darkest point like on the entire, you know, subject, right? Or compare to something like further away. So like you can compare to say like the darkness of this shadow, is this as dark as that, right? And obviously the answer is no, you know, keep scanning around. Is this as dark as this? Okay, no. Is this as dark as this? No, if you squint, it almost disappears, right? So here, you don't need to dig out the contrast of that so much, actually. Uh, I mean, that thing, you know, you can barely even see it. So it's not actually worth, you know, sort of spending too much time on uh, as far as that goes. You're better off thinking of how this leads back into the elbow. And for instance, look, by worrying about all the small stuff, we're missing the big movement that this is hooking back in this way, right? 
So that's actually, that is actually something that is, you know, deserving of our attention in terms of this. So, you know, here we want to just, okay. And again, notice I, you know, we're doing this very, very simply. Now, you know, you might even be thinking like, or, you know, any, someone might even be thinking like, this is an anatomy workshop. Like this, is this anatomy? Actually, yes, because we're dealing with how we build the body. So, you know, anatomy is not just counting ribs and metatarsals. It's, you know, a big part of it is actually just, you know, dealing with these, what these things add up to, right? When I talk about like the, you know, the fried chicken leg or whatever, like just, you know, thinking of like the forearm as, you know, again, a fried chicken leg or a turkey leg or whatever, that is anatomy. That is very low res anatomy, but it speaks to the idea that, you know, I mean, is a turkey leg not anatomy? Is it not part of, you know, an animal? Um, you know, but it speaks to the idea that all the meat over here makes something look round. And, you know, basically every muscle will go from, you know, the body, the belly of the muscle, the actual meat to the tendon to the bone. And that has certain implications for the form, right? So in any case, that's what I would try to, to, to work on. And even look with the drapery, it's the same thing. It's like, don't think of this as something that you're making out of all these like little small brush strokes. But, you know, one thing that's happening here is you're getting these things across, but we're actually missing the feeling of the side of the head. Like fundamentally, this is what this is. You have the side of this and you have the front of it. Like that's the most basic thing that you want to have in there. And, and you don't want that to get lost. Now, you know, and the simplest way of even painting that would be largely to, you know, basically just bring that in like that. Like, look at how sharp this edge looks right now. That's because the value of this area here is um, too high, right? So if you just, again, do literally, whenever you're drawing or painting, never start with whatever seems the hardest. Look at like, try to find the easiest possible thing that you look at and you're like, oh, I can do that. And then do that. And then the next easiest thing. And then the next easiest thing. Um, that's, you know, the sort of, that's the way to approach that to keep yourself sane. So, you know, basically, and again, you know, go also by area. Like, you know, if, if this is, if you squint down and this whole thing is basically this like grayish half tone, then do that, you know, put that thing in first you know, whatever that ends up being, and then go ahead and, you know, put in these smaller accents that only take up a tiny amount of space, you know? And so you sort of, you know, uh, economize in terms of like, you know, you economize your effort in that way in terms of just thinking about like, okay, well, like physically, even on the surface of this, like, you know, um, what takes up the most space? Like what, what you know, what gets, what gets me the most like bang for my buck, you know? And then, you know, whenever you need to, then you can go back in and like elaborate some of the smaller stuff and that kind of thing. But look, if you paint too much detail, you're going to miss stuff like the actual way that this like, you know, like the, the interesting way that this towel sort of wraps around diagonally on her head, right? Um, you know, or how this comes up like that, as opposed to just kind of resting in a kind of like a neutral, like, you know, uh, kind of parallel state to the rest of the figure. So that's, you know, that's what I would primarily push for. Again, they're not crazy changes, but it's just, you know, do less. And I guess the way that I usually phrase the deal was like, do less, but do it better. You know, it's like, put more thought into each thing. And you figure that, I mean, if you're like me, and I think this is most people, it's like, you have a finite amount of like processing power, right? Like the brain can't just like continually just think of more things. So your attention is limited. So you just have to be choosy about where you put that attention. So if um, instead of, you know, dispersing that attention and squandering it over a bunch of like sort of things that are going to be more kind of half-baked, focus on like two or three things and do those as well as you can, right? And that usually yields better uh, results. You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, I'm sure that there's, you know, some debate to some degree about this, but like, you know, even with like, exercise like if someone's trying to like get bigger or whatever like it is generally more efficient it seems to do compound exercises that target a bunch of different muscles instead of just like you know working out single muscles like one at a time because well what if you don't know what a certain muscle is like you don't know that a certain muscle exists you can't work it out because you you're not going to like think to do that 
But if you, you know, say do an exercise that engages different muscles, you don't even have to think about which muscles are being used necessarily, right? So trying to think of like, what is the pattern underlying this thing? Why am I doing this? What is the point? That tends to um, clarify a lot of uh, issues that would otherwise be there, right? So usually it's like, you kind of think of it this way, like what is the easiest way to do something, right? The easiest way to do something is to not do it, <laughs> you know? So if there is like a detail that you're struggling with, you're like, I don't know how to do this or whatever, you might even find that you actually don't even need to like put that in at all, you know, and then like problem solved. So something to think about. Okay, so you have Gabrielle here. Uh, teach drawing in a small atelier in Rio. Oh, awesome. Um, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I was drawing really I'm not pushing anatomy yet. You got me thinking about what you're not bringing a drawing. Graphic shape went light, so a little even. Love to know what you think. Um, well, Gabriel, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, if you're interested, by the way, um, there are a bunch of drawings, uh, academic drawings in Rio de Janeiro. So if you want to go like check those out at some point, I don't know how accessible they make those to people, but um, you know, part of what I've been doing is just kind of like since um, you know, the the folks that I've met that are interested in this kind of thing are spread out all over the world and academic drawings themselves are spread out all over the world. Even, uh, I mean, a lot of people used to go to Paris to study, right? And so, actually, we don't really need this. Um, so they, you know, brought the stuff back with them to wherever they were from. Uh, in like Japan, for instance, there's a bunch of really good academic drawings. Um, but Brazil, it's the same thing. And so if, um, if you're ever interested in taking pictures of those, uh, please let me know. I can give you the info and I'll put them up on the website for everybody to be able to share and look at and learn from. Um, that's, you know, that's kind of how this works, right? It's like we, you know, try to help each other out if uh, the schools and other institutions aren't going to help us. So <laughs> in any case, um, yeah, in terms of the drawing, like uh, what I would say is like same thing, right? Like go take a look at that Lanteri book. Uh, that one will be really useful because again, don't think of it as uh, anatomy being a separate subject from like planes and three-dimensionality and construction. The anatomy is just a little bit like it's it's like most of what you do is just based on building stuff, right? It's like you build a person the same way you would build a chair, you know, on on canvas or on paper. Um, you know, the three dimensional aspect of like you know how we perceive reality doesn't care about whether you know it's a person or a or or a dog or a chair or whatever. So that's number one, right? So that's like your main tool, like just to be able to sculpt, to think about sculpture. Um, you're doing really well with that here. You know, you get a really clear sense of like, okay, like one plane versus another plane, you know, the front versus or the front versus the side, you know, et cetera. Um, that's really clear in here as well. Um, I would say that I would bet money that you're not sharpening your charcoal. I would do that because it's going to make it a lot easier to, you know, to, 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 to work something like this out where you don't get like a lot of uh, sort of like wobble in these things that makes it like kind of harder to, to, to see what you're doing. Um, it depends on the kind of work that you're doing, right? So like if you're doing just expressive studies for the sake of doing that, then, you know, obviously like anything goes at that, at that point, as long as you express the idea that you want. If it's intended more as a study, then what you want to do is the goal of a study generally, obviously studies can have different superficial purposes, but ultimately the purpose of a study is understanding. You are trying to like, you know, um, express something as clearly as possible because the clarity is a measure of how well you understand it. And so that's something to, to consider in terms of that. Um, one thing that I would say is like, I have a few kind of anatomy resources that I really like, and I've been trying to reduce the number of just like things that I think about, you know? So I will say like, I studied a bunch of this stuff like separately, like a long time ago. And I feel like my ability to like express what I want has gotten a lot better recently, not because I'm studying all these different early disciplines separately, but because I am thinking of just, again, those few core principles. I'm thinking of the movement, the character, and the structure. Call them whatever you want to call them, but those three ingredients, those three building blocks, together with the idea of working on the totality of the drawing or the sculpture or whatever, are what are allowing me to work a lot faster, to you know, have more fun while doing things. You know, it's it's funny because like people will say like, oh, like, 
you know, um, I love the brush strokes in this or whatever. And it's like, you know, in like a painting or a sergeant or whatever. And that is completely missing the point. Like the brush strokes are there as a result of someone trying to express something very directly and very clearly, right? If you go for just the brush strokes, you know, it's that you're just sort of, you know, you're just going for the most superficial aspect of that. And it doesn't necessarily unlock the, the knowledge that allows you to, to, to do that. Um, you know, looseness in paintings, it, looseness is probably one of like my least favorite terms that people use. <laughs> and it's because it's not really that descriptive. Like what it actually is, it's like, it's, you know, people, someone who is trying to get an idea through clearly, very, uh, you know, working sometimes very fast, very like succinctly, like trying to get the idea to you and like having as few obstacles between like you communicating to somebody else, you know, as possible. Now, in terms of anatomy, uh, and in terms of resources, um, oh, okay. So, and actually, yeah. Uh, so Nick is asking about uh, literally uh, what I was just uh, about to mention. So, um, strength training anatomy by Frederick Delavier. It's a oh, Cooper seemed to be a fan of that. <laughs> um, this one is very, very useful. The reason why it's useful is because, and this is the funny thing, is like this is much more useful for us than literally like ninety nine percent of like art anatomy books that are out there. Um, Largely because a lot of them are like, I mean, listen, like, I'm not going to name any names here, but like most anatomy, art anatomy books that are out there are complete garbage. Like it, they are, and they're usually done by like specialists too, like people that only teach anatomy. And that is like a recipe for disaster because in fact, what is useful is to be able to have a broad knowledge of how anatomy is applied to something, right? Uh, usually what happens sometimes is you get people that know all the muscles or whatever, but they don't know how to express themselves that effectively in terms of space. So you get all these spaghetti muscles that are just lying next to each other instead of wrapping around and turning and diving and all the things that you actually need, <laughs> you know, it's like missing the point of what the muscles actually do, right? This book is phenomenal. It's like a $10 book. It is not meant for artists. It is meant for exercise. <laughs> and the cool thing about that is that the guy actually did go to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts more recently. Uh, and they still have classes in morphology. They're not like amazing classes, but he got a lot out of it. Um, the beauty of this book is that the person who made it is uh, very sort of obsessive about like the, you know, the, the accuracy of the drawings generally. But more importantly, it is the body in movement. You get to see what the body is actually doing. And these are the most accurate illustrations that I've seen of these, uh, you know, specific um, or just of the body in general largely because he takes photographs, traces the drawing over them, right? Someone might say like, oh, that's cheating. He's not drawing them from scratch. Literally, that is the point. The point of this is to be as accurate as possible. That is the way to do it. The method that you choose, the resources that you use have to be tailored for whatever the point is. If he just drew these, you know, from his head or from like, you know, um, or even just freehand without tracing, that would literally just be a vanity project. What matters here is that the information is accurate. Like his mission is to get the information to you. It's not about him. It's the same thing with teaching. You know, it's like, that's what you're actually trying. You know, it doesn't end up being about like doing fancy demos or whatever. It's about communicating information. What I would do with this book is basically when you do a drawing of a model, whether from like reference or from life, during the breaks, like, or when you like go home or whatever, if it's a multi-session drawing or even if you're done with the drawing and there was an area that you did not understand, look it up in the book because this has the body doing almost anything that it can do. It's a full body workout book. So it's every part of the body flexing or extending or whatever. Uh, the name of the book is uh, Strength Training Anatomy. There are others in the series. There's like an MMA one. There's a core training one. There's a stretching one. There's, there's a bunch. And again, like you will see the body doing like just in poses that you will just not see in any other book. There's also like a bit of like comparative anatomy. Um, there's also like, again, extremely foreshortened poses. There's also interesting information in terms of just like, um, you know, variations in terms of like how certain muscles or how like fat is stored or how things present themselves differently in different people. So for instance, like abs, right? Everybody thinks of like, you know, those kind of like chiseled symmetrical abs. Whether your abs are symmetrical or not is genetic. So your abs can be symmetrical or they can be staggered like this, right? They can be, you know, 
sort of uh, typically segmented or they can be hyper segmented, which is why some people have like a 10 pack. You don't get a 10 pack by working out more. That is literally just genetic. Your body either has those sort of like little, because um, your abs are like bubble wrap. It either has the little seams that create the extra bumps or it doesn't. And so all those things are very useful to, to refer back to. So again, let's say you're doing like a longer drawing, like one of these, then you start your drawing. If you have any questions, you go home, you look it up in the book and try to make sense of you know, what you were looking at. And then you go back with that knowledge to work on your drawing, right? And so that is a useful, practical um, you know, way of, of studying that doesn't necessarily like take out like a bunch of time, right? Because you're applying the anatomy to practical problems. Um, I've taught like in a bunch of schools before. And one thing that used to happen is I used to get students after they had taken an anatomy class. And, you know, at times I would be in charge of like, say like the advanced uh, figure drawing class. The issue is that people would know all of this trivia and all the little names and all the whatever, like nonsense in terms of like the muscles and the bones, but they couldn't draw a clavicle for me. They couldn't show me how the clavicle is flat here and how it goes in and then how it comes out. And that was a huge problem, right? And so you don't need to, these things all evolve together. It's not like you just learn all of the anatomy and then you do drawing or you do all of this and then you move on. No, you are developing your understanding. Everything comes up together, basically. Even things like composition, you should be studying that from the beginning. You should not wait until you can draw in order to you know, start thinking about composing pictures and that kind of thing. Um, and again, you can do that with you know, little things like this. Um, other books that I like, um, I like this is like a, just a general like textbook anatomy book. Um, this is Peck's Atlas of Anatomy. It's, uh, it's also cheap, it's like $10 or something. Um, the illustrations in this are very, very clear. Uh, it has, it's very comprehensive. It has like pictures of people and has like the muscles, uh, you know, uh, sort of like an écorché. It has everything from like, you know, this is a kind of like, uh, in a sense, a, a little bit of like a definitive thing that you can refer to. But there are also very useful, like small simplifications in here that are very, uh, you can't really see them that well with my camera, but they're, um, they're similar to like Bridgman. Bridgman, I think, is also useful. Uh, we can talk about him in a, in a little bit. But um, basically, like anything that's teaching you, again, about movement, about how things interlock, about the purpose of things, right? Which, again, is why I like the Delavier book. If you can choose between the Delavier book and the Peck book, I would get this one. If you only get one anatomy book, it's this one. Um, the other thing that I use is an app that I don't even know if they're updating anymore, but it's called um, Anatomy 3D Atlas by Catfish Studios, I think. Um, so I have it like on my phone and on my tablet. Basically, it, it's, it's, it's beautifully done. And it's, uh, I think it's like, I don't know, like $14 or something. It's not super expensive. But I like having this, like if I have a question or if I need to show a student something or if I'm drawing and I don't know what something is, then, you know, I will pull it up on my phone and I'll just like, you know, during a break and I'll just start looking, right? And again, you want to develop a system for like your teachers or whoever you're learning from are not like, you know, again, not like these like magical sort of like oracles, right? Like the, like when I help a student to find like where the scapula is or something, it's not like I just already know just by looking, I am looking for certain points and, you know, I know more or less where they're going to be. And then we just kind of connect the dots. You know, it's literally like some little Sherlock Holmes type of thing. And so in any case, what usually happens in terms of like anatomy stuff is that you will see something in the body and you'll be like, I don't know what that is. And depending on where it is, it can only be so many things. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, like if you're looking at the back of the arm like this and you're like, there's a bump that I don't recognize. Well, it's not going to be the bicep, you know, because that's that's way too far. It's not going to be, you know, the, you know, the extensors of the fingers or whatever. So you only have a few options. It's like it's one of the heads of the tricep or the common tendon. You know, you don't really like have that many more things that it could be. Um, the more you understand, again, the purpose for a certain part of the body, like what it does, whether it like moves the arm up, which is what the deltoid and the trapezius do in this in this case, or whether it moves it down or whatever then, you know, you, um, you can draw it more effectively, the more you know sort of what it's for. Um, let's see. So um, do I think it would be useful to buy a skeleton model? Uh, I mean, I have one, but like, I don't think you need to. Um, I think when people say to learn the skeleton, you, you have to sort of think about what that means. Like, um, 
it doesn't mean that you have to draw like every rib and like study every bump on the skeleton. The skeleton is basically like a stick figure. And the skeleton, the most useful parts of it for us are where it comes to the surface. So it's like where things get like a little boxy and that kind of thing. So basically, as long as you understand that, like, you know, again, you have like, yeah, you know, the the spine or the, the center line of the figure that you're building everything off of and that most of the parts out here tend to square up a little bit. That's about as much skeleton as most people will need. Um, I would say that first start out from just having the skeleton like on like an app on your uh, phone or tablet or whatever or on, or on your computer. And then if you really need it, then you can like buy the skeleton. Like the reason I have it is because, um, you know, I just wanted to put some like foam on it to like bulk it up and uh, put clothes on it to do like studies of drapery and for characters for paintings and stuff. That's basically it. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, I don't know if you can find it cheap, it's cool to have, you know, but it's not like, I, you don't have to spend a lot of money to do any of this. If you don't have to go to some fancy art school, you don't have to buy like, you know, tons and tons and tons of like, you know, material or, or sort of, uh, uh, resources. So that I think is like, you know, sort of something to keep in mind. Um, so going back here, um, so what I would say in terms of, uh, I think you're just sort of asking for like general, uh, general advice, right, Gabriel? Um, let me see. Christian, now you're thinking of what to bring in or not in a drawing. Okay, yeah. So in terms of what to bring in or not, again, that depends on the goal for the drawing. So there isn't really like, you know, a sort of rule that I can tell you in terms of that. Um, it depends on what you're trying to express. If I had to guess, I would say that you're trying to express like the individuality and like the bulk of the, of the figure here in your subject. And, you know, possibly like the kind of movement overall. Um, so, you know, what I would try to do is like, okay, you have, you know, a really effective, you know, sort of, um, you know, movement through here, like connecting like this to this, you know, like here to here to here and coming down, right? The, the building blocks of this, I think, are actually, like I said, pretty, uh, you know, really well done here. I would say that this, this ends very abruptly there's going to be something that continues this trajectory. Like it doesn't just stop, right? It, everything just kind of gradually integrates in one way or another. So there's going to be a way for this to come back up. There's probably going to be something over here that is going to, you know, sort of, you know, continue this pattern. Um, I would say that when you get into this, don't let this distract from the overall, you know, sort of uh, uh, feeling that you're trying to create. If there are variations that go across, save those for a little bit later. Often what you can do is like, what you'll find is that the big planes are sort of like, they're not that contrasty. Like you oftentimes end up expressing them with like, you know, fairly subtle value changes. And then, you know, you sort of maneuver that to make sure that it turns the way you want it to turn. And then afterwards you might put in like a few little accents that disrupt, you know, sort of little parts or like, you know, go across here, go across here. But you just have to do it sort of more purposefully, right? Like. Very often you, you'll see an area and it'll look really dark. And it's not so much that it's dark like this. It's often that it's like maybe say that dark and it has these little accents on it like this. And when you step back, those little things make it look darker than it actually is. So again, within the lights, like, you know, or within a group, like within the shadows or within the lights, I would say don't make like huge changes, like, uh, or assume that the changes are less than you think they are. And then if you if they are more, then you push it more, right? Um, and here, there's a question here. Uh, Sirach is asking, uh, often see separate values in strong, direct, indoor light. Okay, sure. It gets harder in smooth, natural light. What would I represent? Uh, what would you recommend for representing values and forms correctly in soft light? So basically, that just speaks to the fact that like you have to derive the simple principle from what you're doing, right? So it's not really about like, of course, it's easier to see the separation between like, you know, like here, like something really light and something really dark, right? But the whole point is that what you're doing is you're averaging areas, right? So in one way or another, you know, you are looking at all of the differences that you see here in the lights and you're saying, yeah, 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 yeah. But this is mostly just that. And it's mostly just this, right? That's effectively what you're doing. Like you're taking all of this data and you're creating an average, and you're looking for what it has in common, right? So visually, it doesn't matter what's producing that, right? Like whether you, let's say you have like, you know, a piece of furniture here and you have a dark background over here, 
those are two different tones. Those are two different groups of, uh, of value, right? It doesn't matter what causes the difference in the groups. So what happens is if you have a figure that's lit up very dramatically like this, well, maybe in this case, you have two groups, right? Okay. Well, if you have a figure that's lit with a front light, then you just have, or with, uh, you know, outdoor uh, overcast light, well, then you just have one, uh, all you have is like one, one tone, you know, for the, for the head or whatever. And then that's it. You know, you just take it for what it is. Um, what you do is, you know, you can start with a base tone for something and you would basically, I mean, what you would do is you would compare that tone up against like, let's say the background, like maybe there's a tree behind the person or, you know, something like that. Maybe there's like, you know, a landscape back here. Maybe there's like a bit of the sky back here, but you're always just kind of averaging out like what those areas are, right? Like you look at all these elements and you think those are similar enough that I'm going to make them the same to start, right? So again, it's not a method thing. It's just that, you know, as humans, we generalize information to make it manageable. So if you have something like this, what do we do with that information afterwards? Well, what we do is we take that base and then we go, you know, a little darker and a little lighter to introduce variations into that. So what you would do is, you know, and this is how you would model the lights or how you would model the shadows. Basically, when there's overcast light, you only have the lights to model. That's it. So if we were, you know, painting a person in overcast light, you squint and you put down whatever the most obvious thing is. So if there are parts of them that get lighter, like let's say here, and let's say, let's say like the whole front of their face gets like lighter and their forehead, right? Okay. Again, you try not to disrupt it too much. Like you put in something that's different, but not so different that it's like a huge deal, right? And then you say like, okay, maybe there are parts that get a little darker. Like what's the next most obvious thing? Maybe this goes in a little bit like this. Maybe this goes in a little darker. Maybe this underneath here gets a little darker too, right? Okay. Then you just keep pushing. You say like, okay, well, do I need to go lighter here? Maybe we do. Maybe just a little bit. Maybe a little bit here. Maybe a little bit here. Oops. You know, maybe like, oh, this keeps not selecting what I wanted to. You know, maybe a little bit there. Maybe a little bit there. If it's regular overcast weather, it's going to come from the top. You know, so... And if it's that kind of like sort of very broad diffuse light, then what will happen is you will get shadows, but they'll be in very small pockets because, because the light source is effectively the entire sky and it's huge. It gets to, the light gets to hit like all these different areas that if it were a more directional light, it wouldn't get to. So what happens is you only get shadows like in the little pockets that are really hard to reach, right? What people usually call like the occlusion, um, you know, uh, shadows. So you would get like, you know, in little holes and little pockets like this, like maybe in here, maybe in here. And what happens is that because the light source is so big, you know, you end up getting like, you know, the sort of uh, this big sort of gradation, you know, leading up to like any given, any given thing. So, you know, all of this would be, you know, sort of more like that. But three dimensionality is not achieved by having shadows. It's achieved by having, you know, basically changes in well at least for naturalistic work it's achieved by having changes that show that there are different planes that there are different sides so whether you do that with you know sort of a, whether it's high contrast or low contrast doesn't really matter as long as you're showing differences in the you know in the planes it will be three-dimensional okay um so anyway uh when we go back over here and again the, the reason why like you know you know like in the reason why somebody is able to do this stuff like from imagination or whatever is because every time that you step up to draw and here, maybe like the nostrils would be actually really dark. Every time you step up to draw, if you're thinking of things like analytically, you know, and you're trying to extract principles from those things, then every time you draw, you are learning something that you get to keep forever. Like you will forget about that drawing you were doing, but you will not forget about the knowledge that you gained from it. And that's the whole point. If you go to an atelier and you make like two, three little drawings, you know, like that's all you have, right? And like maybe you learned from some some stuff from them, maybe you didn't. But like, you know, it's you're not doing enough volume, you know, enough like sort of repetition of this work to really kind of like not be precious about the principles and to really like grind them in. So the way that you conquer like these things and the way you get like used to doing like certain like uh, or to like expressing certain concepts. We would like to think that it's purely logical, that you understand the idea and then you do it and then that's it. That is not actually how it works. The way that it works is like, you'll be really anxious about trying this new idea and about whether you can do it or not. 
And basically what you have to do is you have to do it so many times. Once you understand like the basics of it, you have to do it so many times that your brain gets tired of being anxious and it just does it. <laughs> or you give yourself enough things to do that your brain is busy enough that it doesn't, um, it cannot actually like overthink each thing because it has like enough to do, you know? So that's basically what I would say. Now here, uh, Gabriel, yeah, basically what I would say is like, look, just like try to simplify this a little bit more, like try to go for like the overall, like, you know, sort of movement here. And when you do put in variations, you know, again, just a little bit more purposeful, like, you know, if we put this in, like, what are we trying to accomplish? Oh, okay, we're trying to separate out the, um, the forearm from like the upper part of the arm. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, aim it at something, right? Like aim it at the deltoid or aim, aim it at in some way that you can connect it to some some larger idea or some other part of the body, you know? Um, I would say, again, the Bridgman books are really good too. You can find those for free online. Uh, they're out of copy right now. So uh, that would be really good to, to, to study. I really like the way that you did this, by the way. Like this, this uh, the fingers here really feel like they're integrated into this and like they're really, you know, sort of um, emerging out of the, the forearm. I would say even like follow this a little more. Like in the way that you apply this stuff, I would just be careful not to get too like techniquey for the sake of getting like techniquey. Like this stuff looks cool, but like ultimately what's even more useful is like, you know, expressing the idea like as clearly as possible, right? So like, you know, I would say that like, don't get into a bunch of hatching unless it's going to show like the different, like the most important like facets of the, of the figure, you know, stuff like that. But, um, you know, so again, the things that you're doing here where you're showing these planes very clearly and very forcefully, um, be more consistent about it. Like do that everywhere then, right? Because you clearly understand it. So you want to apply that like everywhere that you can. Um, initially in the head, there wasn't really that much of that. It felt more like these kind of features uh, sort of more floating. Um, think of it again, just kind of in more sculptural terms, like you have, you know, again, the front the side, et cetera. Okay. All right. Very good. So here. Um, Oh, uh, Rafael is saying that uh, grown uh, scared of making a, making a piece and all of your artwork consists of studies. Have I run across uh, someone else with that issue? Yeah, me. <laughs> but also like a lot of people. It's like literally anybody who goes to an atelier. Like, but listen, what you want to do is like making a picture is not like, it's not going to be some like crazy thing all the time. You know, it's like basically when, when you look at like, uh, you should probably be doing again, like simple composition where you just kind of chill out like you should be doing that as you're doing like your more, um, you know, like uh, uh, more formal studies. Like, look at this. This is a this is a Bouguereau study, right? This is like about as serious as you could get doing this. And then look, look at all these little noodle people on the side. You know, look at all these like he can paint a head like that, but he is not above just making a little egg head and putting a center line on it and like a little axis, right? Making arms out of like noodles and stuff. Like, that's the thing. It's like, you never outgrow this stuff because this is all there is, you know? It's like, you know, trying to be a chef and then thinking that you can, you know, like if you get good enough as a chef, you won't need fire anymore. Like, it's one of those things, like it's, it's kind of silly on the face of it, you know? And so, and again, look, like these are literally Bougaros. These are not student drawings by Bougaro. These are mature drawings by Bougaro. He is literally just having fun. He's just fucking around. You have to let yourself do that. You have to, you should on purpose make drawings that like are not what you want to like, that like suck, that you look at and you're like, that's terrible. Like in terms of like, oh, the anatomy doesn't make sense or whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, nothing bad happens. You know, drawings don't save lives. Drawings don't, you know, cure disease. Like the stakes are literally so low. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the thing that is useful and maybe the larger principle there is you have to separate yourself from your work. Yes, your work is an expression of what you do. However, your work is not you. So if you make something that you don't like, that's fine. You can just make something else later on. You know, it's not like um, a lot of people identify so strongly with being like a good artist or like, you know, in their friend group, maybe they're the one that does art, that if they make a drawing or a painting that doesn't, uh, you know, meet the standard of whatever, whatever they built up in their heads, it, it feels like a, like a kind of identity crisis, right? And that is not a position you want to get yourself into, right? I've seen that a lot with like students and stuff like that. It's just like, listen, like <laughs> drawing is not that serious, you know? So it's like, 
look, this is another Bouguereau drawing. This is the Bouguereau. This is what he was doing in his spare time. This is like a drawing of one of his, a uh, little caricature of one of his uh, colleagues during meeting, right? So like, if they can chill out, then like maybe we can chill out. Bouguereau actually taught like uh, with um, another artist uh, named Tony Robert Fleury. Uh, he actually volunteered services. Like Bouguereau taught for free at uh, the Julian Academy. The Julian Academy itself was not free. So the proprietor was making money from all of that, but Bougro himself was not like actually, you know, um, oh, whoops. Uh, no, it's not the one, 19th century database. Um, so if we go to, this is the database I was talking about. Like if you go here under Julian's and you go to Atelier uh, Bougro Robert Fleury, basically what they would do is they would switch off every month, right? So one month you get Tony Robert Fleury, one month you get Bougro. Um, honest, I, obviously, I know that like almost nobody's going to know who Tony Robert Fleury is. Um, he was a really great teacher, a uh, really great um, artist. Uh, one of his students wrote a, like a, you know, like a very famous diary um, that was published like after her death, I think. Um, her name is, name is Marie Bashkirtseff, and you can read that, um, you know, uh, online for free. Um, she was potentially in love with him, and apparently all the students called him Beautiful Tony. <laughs> which I don't think he knew about that, but uh, that is, you know, a very beautiful Tony. But um, in any case, uh, this is like, he's actually interesting too, because he, his dad was a really famous academic artist. And he obviously, you know, was, you know, primed from the start of his career to, you know, to, to have every advantage. That's not a great image. Um, but he, his career kind of fizzled out. Like he was still doing stuff, but like, it did not, uh, after he made this like enormous painting, this is the sketch for it, it looks like. Um, let's see, oh, this is a better image, it looks like. Um, this is at the Musée d'Orsay. Um, it's a huge painting. I mean, it's like, this is, it's an enormous painting. Clearly this man can draw or paint whatever he wants. He's super good at it, right? So anyway, um, later on, you know, he was drawing or painting like sort of like, you know, not these big scenes, but like more intimate, you know, like portraits and stuff like that. Um, in any case, the reason I bring him up is because, um, let's see, here is a student's account of what it was like, just a little tidbit of studying with Tony Robert Fleury, right? So he said, um, ba -ba -ba -ba. although, I don't know how to say this, I don't know if it's Brimner or Breimner, but although Breimner fretted about his abilities, his correspondence suggests he was a focused and disciplined student. He especially admired Robert Fleury's approach to teaching, reporting. I like his way of correcting things exceedingly. He does not put a line on the paper, or at least very seldom, but the way he picks things to pieces is astonishing. Robert Fleury was an encouraging teacher, and when he noticed that Breimner appeared to be forcing himself to draw, he advised a break, declaring, Il faut vous amuser en dessinant. You need to have fun drawing. So there you go. You know, somebody who is capable of doing literally everything that most of us strive for was like, Hey, bro, can you like maybe like chill a little bit like, and just have fun while you're doing this? And that's not rare, by the way. Um, Adolphe Vaughn, who was like the main teacher at or well, the person teaching like the sort of um, the uh, drawing, the evening drawing class at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which is like where a lot of uh, not the paintings, but, you know, drawings like this were created, you know, like um, or even say like these cabanels back here. Um, these are not from the day classes. Well, some of these are. But for instance, like um, like this one, I'm pretty sure it was from the evening class, this drawing. Actually, no, that's, that's not true. I don't know that that one is from the evening class. But um, let's see, which one is? No, oh, I think for these, actually, we might not have super strong evidence for which one's from the evening class. But let's say for going up here, I know this one is. Um, drawings like this, right? The person who was teaching people how to do this, this is another Julian Alden Weir drawing. Again, he was friends with Sargent. He and Sargent got into the, that night class that you had to do a big exam for. They got in at the same time. They were the only two Americans that got in, which is how they became friends. Um, the person teaching people how to do this literally was like, yeah, like you, he, was, we used, he had a teaching staff in another school that he was uh, teaching at. And he said to them like, yeah, you should teach them by amusing them. Like you, your students should have fun while they're learning. And so that's kind of the thing, you know, that's like the, that's a, I think a fairly universal principle. Um, my teachers were all like that, like Will Weston, you know, Robert Liberace, Glenn Vilpu, you know, um, Adrian Gottlieb too. 
they all had like a good time while they were working. And so it was never like, I wasn't in an environment that was like, you know, kind of the, the sort of thing where like a teacher's like yelling at you and they're like, you suck. Like, let me break you down so I can build you up better. Like I did not experience that. And it was great. Like my teachers were super nice. They were great. And they knew everything that I wanted to know, basically. And, you know, it's like, it, it, it's awesome. But it's the way that you treat yourself when you're drawing is also important, right? So like, you don't want to be like, Adrian taught me this, actually, like, you don't have to be thinking like, this is wrong. This is like, this is, this is good. This is bad. Because that actually makes no sense. What you should be doing, and it's pointless. It's actually self-indulgent to do that. What you should do is, for instance, like, and he taught this, he taught us this in terms of color. It wasn't like, oh, this color is wrong. It was like, this color is too light. This color is too dark. This color is too red. This color is too yellow. Because the thing is that if you're assessing your work and you're judging your, your efforts, you should judge it in relationship to what you're trying to accomplish. It's not just, a, it's not an indictment on yourself. Like I am a terrible person. I suck at this. That is dumb and it's not useful. So what you should do instead is you know, your criticism, your self-criticism should be actionable. If you take the time to judge what you're doing, it should be for the purpose of figuring out how to change it to make it what you actually want. That's a much better use of your time. Because if you just feel bad about what you're doing, you have to, like, you'll feel bad, you have to wait until you feel better, and then get back to work. Whereas if you don't feel bad, if you're just like, oh, this is, I didn't get what I wanted. Like, let me see what I can do to change that. And you stay fairly neutral about it. Then you get to keep working. You don't lose any time, you know, sort of, um, you know, wallowing. So that's something, I think the kind of habits of mind that you develop are really, um, they're important, right? Um, okay, and next we have uh, Guillaume. Um, okay, have some critiques on these figures. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. So... Okay, so the this looks like it's a it's a, it's a composition uh, that you're that you're working on. Um, what I would say is like I wouldn't make this quite so formal to start. Like I see that you have like a you know like a a perspective grid and stuff like that. I mean that's that's fine. You know that kind of thing is useful. But I think you know because it, it, it looks like you know, this is a, a person on a on a river, right? And there's like people floating through the river and stuff like that. Um, before you start like, you know, putting people into perspective and thinking about anatomy and mapping out shadow shapes or whatever, like you kind of want to, uh, I think, consider the sort of pictorial concept, like a little bit more, like kind of turn it around in your head, uh, a little bit more, like think of like, you know, how you want the figures to interact. Like the, you know, I would say that like, in order to have a meaningful critique of like, or meaningful feedback in terms of what you're doing, um, again, you want to have like basically a, um, you know, like a very, very clear purpose, right, for what you're doing. It isn't just like this figure is good, this figure is bad. It, that is entirely contingent on like what the figure is for, right? Um, one thing that I would do is if you have, you know, this, um, this person say like rowing here, and I'm almost kind of imagining that it's like the river sticks or something. And like the, these are, I don't know, maybe like lost souls in the river or whatever the case might be. Then if you're going to have a composition that is this formal, that is like smack down the middle like this, then generally what you want to do is, you know, in order for it to not just feel sort of like static, you know, just like this is like, you're going to want to introduce some kind of rhythm with the, with these other elements around, right? This composition feels very like you're emphasizing the vertical dimension of it. So I think a crop would actually be useful because you know, if, it, if it's about this journey and you're making the journey and the composition be from front to back, then you don't really need that much room over here. And it depends on what you're trying to show about these figures. Like if it's like, again, these kind of lost souls, like, you know, like crammed in here, then having the composition be tighter actually helps to express that more effectively, right? Because that way it's going to feel like they're like tighter in here. It's going to feel like they're kind of like and actually here, we'll just move the figures uh, along before we, before we do that. So, you know, if you don't have the figures overlapping and they're just kind of separate like this, then it's not really going to, um, uh, what's it called? It's, it's not necessarily going to feel like um, they're interacting or like the spatial relationships are not going to make that much sense, right? It's like, 
you know how you can like trick your brain into thinking that your finger is like touching like a pyramid or something just by like, you know, making it like, uh, like uh, creating a tangent, right? Where like, you know, it looks like I'm like poking Cooper here just because, you know, my finger visually is next to his head and, uh, and you have no other spatial clues. So you can't really tell whether it is touching or not. That's kind of the same thing here, right? So what I would do is like, you know, probably bring this in a little bit more. And I think even to strengthen the concept, like I would honestly consider like making the composition something that's really long and vertical. And then, you know, maybe you have like, depending on, again, what is the feeling that you want to communicate? Like, are you trying to show the long road that the rower has ahead? Or are you trying to show how far he has traveled, right? That'll determine where you place the person on the composition. Um, again, long sort of formats like this, like indicate, or at least are suggestive of the passing of time. So that is something that you might want to, um, you know, emphasize in terms of this. I would say that, again, if this is going to be this sort of formal, then what I would try to do is like, you know, have the figures be sort of like, you know, more, more fluid in some ways. Um, if you're, you're not doing any sort of like really crazy perspective here. So, it, I mean, it's just, it's just one point. It's like something that you can actually like kind of fit in to like, uh, like you could actually make this, right? Like you could like, what I would do if I were you and if I were creating this composition is actually make a maquette of this and just make the little figures like out of clay or whatever else. And so that you have the flexibility to change things and you're not like stuck to this, like, you know, sort of um, perspective grid that you have right now. Once you have a drawing of that that is viable, that you're really happy with, then I would use like formal perspective, like vanishing points and stuff to finalize it, right? But the vanishing points and all that and whatever, like that is useful to a degree, but it can very much be sort of like, you know, overused. So again, pictorially, like this is, I would probably do something like this, like try to kind of, um, Again, depends on the feeling of what you're trying to do, right? But cramming the stuff in, I think, would be would be more effective. Uh, creating the feeling that this person's like surrounded, let's say, I think that would be useful. In terms of like the, you know the individual figures themselves, like I said, it's it's hard to give any really substantive critique if you know the uh, the I, th I think at this point the pictorial concept has to be a little bit more clearly defined. But one thing that I would say is that you know this is kind of jumping to like too many details. And it's like, I think this, this feels like it's trying to do too much. Um, one thing that happens with the body is that you have this kind of baseline core of the body. So for instance, for like a leg or for whatever else, like you have the kind of minimum size that it can be like a minimum thickness in terms of the leg or an arm or something. The minimum thickness is basically, you know, how, you know, the, the minimum space that is needed to even just have the bones there, right? So if someone is like, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, if someone loses like a lot of weight, or if they're like malnourished, then they get pretty close to like the sort of, you know, minimum kind of like thickness that their that their leg or their body can be, right? The rest of us, obviously, you know, like we are significantly thicker, you know, because of, you know, muscle and fat, than you know, the minimum sort of, um, thickness dictated by the bones. And so one of the things that you don't want to do when you're drawing is cut into that minimum sort of baseline thickness, right? Um, oh, Demeter. All right. Take care, man. Uh, thanks for coming in here. Demeter was, uh, uh, he's a friend of mine. He was in one of my uh, workshops in, uh, in Portugal uh, last year. And uh, you guys should check him out. He's great. Um, his uh, Instagram is yo, yo Demeter. Um, and in any case, like here, you don't want to like cross into this, right? So basically part of what you would do here is instead of getting into all of this stuff, like you need to have like just that baseline, you know, sort of tentacle of a, of a, of a leg first, you know, regardless of what the, what the action is, um, you know, that sort of needs to be there. And all of the other sort of uh, features that you add, like all of the other curves, exist within the context of this sort of like baseline noodle thing, right? So everything else that you add pulls out from it and goes back into it. Now, again, this is not a method. You don't have to do it like this, but, um, you know, you should at least keep that in mind. Like, 
is that you are going from point A to point B, point A to point B. You are not sort of like, don't sort of follow these like wiggly sort of small things. There's a really good example of um, Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about climate versus weather. And basically he's like standing along a beach and you know, like here's him and he had a dog with him and the dog had like a six foot leash, right? And so he's walking in a straight line and as he's walking, the dog still has six feet of leeway where the dog can do whatever it wants, right? And so, but the dog, again, only has six feet that it can wobble around like this for, right? So because Neil deGrasse Tyson is the one sort of dictating the movement, they arrive at their destination. If he followed the dog and started going wherever the dog wants, then you end up like way over here, right? And so the dog represents like small variations and changes, whereas, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson walking represents the sort of slow and steady overall pattern, right? That is true of the figure as well. You want to be Neil deGrasse Tyson. You don't want to be the dog on the leash, right? You want to draw directly from, you know, point to point from, let's say, the hip all the way down to the ankle and then come back for the little wiggles, right? And so... That's, uh, that's something that I think becomes very, very useful in terms of this in how you prioritize information. Um, again, you know, in here, when you have the, 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 the figures, what I would do is, um, again, get yourself like, a, or make yourself like a little, you know, um, you know, like a little physical, you know, little person, uh, you know, like this, like a little mannequin, and get it into like different poses, different attitudes, just, just play around. Because if you play around, you're going to come up with poses that are more unique, that are like more unusual than what you would sort of think of, like kind of like, you know, first, first glance. Um, I would also think about like, what, what is, what does this guy think? You know, it's like, is he just like this kind of anonymous, you know, sort of figure that we're supposed to identify with? Or is he a character in the story too, where he's having a reaction? Like, is, like, how does he feel about this? Like this to me feels more kind of stoic. He's kind of like resigned. You don't see his face. So maybe we're supposed to identify with like him as a person, or if he were more of like, you know, his own like character, then he might be like, oh my God, look at all these, like, you know, all these bodies in this river or whatever. Right. Or, you know, it's like, you might show fear, you might show, you know, resignation or whatever else. Um, so again, that's, those are sort of options that you have, but that's, that only has to do with like what it is that you're actually trying to achieve. Um, I would say that uh, one thing that I would take a look at that I think is useful is, um, um, you know, looking at like maquettes by, you know, people like Lord Layton and, uh, and other artists, like it's useful to see like how they were working through problems, um, you know. Um, one of the things that's useful too is if you're studying an artist, like don't just look at them, like compare them to other artists, other artists that are trying to do similar things, et cetera. So, because that way you learn sort of like you, you focus less on like their individual quirks and then you think more about like, you know, the, the big overall things they were trying to accomplish. So anyway, um, these are little drawings by Lord Layton just planning out like a, you know, big composition. Same thing for this. Lord Layton, who could draw literally anything, again, is not above drawing these little noodle people to figure stuff out. Um, who knows? That might have even been for the same for the same composition, all this. Um, you know, so I mean, look, dude can draw like this, right? But like, if he's planning, oh, and that's him actually. If he's planning, then he's keeping things simple, right? Um, again, like this kind of thing. This one's actually funny because this is a this is a Bouguereau that he's copying, and it's not exactly the same. So I don't know if he was like, you know, studying the arrangement or you know, trying to steal a little idea here. But um, in any case. Um, when we go, let's see, I think I have these at the very bottom. Um, yeah, okay. So here, you know, this is for um, uh, this uh, painting called the, the, the Garden of the Hesperides. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but notice how like he made this ske sketch, uh, I think it's out of clay, uh, it could be out of wax, but basically, you know, you get these like, you know, little noodle people and he's really trying to figure out like the arrangement, like how these people are like tied together. And I don't know the story, but there's a snake, like a python that's like wrapping itself around one of them. So, you know, getting the attitude, getting like, you know, sort of what feeling you want to convey with this is much more important than like anatomy or like shadow patterns or whatever, right? 
And again, it's like you're, you know, it's much easier to give yourself, give your brain something to chew on that you can actually like look at that you can turn around rather than just like, you know, trying to imagine everything because it makes it harder and the, the results are less compelling, you know? So it's like working just from your head, you have to ask yourself like why, you know, like, and this is just for everybody, like anybody who's doing that, you kind of have to ask yourself like why you're doing that. Like, is it literally just to like, just for vanity is it just like brownie points like for yourself or whatever like just to say that you could you know it's like you got to have like sort of bigger goals than that and um but in any case um you know in, in in the case of what you're doing guillaume what i would do is just like again try to you know before getting into like all the shadow mapping and stuff like you know uh, i would think more about like you know like what's the most sort of like fun and kind of effective way that you could set up the scene if this is a painting that you're going to, you know, or a drawing that you're going to spend a bunch of time on, then it is very much worth your time to spend like, you know, a day or two just playing around with like a, a, a maquette because you get more options. You get to like, you know, really sort of visualize it um, in a way that's like clearer and more thorough and more effective. Um, so that's in general what I would, um, what I would recommend. And let's see. So so we have um, Jeffrey, and I think we might just do like a couple more, and then we'll uh, then we'll call it. Um, let's see. So Jeffrey, uh, clear JPEG uh, question and some life sketches. Uh, uh, ten, two life drawing sessions a week. One is usually costume. The other one is the same post held over two weeks. Okay. Um, this is my recent work. Interesting feedback. Um, it, I, I'm curious. Uh, if you when you say it's a sustained pose held over two weeks, I'm imagining that you are going there once a week, right? So it's like two sessions, really. Um, unless it is like literally two weeks where it's like every day for two weeks, but uh, but we'll see. Uh, let's see, join this. Okay, awesome. So, uh, two legs and seven. One is costume, one is uh, okay, it's the same information. Um, feedback about improving drawing in general, but also start using these sessions in a way to learn human anatomy. So Basically, human anatomy, I think, in a way, Jeff, is not something that you learn in terms of like knowing the muscles and stuff like that. You're not going to learn that in class. You're not going to learn that from a model. Like what you learn in class and from the model is how the stuff gets applied. And so what you want from your teachers is not like a bunch of like, um, you know, it's like they can't lift the weight for you. Like the, the, the memorizing of, you know, sort of like the basic muscle groups and stuff like that. Um, that's something that all of us kind of like, you just crack open a book and then you just kind of go through it. But what the teachers can do and, and what you can do from the model also is try to understand like the larger groups, basically uh, devise a strategy for how to study. That's primarily what a teacher can do actually is give you like a set of directions of like the most important things to look for, right? And then, you know, you have to, you know, kind of uh, sit down and, you know, figure some of these things out, uh, you know, for yourself. But I would say that in terms of these sessions, like, uh, think of it kind of like this, like when you have, um, you know, you have these tracks, right? Like, oh, I got to make a bigger file than that. Um, imagine that you have these tracks right, in terms of like your, your learning and your progress and all that stuff, right? So there's basically like a little, like a river, right? Like here's you, and maybe we'll borrow from Guillaume's, uh, you know. From Guillaume's, uh, um, you know, composition. Uh, I do not want to use GeForce Experience in game overlay. <laughs> All right. So, you know, imagine that, okay, like here's you and you're traveling through your, uh, through your drawing, right? Through like the, this is your eventual goal, right? This is like the thing that you really want at the very, very end of this whole, this whole journey. Now, the thing is that part of what you have to do is you have to be taking active steps to get you closer to what you want. Let's say you want to make like, I don't know, um, let's say like multi-figure compositions or something, just as an example. Then, of course, you know, you, maybe you make some multi-figure compositions just like at the very beginning, right? And they're not going to be what you want. Okay, that's fine. What feeds into this, you know... Um, you know, you'll have certain steps that you want to take, right? So maybe what you'll do is you'll just focus on like individual figures and that's what life drawing is for, right? So you're working on these. There's a bunch of components that go into this, right? So there's going to be like, you know, like anatomy over here and there's going to be like, you know, like value and, you know, like there's going to be just like the kind of 3D aspect of it. There's going to be movement. These are all things that you can get stuck on, 
right? You could start here and go to life drawing and then you're like, Ugh, and then end up over here in anatomy and not circle way, your way back to this, okay? So what you have to do is you have to remember what your path is. Like if you're working on the life drawing for now, let's say you do life drawing with one figure, then you do two figures and then, you know, you're off to the races composing multiple figures, right? Okay, that is the main sort of track that you're working along. Everything else here is just a detour. You stop for a little bit to learn as much as you need, and then you go right back to your actual like primary occupation. And so that's how I would treat it, right? So like when you're studying anatomy, it you study it not just to study anatomy, but to 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 make your life drawings either more efficient or more effective, or to better explain to yourself what you're looking at. And so what I would do is. I wouldn't necessarily use these sessions for that. The life drawing sessions I would use to understand the character of like, you know, like different models. I would use that to understand like, you know, like the building of the figure, like looking for different planes and stuff like that. Um, I would use that to understand like just the totality of the figure, like, you know, how value relates to, you know, like the turning form and things like that. And I would study anatomy separately. So like when you do one like this, go back home, you know, trace over the drawing or redraw it. And then, you know, make it an exercise to like figure out exactly what each muscle was. Or, you know, even more importantly, if you get stuck on something, if you didn't know something, then go and figure that out. And if you're doing a pose that's over two weeks, after week one, look for anything in the drawing that you can't explain or anything that you saw in the model. You're like, I have no idea what this is. Figure it out in between and then come back with that knowledge and then just, but just go right back to drawing. Don't make it like a big anatomical thing. Um, that's how I would approach it. The drawings that you're showing here, uh, these are great. Like this is, um, you know, this two hour drawing here, this is beautiful. Like the, the way you're orchestrating the movement through here, I think that's really, really well done. Um, I think the, you know, here you have a variety of different parts, but they, they're working really well together. And this, as this, you know, as this movement exits out through the foot, that works really well. Um, the feeling sort of from side to side here, I think is working well. Um, I think here you're starting to get a little caught up in some of these small things. So again, I would kind of pull back a little bit. Um, I, I would actually recommend, yeah, take, take a look at some of these Lord Layton drawings, you know, look at what is important to him when he's doing like a more complex drawing, you know, versus when he's doing like the really sort of like, you know, basic, like simple ones, like the things that get included in a painting versus like when he's doing these little sketches, like out in the street. You know, like this is this is sort of good, good brain food to, you know, to kind of see what, you know, what might be the most important aspects of the of the figure. And similarly for studying anatomy, it's like, you know, these are the kind of things that you want to like focus on, like, again, the big building of the figure and that kind of thing. Um, you know, so I would I would look for that um, when you do these. Uh, I do think these are a little bit more sort of scattered. Right. So what I would try to do is. Um, again, it depends, right? But may, oops, that is not what I was trying to grab. And then maybe what I need to do is study the anatomy of Photoshop so I can <laughs> use this more effectively. Um, so, you know, here what you want to do is like, this is getting kind of cluttered. Like it's kind of like, you know, like this happened and 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 this happened. I would try to just have a clearer sort of target, right? Like I would maybe try to aim for like, you know, like, do you need a tricep and a five minute figure? You know, probably not, you know, like, again, you don't want to be doing, you know, the tic-tac-toe board like that. You want to do this and you want to do that it's much faster, much easier. So when you're doing this, I would say focus on the totality of the figure. Do not even get stuck on like all of these like small little things. Generally, I would try to like, okay, just get there as fast as you can get there as effectively as you can. Right. Instead of, you know, worrying too much about the contour here, like relate, you know, one buttock to the other one, like get how this whole area of the torso, you know, is affected by the movement of the legs, get how this overall plane is generally sort of, you know, more oriented towards the light, right? Maybe get how like, you know, this is all coming in here. These are movements from side to side, right? You're also gonna get these movements going in and out, right? So, or sorry, like, you know, uh, top to bottom. So here, you know, if you have like a little, you know, maybe you'll see a little shadow shape that's like, oh, here's the spine, here's a shadow, and then it goes over and this comes over like this. 
we don't care about that. You know, we'll create that by, you know, moving this way and then moving across this way and then going over, you know, and then sort of pulling this off. Like you want to see how these things intersect and each thing that you're working on, you want to follow it until it's logical endpoint. If you see a little island of tone or something, like a little island of light in, in here, erase it out. But start by just, you know, doing the most, you know, the most sort of, you know, brutal, like bare bones, just like pop, 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 you know, type of uh, type of thing that you can. Like here for the shoulder girdle, someone had asked about that. The most important part about the shoulder girdle is that you get that it's basically, you know, these two planes that you get boom, boom. People try to do all kinds of like fancy small things in here, but neglect that like basic, you know, sort of aspect of it. The shoulder girdle, if you think of like, for anyone who's familiar with like Captain Crunch, right, from like the cereal or just any sort of, you know, like captain or sort of military uniform or whatever, um, you know, whatever these little shoulder things are called, epaulets, I think, right? That's what the shoulder girdle is. Imagine those little things. Imagine like, you know, let's say the arm is going this way. The, sh the shoulder girdle is doing this. It's a little epaulet going that way. If it's, you know, if it's coming back up this way, the arm, the little epaulet is going here, right? You're pulling them off of the center of the figure. That's basically what it is. You do that, and then you can come into this and say, oh, okay, here is, you know, again, you drew, you draw that straight into the big noodle of the arm. Then you can be like, oh, this is how the deltoid wraps around that. And it's pulling on the shoulder blade, which then travels up this way. You know, like that's what you actually want to do generally because it's just a lot easier, right? And the thing is that like all the muscles and you, you're going to feel that like, oh, this movement has to come out of here. It has to come out from the spine. Well, guess what? You, has, you have just discovered the rhomboid without literally necessarily knowing that that muscle is there just by you knowing that this has to connect back in here because of course it does. The movement can't come from nowhere, right? So as you bring it back in, you have basically logically deduced that there has to be a muscle there. And then when you check the anatomy book, voila, there it is. And the only real thing that you learn that's different from that is like, oh, okay, it cuts diagonally. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's what the anatomy stuff, the anatomy texts actually do, you know, is they just sort of like help you with like these, like, you know, somewhat more specific things. But if you're thinking about like the physics of movement, like the way that this stuff is organized, then you're going to be able to draw already the specific anatomy will just make it a little bit faster or a little bit more efficient, right? Um, you know, as you know, okay, if we got this pulled back here, you know, the epaulette is actually going this way here. And you can find that by, if you find the corner here very easily, then just trace it back up, you know, to find where it would be over here. Um, I would not worry about all this stuff for the, for the tricep. I, you might just do this, you know, just like do that like lengthwise you know, really get like squeeze out more out of the action, like really get the movement of the person before you start, you know, getting too caught up in all the small things. And then if there are small things, you nest them on top of that big movement. If you want, say, like the deltoid cutting across here, pull it out of that big plane that we put in. If we want this head of the tricep, erase it out with reference to that big thing that we have. That's the way that you get these things to integrate, right? And then the, the tricep is not just a thing that's stuck on here, but it actively participates in the overall movement of the, uh, of the figure. And what you'll find is that when you think of these as parts that move and bend and stretch and all of that, then you'll start thinking about like, oh, okay, well, like this is, you know, if the shoulder blade is doing this, that's going to have echoes that reverberate, you know, all the way through like this part of the figure. Like maybe you'll get like this and you'll get this and you'll get this and you'll get this. Maybe you'll get like, you know, this movement like spilling down here and then this coming down here, right? So that's what I would focus on more. I think that's a better, you know, sort of uh, use of your, of your time generally. Um, same thing here, you know, it's like bring this, you know, if the leg here is like moving pretty straight, like just make it straight, right? Focus on like, what's, the, what's different about this thing than other stuff? Like here, it's that this leg is really straight. Okay, get that and then get how this leg, you know, how the buttock is traveling over that leg. Like really get that to fit in, to really communicate that. You might have to ignore some things uh, while you do that. That's fine. You can do that. You can put in the side here and then you can come back and say, okay, boom, monster quads. Boom, come in here and okay, like beef up the, the calf, bring this in to the heel etc. But it's going to be more integrated, it's going to make more sense, and you're going to have more fun 
if you keep it as simple as possible. Like just kind of give yourself permission to not have to like, you know, um, not have to be like uh, accountable for every little thing from the very beginning, right? And I think like that, like there's always a simple solution to things. We're the ones that make it complicated. Um, I've had students say to me sometimes, they're like, oh, well, you can simplify because you know anatomy. No, uh, that has nothing to do with it. Like you don't need to know anatomy to make a noodle. You know what I mean? Like, and so that that's the whole, and noodle is anatomy in a way, but like you basically want to aggressively simplify the stuff that you're, that you're working on. Um, again, like here, like this is working really well. I would say that making it a little bit more systematic would be useful. So, you know, here you're kind of like, okay, you have the movements going up and down. That's great. I would hunt around for like, okay, movement side to side. Okay. We have that relate. Like if, if, the, if you're working on something symmetrical, relate one side to the other side. So like one peck to the other one, one armpit to the other one. How does the, how does the movement flow from like, you know, one piece of the chest to the other piece of the chest from clavicle to clavicle, you know, how is it going from like here, you know, from this one, boom to this one, right? Maybe you have here like a, you know, a little shadow cutting through. That's fine. You know, you can put this in first and then go ahead and add the shadow on top of that and let those things cross. Right. But you don't want to like stop along the way too much. Like you want to try to, you know, if you get, you know, sort of, you want to, everything that you put in, you want to see how far you can carry it. You want to see how far like you can, you know, um, use that idea. So I would probably just bring that in like all the way across to here. Um, again, you know, from, you know, nipple to nipple, from side to side here, from this to this and that to that. Um, the cool thing is that you can literally, as you keep like just going again, like up and down and side to side, you can make this as complex as you want it to be, right? So like, let's say that we kept this going and you're like, you know what? Okay, we're going to put a little dip there, okay, to get the, the um, pit of the neck. You know, we can come in and we can put a little dip here to, you know, get the feeling of the ribs under the sternum. We can go ahead and put this in right here. You know, and what you do is you just no operation is that difficult in its in itself. It's like not that each thing is not that complicated. It's the organizing of the things in in you know sort of keeping yourself like just uh, from making it too complicated. That's the part that's hard, right? But you can come in here, and as long as it works with the overall thing, as long as it's not too disruptive, then you can put in as much detail as you want, right? Here, when you have this peck, you have to feel how it rolls in like this and how all of this is pulling up into um, this space. The way you fit in the, the delta in here, that's great. That's beautiful. Um, here, don't let this tricep and the bunching up of this get in the way of the primary sort of directive here, which is just that he's using this arm for support. So this arm has, you know, is going to be, regardless of the little detours, it's going to be straighter than usual. And you have to shoot that down and then boom, aggressively hit that right there. Um, same thing here, you know, just again, the bicep goes fairly straight. We have to get that big aspect of it, that, the, that big priority of it first. And then we can come and say, oh yeah, and there's some bumps along the way too, right? So that's what I would do. Um, again, you know, try to, you know, the, sometimes slow down in some of these parts because I think you, you're seeing a lot but you're not giving yourself a fair shot to express all of it. Like here, this, this arm could be, this hand, the conception of it is, is really well done, but we're not really weaving it back into, you know, like, like we're not weaving this thumb back into the hand as much as we could. And I don't think it's because you can't do it. I think it's because you are not giving yourself enough time. So that's, that's basically the stuff that I would work on for this. But again, when you do something like this, and again, you operate with these basic principles, just you and the model and these basic ideas is all you need. Then go home and, you know, again, if you saw this bump here, be like, what the hell is that? And then you pull up your anatomy book and then you start to see like, oh, okay, well, you know, what it is, is that like, okay, here's the pit of the neck. That's the sternum. So right around here is where rib number one is going to be. Okay. That makes sense. And then this bump here, that has to be rib number two, right? Because rib number one is always, you know, sort of the, the base of the neck and it's always right at the pit of the neck. And then, you know, oh, like maybe this is rib like number three here. If this is two, then this has to be three, right? Maybe this is like four, you know, five, you know, five in a lot of books, you know, they say that it's at nipple height. That checks out, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But none of this is like complicated in itself. Like each of the components is pretty straightforward. It's just, we have to sort of organize, you know, 
and and be very sort of like um um and not like ruthless exactly but like you have to be very uh to some degree strict about like you know making sure that you're not overwhelming yourself that's the biggest uh, that's the biggest thing okay and uh, i think this will be the uh the last one uh so marcella let's take a look so it says um this is my last uh life drawing worked on it for seven hours charcoal and black conte Let's try to interpret the values create soft transitions between tones making strokes in different directions I feel like there's something missing in the eyes Basically, the cartoon, the form is not very three-dimensional. Kind of shadow, kind of hard. Yeah, inside, problems in the drawing. Um, oh, okay, cool. All right, awesome. So, um, okay, okay, all right, cool. So, um, let's take a look. All right, okay, very cool. So, um, you know, in general here, uh, a lot of it is like, uh, this is a, a kind of an interesting thing that happens with, uh, with drawing is like, you can understand a lot of, you know, like concepts in drawing, but if there's sometimes like just baseline things that are sometimes like just very like pretty straightforward that if you, if you don't take the time for them, we'll come back to sort of like cause problems. So the main thing here, Marcella, is to you know, because you you are creating a very three dimensional figure, like the way that you're tying in, you know, like the you know the uh, the the muscles overall, like they they do work together. I think very well. Um, you know, I think in here you do get a very clear sense of like the different planes and how the forms fit together. The main thing is, I think you're seeing everything too separately, right? And so in the expression of the features you really want to take your time in the initial building to even just compare the sizes of things, right? And I think that is the, the largest sort of, uh, you know, thing that we have to look out for here. So let's say we take this here and then we'll take the original of the model here. Um, okay, so we'll extend this a little over this way. So in here, let's take a look. Um, yeah, so, okay, if you step back, if you look, you know, overall, I mean, you know, already you can see that, like, the main thing is that, like, the features are too big for the face. I mean, that's the, that, you know, that's the most sort of fundamental thing. What you want to do is, like, when you're drawing a person, like, you want to ask yourself, like, what is the thing about them that stands out the most? You are not going to accomplish that by drawing each part like one piece at a time, right? It's gonna you're gonna accomplish that by drawing everything together, getting the big sculpture of the person. So the biggest thing overall, again, if we squint down, is like we have to get the inclination of the head. We have to get like you know which way he's moving, right? We have to get the general character of the head. So his head, if we had to choose between like you know something more sort of boxy or rectangular or more of a triangle or something more round. I would say that he's probably closer to more rectangular, right? Overall, that's something to think about. So just thinking of like, okay, overall, like even like what kind of sort of basic form are we thinking? Like it's, you know, this like sort of flexible box that is, you know, taller than it is wide, right? So that is something that, you know, we have to, we have to think about as we're, as we're working. Here, this got like a little bit too narrow in here. And look at the relationship between, you know, the size of the hair here and the face versus over here, right? Over here, the hair is actually, it's a very small percentage of the total height, um, whereas here it's significantly bigger, right? When you place the features, you have to look for the relationship between the features, right? So triangulation is very useful. Like even just, you know, in your head, just even just looking at the kind of triangle, the little shape that's formed there. Again, shape I don't think is the most solid basis to like, you know, depend on for everything, but as a quick check, it is very, very useful, right? So just getting the relationship of like, how does this, you know, like how do these features compare in where they're placed? How much room is left over here? How much space is left here? That's all really important. And so when we draw, like, let's say we take, you know, the features here and uh, we, we're gonna reduce them in scale. You know, and we're going to take the nose as well and the lips and 
we're going to also make them smaller. And let's see, we're also going to, you know, take the, the hair and we're going to cut into that. Now, again, this is why you want to get this in the beginning, because trying to do this like after the fact uh, creates like a ton of work. Like you have to like sort of like modify like everything. And so because everything sort of, you know, participates in that. Right. So even just doing that gets us like a little bit um, closer. Right. So. Generally here though, what I would say is like, we want to indicate like, okay, where is just the overall movement of the head going this way? If we squint down, you know, the rest of his head is kind of going in this direction as well. This is also going this way. Even here, like just getting where the shoulder is, right? The shoulder is coming up a lot higher than, than what we have here currently. And so that is something that we want to address like just from the very start. So it's not so much about like even drawing, you know, like the thing, you know, like the shoulder or the clavicle or whatever at first. It's about the relationships. It's about like, where does it start? Where does it end? What is the relationship of the shoulder overall to like, you know, the, uh, you know, to the, to the beard, to the chin, right? Here, the, you know, before we get too caught up in this, again, we're literally just trying to get like, what is the axis here? What is the movement this way? So, okay, this, I think this makes sense right here. You know, this makes sense right there. Um, this has to go a little higher. And if we squint down, the overall nose is basically like this. It's like a little prism. So we actually don't need to do that much in here. We can just move this over like that. Um, here is our center line through here. And again, a lot of uh, what it is, Marcella, is basically just doing less right so here we want to do less through here the eyes when you're drawing them you want to make sure that they're as you know lined up as, as clearly as you as you can so this is you know it would be easier to just have like just purely the eyeball rather than you know sort of the uh, smaller features there at the outset um we want to go okay here and then you know here across yes this brow goes a little higher but we're not going to concern ourselves with that just yet you know, here, just getting the width of the head in general, okay, getting the proportion of face to beard, you know, that's another thing that's going to be important for us. So, okay, just getting this to come down in here. And here, just reducing the amount of, just the amount of hair. Uh, again, squinting to try to get this as simply as I can. You know, the tones too, you know, uh, you know, if you want to, if you take a look at like, you know, here versus, you know, on the, on the model, obviously, you know, it's not going to be exactly the same because the camera interprets things differently, but, um, you know, I have a feeling that you were sort of getting the form to turn and we're thinking of that sort of in isolation and, you know, that, you know, caused it to be more exaggerated because here the tone is almost the same as it is in the shadow. And that, you know, uh, that is, you know, not something that would be, you know, possible. So here, you know, generally nothing in the, in the shadows is going to be, or nothing in the lights is going to be as dark as anything in the shadows here, just the ear, just, you know, simple, boom, this plane right here, just, again, if we see it just like that, we just put it in like that. No, no fuss, no sort of nothing fancy, just boom, straight. Okay. We see this little thing here. Okay, we just put that in. And again, you're just, you're sculpting this head, right? You're thinking of, you know, your model as existing in full three dimensions, right? This as it comes in, boom, this comes in right here. Boom, this, the bottom is pointy. So we bring that in. Um, even the contrast here of the beard, like the part of the beard that's illuminated is, uh, it's not quite, you know, it's not the same tone as, you know, the part of the beard that is in shadow, right? So here we might, you know, separate that out right there. We might, you know, bring this in. Um, for your question about, again, like uh, looking sort of cartoony, you, again, when you ask yourself the same thing, like you want to be more specific. So 
if you feel that it doesn't, you know, sort of uh, that your drawing doesn't look naturalistic, then or it doesn't look like your model for one reason or another, again, there's only so many things that it can be, right? Like it's either going to be something in, you know, the character, right? Uh, maybe you made everything too round or, you know, and like some parts are a little bit, um, you know, more, um, more squarish, or maybe it'll be something to do with, um, you know, something to do with the movement. Maybe the angle is not what it needs to be, right? Um, and here we get just this to project out. Or, you know, it could be something with the, um, you know, again, with the, with the structure or something, right? So maybe the size of something doesn't match what we want it to be. But again, we're just sort of building in the most like obvious way. Like here, you know, we just build one, two planes for the, for the eyeball. You know, here again, we squint, we try to get just, okay, what is the eye socket doing? Like, what does that look like, right? Try to get this to fit in here. Um, you know, here's, you know, this little portion of the eye socket, boom, this plane coming across here. Um, you know, we're trying to just think of like, okay, how can we express this as clearly as possible, right? Like no fuss, like nothing fancy, just again, what is the clearest way that we can do this? Um, here we're going to have, you know, another plane. This is a little bit too, you know, too hard right now. You know, the transition is too, too fast. Um, what, one thing I would say, Marcella, is like, don't focus on soft transitions. Soft transitions are a result. And I would think of it more as integrated, you know, like, uh, you know, sort of like less contrast or sort of more integrated transitions or something. But basically, um, don't, um, that is a consequence of thinking about, you know, sort of how gradually the form turns, right? So you don't aim for soft transitions. Soft transitions happen when there is a form that turns slowly. Right. So if we think of the bigger thing, the smaller thing just kind of happens, um, you know, and so here. And this goes like this um, again, if we squint down, then well, here we are just checking to see, like, OK, do we have enough space here? You know, when we check from side to side, you know, does it um, you know, does this point here, you know, match the corresponding point over here? Right. We're checking across like just. Okay, does like, you know, what about this? Like, what about this? Like, does all of this stuff match, you know, it's uh, sort of corresponding, um, you know, analog on the other side. Here, you know, for the mouth, like we want the platform of the mouth. We want how the mouth like sticks out here more than we want the individual lips, right? Um, we want to sculpt how this comes out here. Notice how we very slowly ramp up in terms of the the values that we add, we are stingy with our values. We do not want to add more if we don't have to, right? Squint down, there's, you know, this forehead looks very blocky. So we definitely need a half tone here, right? Um, the shadows here don't stand out enough. So we need to push that a little bit more here. And here, maybe we need a little, little extra transition. Notice we made that go like this. There's, of course, a little island here that goes across. We don't care about that yet, not at first. Then we can go in and put it in afterwards, right? So here, okay, we get how the, how the nose has to sit on, you know, the muzzle, right? And so we try to do that. We try to get, you know, the overall form of the lips. Like now that we have the overall form of like the mouth area, then we try to get, okay, like how does this get? carved in here um at this point too you know we can you know we can put in the mustache like okay what is you know this going across like this how is it going on this side right and again we're just kind of sculpting these you know smaller and smaller um, areas um this needs to be a little bit lighter here right there this goes up like that the direction of that you know the movement of it was not quite what we needed um this upper lip here is like the base of a little prism thing that goes in like this. So, you know, whatever the sort of big impression is that you get, like the sort of like the, the gist of it, the thing that you look at and you're like, that looks pointy, like do that, you know, or like that looks like this thing that, that feels like, you know, it comes out or it feels like it goes in. Um, that's what you want to do. You know, here, this cuts in this way. We have, you know, this bit of the cartilage of the nose going in and then going out you know, on these two sides, 
So again, you're not coming in here and outlining like little bits of the shadow being like, oh, this goes bup, 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 like that. Like you're putting a shoelace around the outline of it. What you're doing is you are building, right? You're thinking, okay, I build this part of it. I build this part that goes across, right? And here, oh, this plane changes a little too abrupt right there. So we'll just go, okay, boom, right there. Here we go here and we go across like that, okay? You notice it's starting to look a little bit more like um, our subject, right? Here, you'll also find that, okay, there are some variations here. Like you basically have, you know, this plane going across, but also on top of that, you get the movement laterally. You get this fat pad, you know, coming up this way on the cheek. Um, you actually do get the shadow a little bit tighter right there. And similarly over here, you have, you know, this light part right here, this goes in, this goes in for the fat pad this way. So the fat pad is basically going like this on this base that is, you know, you have you know, plane, plane, and then the fat pad like hangs on that, right? So that's what we're trying to achieve here. And let's see, and then this, the way that you put this in, it's not just a shape, right? This plane here has to wrap around what the eyeball is doing. You're basically creating a flat surface and the eyeball is sitting on it. So you have to think of like, you know, what you have to do to wrap that surface around the eyeball. That's what we're doing when we go, like that. This one's wrapping around too, right? So, you know, things like that are useful. If you do that, you know, it'll look like the person before you even really put in the features, which is, you know, sort of like an old sergeantism. Um, but yeah, everybody, you know, everybody knew that, you know, back then. Um, so it's not sort of exclusive to, uh, to sergeant. Um, again, squint down, put this in like that. Uh, you know, maybe we need another plane right there. Here, we just go, go ahead and um, medium, what I suggest for this kind of study is charcoal, charcoal and crayon, uh, crayon being like a Conte crayon. Um, they're, you know, they're the most flexible materials out there. That's what they use at the, um, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in the, in the 19th century and pretty much most academic um, schools. Um, a lot of people use graphite. For this kind of thing these days, but graphite has limited range. It will not let you get as dark as you know the Conte will, um, you know, and it doesn't lend its. It lends itself to this kind of like small detail handling. Now, you know, technically, I mean, you know, uh, you don't have to do that. I mean, someone, you know, you should be able to handle it broadly. But um, historically, you know, this was like charcoal territory. But if you're going to use charcoal actually sharpen it because most people use charcoal and don't sharpen it and wonder why it doesn't work. Um, you know, uh, there's a certain kind of like, the technique thing is not that important, I don't think. Like, you know, in terms of like obsessing over it. However, um, the tools do have certain like uses. So there are certain like best practices. Um, let's see, when I talk about triangulation, do you refer to the shape form by connecting the eyes and the nose or finding a coordinate locating the relationship between two points? It's the same thing. You know, you can do like formal triangulation where you have two known points. And let's say there's like something over here that you're trying to locate. Like, let's say like here, right? Let's say this is like a real person, like the model. And we know where this is and we know where this is. You can hold up your pencil and trace the angle to here. And you can do the same thing from this point, And that would help you to find where that third point is. That's formal triangulation. Informal triangulation would just be looking at this and trying to ask yourself, what kind of triangle does this make? So it's basically the same thing. It's just that the informal triangulation is faster. Um, so you just do whichever one, depending on like, you know, how important the drawing is. For the big stuff that really matters, then you can do it more formally, just the same as like measuring. For the stuff that's like, you know, not as important where you're just, you know, kind of doing something fast, then, you know, or if it's something small in the drawing, then you just, you know, you just do it um, informally. Okay, so squinting down, you can see that, okay, this needs to get lighter in here. Uh, you know, that little fat pad comes in. Uh, I'm going to show you the, um, in one second, the scary eye. And for anyone who's been in class with me before, you already know what this is. Um, the scary eye is basically the idea that you have the eyeball and then you just draw the iris inside of that, right? And you draw that before you put in the eyelids. And the reason for that is to get both eyes pointing basically in the direction that you want, you know? 
And to figure that out before you, you know, add any sort of smaller details or whatever, um, it will look terrifying. That's okay. If it doesn't look terrifying, it doesn't count. Um, once you kind of sculpted, like, you know, cause the, the pupil and all that, and the iris are a depression that go into the eyeball, right? So once you have the ball and then you have the hole that goes into the ball, then you can start thinking about going across with the, with the, um, with the eyelids. So here, boom, here's the eyelid. You decide how open the eye is. So how much of that you, you cut out here, you bring it from one side to the other side. And then you bring it to the corner. You look at the character of this, what this is supposed to look like. Then you, you know, in with whatever value you need, you bring it over to the tear duct. Same thing over here. Okay, we have to bring it in right there. Okay, and then I would do this with an eraser. Basically, you know, whatever part of this plane here that you know catches the you know some light or something, then you just go ahead and put that in, right? And by doing that, you'll get eyes that are. It's much easier to draw the eyes and. It's easier because you actually have points to relate them to. So anyway, you have that. The um, I probably should have done this earlier, but you know the you know the parts of the eyeball that are darker down here. You know, like the modeling of the lower lid. Um, we can come in here and you know make the eyeball like turn down at first, and then come in and put this little bit of the lower lid that catches a little bit more light. You know, boom, this hits here. Boom, this hits here. Um, and, you know, right here, the actual uh, white of the eye is pretty white. <laughs> the, um, you know, there's a little bit of a lighter spot in here, and there's a little bit of a lighter spot for the iris right there. Um, you know, the pupil gets a little darker, and then, you know, if you want to put in, like, this little, you know, highlight there, then you have to think about how it sits on the, like, how it goes over the, the surface of the, um, of the eyeball, right? So, you know, basically something like that. If you, um, you know, here, notice I'm a little too close. So if I step back, it'll be, you know, sort of, it'll be easier to, you know, get this the way we want. Um, again, you know, just because you know not to get like too close and get too stuck on that doesn't mean that you won't do it. So, you know, you gotta like watch out for that. Here, the whites of the eyes stand out too much. I'm just gonna knock them back a little. Um, and, you know, here, like this little fold on the side of the fat pad, uh, again, it's not that dark. It just looks dark because everything else around it is so light. But basically, if we put in like almost anything there, that'll be enough, even though the tone that we used is literally super light. Um, then what I would do here is just put in the nostril, boom, okay, boom, over there. Um, again, you assess at a distance, you try to see if there's anything that you missed, if there's anything that you want to work on some more or whatever. Um, you know, this goes like that. And then the, you know, the light sort of uh, gets rid of a little bit of the eyebrow there. So anyway, I mean, just like real quick, like that's what I would do. Like just try to, again, assess that like more carefully from the beginning. Um, again, the overall drawing, I think is looking good. You know, it's just a matter of like, before you start diving into all the small stuff, you have to sort of think of the, the big things overall. And especially how to sculpt it. Again, don't let anything break up the big movement or the sort of big proportions. Um, Carlos, when it comes to measuring, how do we avoid uh, over obsessing? Um, well, you have to realize that measuring is like <laughs> not real in a way. Like look up this thing called the coastline paradox. It basically is like the notion that if you uh, measure, like let's say in the example they use is the coast of England, you know, the length, that, like if you type into like, you know, uh, Google, like how long is the coast of England, it'll, you'll get an answer. But it, the way that they measure these things is like, let's say if you're measuring it with like, you know, 100 kilometer units, you get one answer. If you measure it with smaller units, you get a different answer, right? Like the thing is that like, if you keep measuring with smaller and smaller units, like the answer keeps changing, right? And, you know, in this case, that has to do with the fact that you can kind of get into the nooks and crannies and stuff like that and whatever. Um, the, the, the larger point of that is that basically like information is not stable, right? If I say to you again, that like, oh, I am this tall, that's an approximation. I'm giving you information that's good enough for the purpose. So that's what information is actually for. Like measurements are things that are good. It's information that's good enough to do something about it. Right. So 
what you can, you know, what you can do with that is that basically realize that the measurements are a range, right? Like when you measure your model, your hand's going to be moving. Your model is going to be moving a little bit. The earth is rotating. Your model is changing. Like everything, you're both getting older, you know, as the, as that happens, when you make the translation from your paper or from the model to your paper, there are going to be little margins of error and that's okay. What happens is your brain is not very good at judging long distances, but it's pretty damn good at judging small distances, even without training. And so what you do is the measuring is just there to provide a range so that you don't do things like make the, you know, the legs like five times as long as the torso. It's to avoid big things like that. Small things, your medium sized things, triangulation is very useful for that. It's accurate enough for medium sized things. And for really small things, you just eyeball it. Think of it this way. If you have, and I mean, I don't know anything about being a shepherd, but imagine that you're a shepherd and you have obviously some sheep. Um, you can't let your sheep just roam around wherever the hell they want in the middle of the night because they're going to get eaten by a wolf. Okay, fine. You need some way of accounting for where they are. So what do you do? You build a pen for them, right? Inside the pen, they can move wherever they want, but they can't go outside of the pen. So that limits their mobility. It limits their position, right? So that you can kind of like find them within a certain range. Now, that doesn't mean that what you do is you take each sheep and you nail it to the ground because you don't need that level of like control or accuracy. That is the same with drawing. You need to narrow down your options, but you don't, you're not going to get absolute answers because those don't exist, right? And so again, anything that you have, even literal like missions to, you know, go out into space, everything has a margin of error where someone was like, well, that's, that's good enough, you know? And so you have to do that with your measuring. What I do on a practical level is I measure for big things. So I measure for like the height. I'll measure like the number of heads for a model. If I'm doing a drawing that is like, you know, like a fairly large drawing that, you know, is a sustained effort. If I'm working very quickly, then I don't really bother with that. I'll do probably informal triangulation and that's accurate enough. But when you have, you know, when you measure, you're going to get different answers, you know, as your model, like kind of get more tired or like stands up more or whatever, that's fine. You know, if I do like one head and then like the second head is at the nipple, but the next time it's a little bit below the nipple, that's fine. <laughs> you know, as long as like, it, I don't get anything crazy different, like the second head ends up at the belly button, then, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. So every pose that you have is a range. So if something changes by like that much, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, I measure things like two or three times. If I get the same answer or something close, then I just leave it alone. Because in the end, your measurements are, again, they're all, you have to think about what they're for. They're not, they're not a law. They're not like, you know, this kind of like perfect knowledge. They're just there to kind of make it, the measurements are there to make it easier to estimate. That's it. I think so. also it helps like keeping in mind that measuring doesn't get you good results. And when you know that, like yeah. it's easier not to over rely on it. Because yeah, if you measure and you get a slightly different answer, then mm -hmm. you superimpose all those measurements onto each other. It's like you get yeah. to, to looking drawings and paintings. And yeah, when you when you have that awareness, it's just not as tempting to not have that kind of unified vision. Oh yeah. I mean, you realize that like everything that you're doing again is like an average, right? So like the, the person that you're drawing is like not going to be the same the next day or like the same, like, you know, every, I mean, you think of like drawing a model over several days, like ostensibly they went home, they, you know, like showered, you know, they like maybe like washed their hair or something. So every single hair is in a different place, like all sorts of like aspects of them are different, but you know, you don't look at them and say like, where did the person from yesterday go? Like, who is this, right? They, there are things that are constant enough that, you know, you don't really bother with like, you know, that kind of like minute, um, you know, sort of a, a detail. And so that's basically the thing. Like the measurement is there to help you make better sort of to, to liberate you, to help you make, you know, uh, more effective kind of estimates and, you know, to, to get you to be more intuitive. It's not the other way around. It's not there to like tell you what to do exactly. It, you want to just be careful that you don't end up like making you working for a method instead of the method working for you. You know, it's like, uh, it's what we call here in the States, like the tail wagging the dog. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you got to have to like, you know, remember what it's for, you know? Um, and someone asked, uh, oh, Nathan. Oh, hey, Nathan, how you doing? Uh, what clay or wax mediums would I recommend for more detailed mannequins? Um, and also for floating figures, they suspend them from strength. 
Um, I'm not actually sure. I've never actually done it with like wax um, at this point. I've mainly just used like stuff like this or I've used like actual clay. Um, I don't know like how you get like that quantity of wax, but if uh, if I <laughs> need a guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if I find anything like that, I'll let you know. In terms of the floating figures, you can suspend them with string. But let's say if like if it's a figure that you're looking up at, like, you know, a person that like, you know, you sort of like you're looking up at them like this, then you could just like have like if you have like a real model or even a mannequin, you can just have them lie down and you just look at them like that. And that would be the same as you looking up like this. So there's a little bit of like, you know, just sort of a craftiness that goes into that. But if it is important for one reason or another, then yes, you can suspend stuff from like strings and that kind of thing. All right. So I think we did it. Yeah, I mean, these guys are all tuckered out. They've... Well, they've been <laughs> in the same spot for the whole, whole time. <laughs> well, they, moved around, they moved around a little bit. But um, yeah, well, thank you everybody for coming. I hope that was uh, hope that was helpful. So yeah, I want to recommend Ramon's uh, head drawing videos that he has on Gumroad. I think they're like the best resource for drawing and not just for drawing heads. I mean, there's concepts in there that you can apply to anything. Um, so yeah, I would definitely pick that up if you haven't. And Ramon, is there anything you've got planned in the future? I know you have a workshop that you're thinking about doing. Um, yeah, I've got like a few things that I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to be basically putting out like more, um, more videos, like, you know, covering like, you know, um, this kind of concept, um, you know, basically all the stuff that I work on. So like, you know, painting, drawing, landscape, et cetera. Um, the other thing that I'm working on that I haven't really announced yet, but I will soon. Yeah, next, is, is yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> something that I've got in my head that I'm calling like the everything workshop, which is basically going to be a little bit like, you know, a little bit like this. I, this is just what's happening in every class that I teach now is that, you know, if we're in the drawing class, we're talking about painting a little bit. If we're also talking about sculpture because there's concepts that are constant. So what I have planned for that is that eventually um, basically what it'll be is it won't be a, a workshop with like feedback, but it'll be like a little bit of everything showing like the constant concepts that like would allow somebody to go from like doing a sketch to like doing like a you know either a painting or a drawing or whatever to like doing a composition and that sort of thing and because I do think that sometimes people when they're starting out if they are choosing classes from different teachers and stuff you still kind of need to have some idea of like how to plan your education so getting a glimpse into like how the whole thing works together uh, I think would be useful in kind of picking out like, oh, I want like more of this, or I need to do this so that I can do this later on. But that's kind of like the 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 goal to like start creating more material that aims at like making education like simpler and also just kind of getting people back to like doing the creative work they actually want to do. So that like, you know, by demystifying the stuff that's like more sort of procedural so that it's not like a big, like, you know, uh, a big stumbling block. So but uh, yeah, I'll be posting about that on my Instagram once, uh, you know, once Meeple and Cooper are done doing the schedule for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you hear, you heard it here first, the everything workshop. Uh, yeah, I agree. Like context is really important and yeah. it's really difficult to find that. You just have like different artists teaching what their specialties are and yeah. like, you, you pick whatever happens to catch your eye. But uh, yeah, it's usually like an accident if you figure out how it works together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just like way more like inefficient than it needs to be really and like it what's funny is that most of us just kind of need like sometimes people just kind of need like uh to give themselves permission to be like oh maybe I don't need to know everything about perspective like I mean if you're an architectural illustrator sure you know but like again most of the benefit that you get from these disciplines is contained in like you know five minutes worth of talking about it <laughs> Yeah, it's like also I'm sure like everybody's favorite artist would not be comfortable teaching every single class. Yeah, exactly. But everybody knows like the sort of like in general, like knows the sort of like the very basics. Of yeah, something. yeah. Like I was just just as a, a quick note, I was telling someone about that because they were really like obsessing over perspective. And I was like, listen, everything that you do, every concept is it comes in different layers. Right. It's the same thing. It's like information is variable. Right. So like the degree of information you need depends on what you need it for. So if you're doing like a quick sketch of a composition and you're trying to figure out the arrangement of something, perspective in the end boils down to things look smaller if they're further away. <laughs> like that's it. <laughs> if you are making things smaller as they go further away, 
congratulations, you are working with perspective. Now, the whole science of perspective and mapping out all this other stuff is, and all the math basically is smaller by how much, right? And it's because it's some, sometimes difficult to estimate with like, you know, a really large degree of accuracy. But by and large, if you're composing, you don't need that much accuracy. You know, it's like you're fine just knowing that like things get smaller when they go back and then that's it. So, you know, it's a, it's going to be a lot of stuff like that, basically. Uh, cool. So, yeah, also, uh, I have some new classes, classes planned for around the spring, and I'll be announcing that hopefully soon. I'm very excited about who's going to be teaching. I can't wait to talk more about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, also hope to do more workshops. Hope to have Ramon back and talk more about this stuff. And thank you so much for spending the time. Oh, and thank you for setting this up. This has been great. So some, uh, you know, some, some new folks, some, uh, some folks from before. So yeah, it was, yeah, love it. Thanks so much, guys. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you.